<laughs> so it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, Likewise. Uh, I uh, was watching your videos just earlier today, and I mentioned earlier in uh, uh, the chat or in the video that um, you had mentioned the concept of the serpent eating the dust. And mm -hmm. I was watching that video and I was like, that totally blew my mind <laughs> because I'd never thought of it like that, you know? So, yeah, because it's can right there Genesis? too. Can I read Genesis 3? Yeah, yeah. I just did earlier. So yeah, by all means. Go oh, ahead. you did? You guys already did? Yeah, I read it through and I was oh. like, because right there in the curse of Adam too, it says you will yes. become dust again. And I was just like, oh my Bro. gosh, it's right there. <laughs> it's the battle from beginning to end. You know, he lays it out. He's like, you're going to be in a constant battle for the rest of your lives. It's a serious deal. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a big deal. And then we're kind of overlooking. We're like, yeah, you know, it's kind of just some crazy stuff out there. And it's like, no, like there is a radical, intelligent evil, like an immortals battling against the sons of Elohim. And yeah. like the children of men are just, it's a serious all out, knock down, drag out, fight to the death, yeah. eternal consequences every single day and night while we're all like, yeah, just going to the store and doing stuff. You're like, no, literally everything in creation is fighting in this battle. Exactly. And most of us have been lulled into a slumber just through willful ignorance and then just ostrich syndrome. Like, I'd just rather not know about it. I'd just rather not know about it. Yeah. But it affects us every day. And it's literally Genesis 3. He's like, the Nahash was more crafty than all the lives of the field, which Yahuwah Elohim had made. And he said to the woman, is it true that Elohim has said, do not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the Nahash, we are to eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden. Elohim has said, do not eat of it, nor touch it, lest you die. Mm -hmm. And then Nahash said to the woman, you shall certainly not die. For Elohim knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes shall be open. You shall be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant <clears throat> to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. When she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loin coverings for themselves. And they heard the voice of Yahuwah Elohim walking about in the garden toward the wind of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Yahuwah Elohim among the trees of the garden. And Yahuwah Elohim called unto Adam and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who made you know that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave me to be, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And Yahuwah Elohim said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The Nahash deceived me and I ate. And Yahuwah Elohim said to Nahash, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock more than every beast of the field on your belly you are to go and eat dust all the days of your life when i put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he shall crush your head and you shall crush his heel to the woman he said i greatly increased your sorrow and your conception bring forth children in pain and your desire is for your husband and he does rule over you and to the man he said because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying, Do not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you are to eat of it all the days of your life. And the ground shall bring forth thorns and thistles, and you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You are to eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you return. Man, this is just fundamental warfare passages right here. Yep. You see people like abdicating responsibilities. <clears throat> Adam's standing right there. And the great dragon, this Nahash, is sitting there tempting his wife. And he's all like, wow, he's very fiery. It's very beautiful. We can't even kind of start oh to imagine the God. wonder and the spectacle no, of what the Nahash really was. We have no totally concept. Right. Yep. We have no concept. And we just seem like we grow up with that version of some kind of snake. They're like, look at that boa constrictor in a tree deceiving the two most intelligent humans that ever have been. And you're like, come on, y'all. This is the most beautiful like, if we can't even comprehend the level of majesty that these beings have yep. potential there. Like, it literally says even after he's cursed, he can transform himself into this angel of light. Mm -hmm. And his apostles can yep. deceive others likewise. There's, they are perfect imitators of holiness, of, of set-apartness, of awesomeness. 
And we have this idea that they're like, yeah, they're kind of ugly creatures like goitim, you know, little golems running around out there. We have no idea. And you even see Ab Adam just abdicating his covering. They cover themselves with fig leaves. It's the first mark of shame we ever see, you know, mm -hmm. like hide myself, cover myself, embarrassment. And yeah. instead you're like, they didn't boldly come forward and confess their sins. You know, they didn't come and repent. There wasn't true repentance here. If you notice, none of them demonstrated repentance, yep. the one way out of this entire thing. And instead they eat the curses, literally eat the curses. And it's the, the war never stops. Mutual enmity, by the way, is like inventing ways of evil towards each other. Like it is continual battle hatred. Like you're only ever going to fight continually. Yeah. There's never going to be peace, you know? And Yeshua yeah. is literally like, I came to bring mm -hmm. no peace, a sword, yep. you know? You have to always be aware that he is the enemy and the enemy is always on the prowl. Like... Yes. It never ceases. So, yeah, that's a very good perspective to have. Wow. <clears throat> so, um, what happened to your finger? I'm a little curious about that. <laughs> you know, I was playing with knives. Oh, okay. Make, okay I was okay. making a spear. I'm really passionate about making spears. You just mm -hmm. read these scriptures. You know, I read the Bible like it's a real thing. You know, like it's authentic. And I will never understand it unless I live it. Yeah. Like, I feel like I've got it. Like, I'm all about just total reckless abandonment, crazy, zealous immersion style of living. Yeah. And so when I read, like, spears in their hands all the time, I'm like, you know, I think we should have spears all the time. You know, Jacob, like all he had, he's darn near naked walking across and leaving, leaving the promised land to go over to meet with Laban and these, you know, mm -hmm. ladies he doesn't even know about yet. But he's like, I heard there's some pretty ladies over there. And he's just running around with a staff and he comes back totally restored and empowered to be a nation. You know, like all Moses had is a staff in his hand and the word that, that called him to that place. And yep. they conquer nations. And then you read Benaiah just slaying giants with nothing but a staff in his hand. But then you see about the spears and you're like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, you can walk around with a staff. It's totally normal. You start throwing spears on the end of it. People get excited. You know, people are like, that's totally different. It's very unusual. So I'm really passionate about making yeah. spears. Check and, out that uh, video, was, guys. Um, it's I, I remember I was watching it a couple days ago. Uh, you were making spears for your daughters. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh yeah. yeah, that was so cool. <laughs> that was. Yeah. We had these little tiny, we put ear, arrowheads, let's see. My daughter just found this one. This is oh, wow. amazing. She found this in a creek nearby, which oh. is like the biggest point. People, maybe it's like a more like a hand knife than anything. Not everything is an arrowhead because you try to shoot yeah. that out of a bow, it's going to come down real fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of times it's more like spears or hand knives and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But when I, I just had this crazy obsession with finding ancient artifacts. I feel like like the relic hunters. So it's just, I just want to hold the stuff you read about. You're like, this is like real stuff. Yeah, it and makes it, it over here. makes the word become a real like historical it's a real, thing. Yeah. It's like a real living thing. Like there yeah. were people here in the Americas that were 100% certain Hebrews. Like many, many. There's more physical Hebrew artifacts found here in the Americas than over there for a long time. And then they just totally changed the narrative in the mid 18th, 19th century. And they're like, you know what? You're not allowed to know about any of that. Mm. We're going to just start destroying and utterly blotting it out. This book in plain sight here which is all called Old World Records in the Americas. It's written by, let's see, there you go, Gloria Farley. This one, it chronicles so much of that. This is Baal's a pawn. You know, you read about these people in the scriptures, you're like, what the heck? Mm -hmm. All over the Americas here. And um, they go through petroglyphs. There's Anubis found in New Mexico, you know? Oh, right, like, right, okay, wow. Petroglyphs of all those characters we read about in the scriptures, you know, the death goddess and all this other stuff. But you're just like, this is straight up exactly what you find everywhere else from Megiddo. Here's one from Megiddo. This is an epitaph from Megiddo, one of their war gods. And here's the same one that's found parallels here. It's just like, it's an unbelievable amount of evidence that the Hebrews were all over the world because it said he'd scattered them to the four corners of the earth. If you remember, he's like, they're going everywhere. And this place was a highway and it is the old world. It's not a new world. It's like, hey, you guys are on an island that they try to pass this off. In the Americas, they're like, yeah, this people full of sticks and stuff. They just like these natives that live out there. They're like non-human, subhuman things, non-cultured versus the monoc. The, I mean, the advancement of the, the complexities of culture that have been all over the earth had to get completely eradicated from our ideology so that we would be willing to just butcher and slaughter everybody. Mm -hmm. Manifest destiny, this doctrine that they came up with, and be like, there's no written language, there's no cultures, they're just a bunch of savages, you know? So go take that land. <laughs> oh it's, it's disgusting. Narrative. Yeah, it doesn't we're, fly as well today, but. Yeah, we're of the same mind because uh, uh, we're Filipino. 
And we believe mm. that the Filipinos are actually the lost tribe because, you know, it says oh, after the second rain, they headed towards the east in the land of Ophir. And Ophir is the yes. Philippines. So, <laughs> yeah. Come on now. Yep. Come on now. That exactly. got me so fired up. Mm-hmm. Okay. I studied Filipino martial arts for a lot of years when oh, I was okay. young. Yeah, and yeah. I just love the Filipino culture and I love their bladesmith. Mm. They have an incredible way of dealing with jungles. And it's relentless. I love it. I've got, like, here, right here. Let me show you this one. So this, this is the, uni- Springfield Armory makes this. It's a, uh, this is the 1909 Polo Machete. Okay. And this was used specifically to engage in the, the Philippines and the Caribbean. And the Bolo is, like, the, the, a large knife, more or less. But it's got this kind of recurve shape. And it's for hacking away through a super thick blade. It's, mm-hmm. like, basically a miniature axe. And I love it. That's savage. Where are you, uh... You got to be talking a little bit more about the lost tribes. I would love to hear more about that. Come on. Uh, okay. Well, uh, see, the thing Pop is, my down. mom does a lot more of the research. I'm kind of. Let's more, bring her in. Can yeah. she come hang out? Um. So they actually just flew in. <laughs> so they're yeah. So their flight got delayed yesterday, and they were supposed to be here last night, but they got delayed in Dallas for four hours, so they missed their connecting flight in LAX. So they comped them for a hotel, and then they flew out uh, this morning, and they actually just landed. My sister's bringing them right now, so <laughs> they'll be walking in the door in while we're like, talking. So have her drop in here. Come on, she got to talk lost tribes with us. Oh yeah, definitely. She she was so excited to have this interview. So I'm 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 totally excited about it too. But um, for that aspect, because um, she's aware that even um, the older maps. Uh, of the Philippines are all written in Hebrew and it has Hebrew Whoa. names and like there's a Mount Sinai there's um there's like a, a Jordan and it's just like what like we we never would have expected but then it also it depicts too because when Shlomo or Solomon he um, got all his gold it said it took a year and a half's journey yes. both ways in order to get all the re, um, requirements that he needed, all the materials, and that's three years total. And then during yeah. those time, it was boats, you know, and like camels. And yeah. they, you can do the, the trajectory, and to the land of the Philippines takes exactly a year and a half both ways. So, yeah. So I love it. She'd have, have to tell you, watching, you more so about it. You've been watching it. some God culture, haven't you? Um, maybe. Did you watch that God culture? Yeah, man. The Land of Ophir. I dove into that series like multiple times. Yeah. And I was like, this is a treasure hunt of greatest kind. I love hidden forbidden archaeology. You want to see one that's super exciting? Check this out. Oh, yeah, go ahead. The oldest, the oldest copy of the stone 10 words, the Devarim, mm-hmm. is here in New Mexico. That same place I was showing you okay. petroglyphs from. Okay, this is called the Decalogue Stone, and this is in a trash heap area outside of Albuquerque. They're like, they don't want anybody to know about it. They're like, don't tell anybody. This book is called The Discovery of Ancient America, and uh, the Ten Commandments discovered before the time of Christ. Really? And uh, these, uh, oh, and it's got a whole bunch of other artifacts in here and stuff. But uh-huh. here, uh, just outside of this area in New Mexico, they had found all of these inscriptions petroglyphs on top of a little hill basically okay. and what, what it was is this is a sun this is a literal eclipse that they marked uh the astrological signs on this stone and when you go ahead and star map that date you literally end up on the dime of this is on uh, september 18th w- minus 106 so 106 years before the time of the messiah mm-hmm. and if you go back to that time frame wouldn't you know it? it's the feast days and so it literally appears that these Israelites went onto this mountain and celebrated Sukkot up there, but they made it basically like a military encampment. Mm-hmm. And there is all these buildings that were there that were found. Now, this is all not formally mm-hmm. excavated because they don't want anybody to ever document anything that proves that the Hebrews were here, right? They're like, of course shut up about all that stuff. Don't you <laughs> tell nobody. But down on the bottom, what's so awesome is they have this inscription of the 10 words. This is on this stone, huge oh, wow. stone. And it is the oldest copy of the Ten Commandments on the earth. And it is incredible. Nowadays, somebody's written, blotted out the first page, and here's the transliteration, the inscriptions mm-hmm. of it that he goes through. This book's incredible to get you fired up on a treasure hunt of treasure hunts that goes through a lot of the documentation of ancient Hebrew languages and artifacts were found here in the Americas. 
And uh, this one, get, this is like the map they basically built out of the city. This mm -hmm. is what the fortification looked like. And he compares it to cities that were found over in Israel. You know, there's like Megiddo and different fortifications and encampments. But okay. nobody has formally excavated this. And I just want to go. I'd want to go so bad. Is that book so still bad. available or did they pull I it off man. already? This one's super reasonably okay. priced too. All right. David it's Allen in America. Deal. Okay. David Allen Deal. So worth it. Thrift books, y'all. Go to the thrift books. And uh, like this one, he talks about, this is a really famous stone here. He above here. I'll just got to read this. I'll just let you check that out. Okay. This is one that was found here in the Americas. Look like a Levite. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just saying. Mm -hmm. This is over still. They still have this one. A lot of a lot of these got taken away and blotted out of our history through a institute that was founded by the Rockefellers, known yes, as the Smithsonian we are Institute. Fully aware of that. <laughs> Come on now. Come on now. A secret society, a total hidden handed agenda that is mm -hmm. most assuredly driven in the direction by the dragon. Yes. He's eating people's dust. You know, and uh, they can't they can't pass that narrative. Right. It says like there was three lies that he promised Eve there in the garden. He's like, you're going to eyes are going to be open. Mm -hmm. You're going to be like Elohim and you're going to know good from evil. And they bought it hook, line and sinker. And he delivered on zero of those promises. Right. Because he is the liar and he's the father of lies. Yep. He is the murderer from the beginning. And they have been lying about our culture and our history as long as they possibly could for as many years as they can. But if you go back yep. and start reading books from about 180 years ago, people were so well versed in the scriptures. They, they tolerated zero of this. They were well acquainted with the understanding that the people of Yah were scattered all over the earth. Yeah. And there were many people who had devoted themselves to trying to find evidence of the lost sheep of the house of Israel mm -hmm. all over the earth because they took the commandments from Yah very seriously and were like, we better go therefore unto all the nations preaching the gospel to every creature. And if his people are out there, we need to find them and yep. we need to let them know hey, Yah's calling you back. Yeah. You know, it's like this greater exodus that's going to happen, the great regathering like we read about in Jeremiah. You're like, he's going to, you're going to have a regathering of his people that's going to be so much more powerful and notable that they won't even talk about the exodus of Moses anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I can't wait. Gets me excited. It's, it's, it's always bothersome too that they have so much um, enmity with the Hebrew people now. And it's just like, why? Like, what's the point? You know, and a lot of uh, Christians like to think, oh, it's because they killed our Messiah. But the truth is, is that it was meant to happen. So it's not really their fault. Yes. You know, like yes. you wouldn't have yes. salvation without it. Like, <laughs> Yes. So, yes. And indeed, they, there is a strong delusion that was sent upon them. Right. They hardened their hearts. This was the whole thing. Yep. This is this is the great sin of pride. Right. It's that when it's the sin of Saul, it's the same sin that King Saul had. Right. When he was confronted and rebuked by Samuel, he should have gone over and hewed Hagag, Agag to pieces. Yeah. He should have cut him apart. He should have killed all the sheep and the and the cattle that were lowing. Right. Mm -hmm. He should have blotted them off of the earth. Right. Harem executed all of them immediately shown true repentance gone in and done the word of yahuwah yeah. and instead he's like esteem me before the elders of the people please please just please make me look powerful and mighty still before you leave me forever and he literally hell he clung to the power right yeah. why did he not turn it over to david jonathan had the heart of Moses. He had that heart of humility, that meekness. He had the power to be the prince that fought for the kingdom of Saul. And instead he yielded to the word of Elohim. And he's like, David, you're anointed. You are chosen by Yahuwah to be the ruler, period. And he's like, let's enter into a covenant. Right. And this is right yep. after the days of yep. killing Goliath. Like he knew the anointing of Yahuwah was upon him, mm -hmm. not upon his father. He recognized it. But Saul clung to that power. He fought for that power. He wanted to hold on to it. And that same that same root, that same spiritual pride that puffed them up with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, this, they were trying to cling to it. You know, when the Messiah, the true king, was right there in their midst, he was veiled to them because pride blinds. It says Leviathan is the king over all the children of pride. So like anybody that's being ruled by pride, they're in Leviathan's kingdom. Yep. He is their sovereign. He <clears throat> is their mighty one. And he rules over them. Yeah. This is like no joke. So you're absolutely right. And the way you see Leviathan has this impenetrable armor, mm -hmm. this indestructible iron who has the same eyes. It's like Halal ben Shahar. It's like the eyes of Lucifer, that fiery serpent of cherub is in his eyes. Yeah. It's burning. The same iniquity that was found in Halal is found in Leviathan. And that's what consumes people mm -hmm. to where they're literally getting the whole crowd to turn on Yahshua and say, let his blood be on us and our children forever. You know, but he literally says, Yahuwah is like, listen, y'all, you're grafted in to the tree that, that they're their foundations. You know, the children of Israel, don't forget, like, 
you Gentiles, the people that are foreigners from all over the earth, you have the right to come in, but don't you think just because he broke off their branch that he won't break you off too? Exactly. You know, that pride, if that pride comes into us, we're going to be sons of Leviathan just like them. Yep. Yep. I agree. Yeah. It even says in the uh, Testament of Nicodemus too, because uh, he was there when, you know, Yeshua was about to be crucified and they, uh, Pontius Pilate, they said, he asked him and he asked the group and he said, do you not know who this is? And they said, mm -hmm. yes, we know this is the Messiah. And they still did it. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So you're right. It was the hardened of the hearts, right? So. Yeah. Jeez. It's incredible. Um, let's get back into some questions that um, I know that Sweet. my mom and I personally had. Um, so you just I read from a specific book. And I've noticed that some people have... Uh, a certain um, translation that actually puts the name of Yahweh in the English language. What book do you read from that you do all your videos with? Right now, so I've done a few different over over the years. I, I, I prefer restored names, scriptures, so there's quite a variety. I'll say none of them, I believe, are inerrant in that sense, just just so we're clear here. There's major translation bias in every one of them, yeah. and there are some are way more overt about that and okay. discouragingly so. So, But the few of them that I have read from predominantly had been the Sefer at Sefer, which is because it has a lot of the text that used to be included in our scriptures, like in the 1611 King James Version, there was way more than 80 books that used to be in there. And then they blotted a lot of those out. They're like, those make it super uncomfortable for us to advance this agenda. So they took a bunch out. Yeah. So I like the Sefer for that reason. However, it's in Elizabethan English, which is very difficult and terrible to read. And the yeah. transliteration of it makes it almost unintelligible to humans' ears, to minds. You can't understand what the heck people are saying when you're starting to talk in certain words. So the Culture scriptures thing. <laughs> translation, yeah. It's really awkward when you're trying to read to somebody out of that translation. And they're like, I... I don't know anything you just said. And I'm like, neither do I. I yeah. need a dictionary. <laughs> you know, that's difficult. And that's frustrating. And that's one of the difficulties that translators run into. But okay. I really, I like the ISR, uh, Institute for Scriptures Research, okay. ISR translation. This is the 2009 large print edition. That's what I did my whole audio scriptures recording um, of. I have a, the entire <laughs> audio Bible read in the strong narrated voice. Oh, no, yeah. Um, I, I was reading I, through I uh, Thessalonians. That was very good. So. <laughs> Sweet, man. Thessalonians. Yeah. They're gleaning from there. So that's that's the translation that I went with. Um, I like its readability. I think it maintains the core integrity of the majority of the scriptures. There's still some in there that I want to throw a wrench directly in the face of the translators who just ripped it out and tore it apart. Yeah. Super difficult. But they were at least transparent in the very beginning of this. Guys, there's these introductions to books. It's like people that read my book. And I'm like, I tell him, I'm like, hey, listen, right in the very beginning, I'm like, finish it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, read it from beginning to end. I know it's going to be hard. And at times you're not going to want to. Even in the, I'll be honest, there's some sections in the scriptures where you're like, okay, I'd really rather just skip right past this part. But there's pearls hidden every single page of that scriptures. And it's really critical that we not be like guilty of adding to or taking away from a single word of the, any of the scriptures. Absolutely. Because, you know, not there's a, a curse that's... that's not a jot or a tittle. That's like a single tiny little letter, like yep. this ancient Paleo Hebrew here that I'm trying to learn because I want to be able to decipher all these ancient manuscripts when I find them inevitably. And this is like every single one of these is so critically important. Every letter has its own just unbelievable depth of meaning, like that so children can understand it. Like mm -hmm. it's just the enriching power of what the word contains in it is so vast beyond our wildest comprehension. There's so many layers to it. Yep. And the more you dig into it, the more you find, like in the end of Deuteronomy, he's like, oh, let's just go there. Deborim, the very end of Deuteronomy is just this brilliant little comment about where he hides his treasures. Um, see, I think it's in 29 here. Ready? Let's see who finds it. It's about treasure. Hmm. I'm not going to find it. Sorry. Uh, I just drew my sword and I found a blunt edge. Oh, no, no, it's fine. But it basically says that as you study this Torah, the more that you study it and dig into it, the, he literally re reveals his treasures to you. 
Like he literally unlocks understanding to you. He gives you wisdom, knowledge, understanding as you seek him out diligently. Like it's one of the great, there's no other book that's like it. It does, it's a literal living book Mm -hmm. because every time you come to it, you're different. Every time that you come to these pages, you're not the same human. You're not the same man. You're not the same woman. And you're that set apart spirit that is made to live in you, to dwell in you. That is to help circumcise the foreskin of your heart that you're not this hardened stone, you know, like this. The meteorite that I found in Colorado, this Whoa, giant dense cool. piece, <laughs> it's crazy, ridiculous. I love it. I prayed my whole life to find one of these. I'm gonna cut it into pieces and melt it down and make it into a sword that's called Nahushtan, the ah. Dragon Slayer sword. You know, you said like it was what a they meteorite? call it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Absolutely, nickel iron meteorite. And so, so this this crazy. That's a whole other side tangent we could go into one day. But these super dense, absolutely unstoppable, incredible things that are waiting to be found all around us, hiding in plain sight. Like that is what this living word really is. And no matter how much we think we've come to find out so much of it, and we're like, oh, this is kind of the dense section. You're like in the names list, the genealogies, and you're like, dang. I'm in the beginning of Chronicles and I just want to tear my eyes out because I'm trying to read these words that are so difficult. Like every time I was trying to do these audio recordings and I get to the genealogies, I'm like, gear up, son, gear up. It's difficult. But you know what? There's a labor of love that you learn stuff. Like I was just listening in in Second Kings, the very end of Second Kings this morning. I was trying to get my son to sleep at five this morning. And so I put on Second Kings. We listen to the audio scriptures all the time. Oh, it's good. And I was listening to Second Kings and there's this pearl at the very end in Second Kings 24. And it talks about El Nathan, and I perk up because I'm like, hey, my name's in the Bible. That's so <laughs> And uh, I get fired up when I hear that. And uh, and then it's got this word, Nahashta. And I'm like, what? Oh, somebody's, no. name is, somebody's name's got serpentish stuff in it. And it always, it's yeah. <laughs> Second Kings 24, you check this out. This was cool. This was the name of one of the mothers of one of the kings of Israel. And uh, her name's got... A, this serpentish name sounding stuff in it, Nun and Chet. And you ready? This is the very uh, beginning, verse 10. Oh, uh, no, right before that. El Nathan. Verse 8. And Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign. Just stop for a second. How old are you, sir? Can I ask? I uh, just turned 30 a couple of days ago. You turned 30. Mm-hmm. So almost half your age ago, this guy's running the kingdom. Yeah. Bro, this is this, the level of brilliance and intelligence that was genuinely imparted onto the youth was completely different. We have this artificial extension of adolescence that we call the public schooling system Mm -hmm. that just ruins our culture and makes children think that they're supposed to be children even after they're nine years old. Almost in no culture anywhere in the world are a child a child after nine years old, maybe 10 or 11. Shockingly rare that they're 12 years old. They're considered a man, a young man, a young woman. Just like you read about Uh, in the scriptures where David's got young men and young women killing people for him. Can you mute that, please? Can you mute whatever you got going on, please? My parents just got home, so I didn't want the audio to overlap. So, (laughs) like shut them down. But in verse in verse eight, it says, uh, "And he reigned in Jerusalem three new moons. How long is he ruling for? Three new moons. That's three months. (laughs) This is a short tour of duty. Oh wow! How's it going? (laughs) That's the man. (laughs) That's the man himself. (laughs) Oh." Glad to see you guys. As you can see, they are literally just getting home. That's so. awesome. I'm glad they made it. Yeah. And yeah. it says, and his mother's name was Nahushta, the daughter of El Nathan of Yerushalayim. And he did evil in the eyes of Yahuwah, according to all that his father did. See, there's a bad guy. Super bad guy. Y'all was like, you got 90 days, son, to change your act. He doesn't. He's like, you done. You done. Anyways, his mom's name has got this the serpent in it. And you're like, this is peculiar. Yeah, and uh, wow. this is where you get a lot of the words like of copper and a brazen altar. There's this like, I think that they're literally destroyed by copper. And so I like to make weapons out of copper and nickel and silver mm, because that's, that's what bronze, the real reason that the bronze age existed <laughs> for so long is because they were hunting Nephilim and Rephaim and it totally destroys the regenerative powers. And wow. so I like to incorporate it into my blades. Yeah, my favorite aspect of uh, reading the scripture now is uh, I kind of went through Bible college a little bit, so I understood this like a, at an early aspect, but I love finding Yeshua in the Old Testament. That's my yes. favorite thing about so, like scripture is because it makes me understand how in control he is when we have no mm. idea how in control he is. <laughs> like yes. It blows my mind every single time I find him in the Torah. It's just like, oh, there he is again. <laughs> like, <laughs> So, 
<clears throat> from the beginning. From the beginning, you're going to find him every yep. single there. The word of Elohim the came word. to them. You're like, what did that? Was yeah. some kind of like fairy magic speaking in the ear, whisper talk thing? You know, you're like, where's this? The word yep. coming to them. John 1-1, like, right? The word come was Come on, God. bro. You're like, he gave it to you right there. He's like, how about we go right to the book of John? He's like, let's just lay it out straight up. Every time you all heard about the word, this is him, mm -hmm. by the way. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever doubt it. Yep. Like, he's been there from the beginning. From Genesis, Perashim. They exactly. would have been like, <gasps> they were like, either kill that guy or he is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So you see the you see the splitting of the kingdom, you know. Yeah. Over that same question, they're like, well, is he the Messiah, or is he the counterfeit? Yeah. You know. Okay, so but I you know had, by their fruits. I had another question. Um, kind of pertains to your um, just your journey in general. Um, how did you get saved? How did Yeshua find you, bro? He never lost me, first and foremost. Yes, that there you go. <laughs> He's an extremely vigilant shepherd. He is called the chief shepherd, shepherd of all shepherds. Yep. And you know, there's one thing about a shepherd which matters a lot. Even though one of them might wander, mm -mm, he ain't lost. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They may think they are the ones who are lost. Yeah. It's a totally different thing if you're omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Yep. You're like, I know where you are always continually. Mm -hmm which is super serious and should invoke an incredible amount of tremendous fear and trembling inside of every sheep on the earth, you know? Yes. Like the good shepherd knows where you are, no matter how deep you are in the depths of darkness and despair and doubt and depravity. He's like, I love you. Mm -hmm. I'm right where you are. And I want to draw He's you up out there. of that field. He's always field. been there. <laughs> He's like, I ain't ever going. He never looks away. This is, this is, this is my big giant why in my life for why I serve him and no other Elohim. Mm -hmm. Like he does not turn away from evil, nor is it ever in him to do wickedness he only does good continually even if he's chastising even if he's disciplining yep. even if he's utterly blotting out like he is a good shepherd who knows exactly what we all need but you know i he really began hunting my soul quite diligently at a young age mm -hmm. and he showed himself to be mighty to me through his messengers his people his ambassadors on this earth the representatives of the messiah that showed me a men were supposed to be men i saw a lot of sissified men throughout my life and in my youth like I got dragged around from these like soft, soggy versions of Christianity that tried to show me a version of a pastor guy who was standing on stage, you know, who couldn't detect radical, intelligent evil sitting in the room. And it just I, I saw evil like have power over and over and over again, over yep. the Christians, over yep. the Catholics, over the Baptists, over the Protestants, over like I saw I saw evil rule over them. And I saw it through compromise. As I got older, I started to learn it was because compromise had rooted compromise. itself into so many. Compromise yeah. was the, is the currency of the kingdom of darkness. And yeah. that is they're literally like, what's their price? Mm -hmm. There are like two rules. This is like a total disgusting doctrinal pursuit of compromising people. If you can't figure out their, their price, you find their vice. And Whoa, this is what I continue. Let's go. They get you addicted. Yep. They get you, they're, they're going to find one of these two things. And unless people are truly walking in an absolute, relentless, all in, pure, pure, fiery, salt and light truth commitment to the kingdom of righteousness, yep. they're going to get you, son. Like they, there is a, a strategic intelligence agency that devotes itself completely to building dossiers of destruction on every man, woman, and child from the day of their utterance of life on this earth from the day they're conceived in the womb till the day that they die all they think about is finding ways to utterly keep them from their calling and their convictions of righteousness yeah. and so every one of us you got to understand there's like people are like the nsa spying on us and they're gonna get us all they know what we're doing man they have to use storage drives and let me just tell you like when you try to store data 20% of all the profits that are made by the storage drives, the, the like the actual, there's only predominantly two in the world. There's a crazy monopoly on storage drives. Yep. Then 20% the, of all the data every single year is lost. Every single year you put a storage drive and you're like, I'm going to store all my pictures on this thing. You're going to lose about 10 to 20% of that's going to be corrupted. You're going to go be like, I transferred it to this other hard drive. And for some reason, my files aren't there. That's because when you buy a hard drive from the store, you're buying a damaged one. Like they literally are selling you one that failed. So say it's a 10 terabyte hard drive, like, or say, let's just go down to a two terabyte hard drive. Mm -hmm. And one of the drives fails. So then they sell it as a one terabyte hard drive. Okay, and you're like, oh, sweet, I got this one terabyte hard drive that's already broken. That's why you got it. Yeah. Okay, so they they cannot even keep the data. They cannot even keep the data. So even if you have a, an alternative of an omniscient intelligence network, mm -hmm. they can't actually store it. It's one of the major problems that they run into. Yeah. 
let alone their ability to disseminate that information and turn it into actionable intelligence. But we have a different kingdom of darkness that's behind that, that does have a counterfeit to omniscience. And that's through spiritual and human agents that are occupying every region of the earth. Like there is enemy occupied territory in every corner of this earth. And so because of that, they are continually building up these dossiers of information mm -hmm. that are like, they're literally like perfect psychologists that's that are literally sitting there being like, I got to find you out. Hey, you make sure to tell them they got to get in here at some point. Hey, yeah, we're I know, talk, right? You guys got to get in Hebrew. here. Like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> but, um, but I guess they, my specific thing was because um, the only way that we're ever led to Yeshua is when we have a spiritual encounter because of Abba. So I guess my question right, draws was, us first. Yeah. So I guess my question was, did you uh, or when or did you have that spiritual encounter with him? I assure you, I'm getting there. Okay, I'm okay, getting there. okay. okay. Uh, I, I I'm like so. I I, I'm, I'm so I'm curious tree, about that. I'm, my brain works thing. like a banyan tree, and you have those around you, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like you can't, you can't climb one nip it of it and be like, "This is it." No, okay. my brain's gonna go in forty thousand okay, other directions. But don't you worry. Going on. I'm ready. It comes, I'm ready it comes for straight it. back. I assure you, it works like a freight train. Eventually, it gets there, man. Yeah, it just yeah, takes yeah, a while to build some steam, but. This, this dossier system, this intelligence network is entirely driven to keep you from the truth, mm -hmm. right? It is designed to set a, 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 con a covering over your eyes so that you can't, you blind your eyes so you cannot know the truth. Yeah. But you hit it on the head, man. It says unless faith comes from hearing, right? Mm -hmm. We get like, you cannot have belief. You cannot have convictions of belief unless you hear the word. Yeah. Like you, somebody has to impart the word unto you. You need to hear the word. No man can come to the father, uh, to the son, unless the father draws him um, first. So yes. there's this hierarchy of, of requirements, prerequisites for anybody to come to hear about the truth. And it, it literally requires the ambassadors of Yah to be faithful, to do the great commission, to obey their master, to obey their captain of the heavenly host. Like yep. you've got a job to do, which is to set is to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And, because of that, there was this team of people when I was seven years old. So I've seen on one side of my life, the only place I ever saw power was in these occulted groups, was in these Jesuit society, was in these serpent eating cults. I saw power manifest. I saw supernatural, awe, awe inspiring wonders being done with horrible atrocities as the power bank for it. But then when I would go into these churches, I was seeing this like soft people, soft, I mean, word strong but they were weak in reality they physically were weak, weak humans spirit. they yep. they were weak in spirit they they believed what they believed but they did not have the masculinity that i wanted to see like boys need to see men being men it's critically important and if you don't see that you become a completely counterfeit version of what a man is supposed to be you basically be a perpetual child the rest of your life because no one ever showed you what a man is yeah. and so i finally saw that when i was seven years old my parents had this this house in flagstaff arizona and we had a television in there but we almost never had it on unless there were certain weird circumstances going on we had like a 30 minute a day tv level consider that y'all limit yourself to black mirror watching for less than 30 minutes a day <laughs> I don't even bother. <laughs> drastically change your life. And, but I'm talking about these screens too. Y'all are watching. You can turn oh, me off no, anytime. Yeah, it's totally I, fine. Uh, yeah, but but they, my, my parents had these people coming in and doing carpet cleaning because all kinds of crazy, filthy stuff was going down in that house and they had to regularly clean it out. Yeah. And they were coming in and cleaning it out. And my, my mom turned on the TV and I was sitting there on this little couch and I was staring, staring at the TV and these people came on that were called the power team. And I was like, what is this? And they were in this arena. They were in this giant arena, and there was these yoked out bros just tearing phone books in half, like in muscle shirts and just meathead bodybuilders, but not like the steroid rage kind of psychopathic versions okay. where they just – no, like – humans that were mighty right like the gibberim we read about in the scriptures these mighty men of david and valor and they're like grabbing giant chunks of rebar and just bending them mightily and you're like wow, wow. they're so strong tearing decks of cards in half and license plates and you're like this is just amazing and they just do all these mighty acts right yeah and then at the end of it they get up there and preach a salty gospel message and they're like you think we're strong and they're like, we're just weak men who've met the mighty one. His name is Jesus Christ, and he can live in you. The one who lives in me can live in you. And if you want the power of God, you can call on him right now, and he will come in you and make you mighty like he was. And I was like, 
I want in. Yeah, I want in. I want a piece of that. I want that. I want that power in me. You know, because I was this tiny, continually, perpetually picked on and abused, tortured and fragmented soul yep. who desperately wanted freedom. Like, I just wanted freedom. I wanted to make a choice that could set me free. And I knew, I believed that the words that that man was saying were consistent with the scripture that I was becoming well acquainted with. Like as soon as I was able to read, I read first and second Samuel, like right out of the gates. I went to a school where they're like, you're going to memorize Genesis one. And I'm like, I want to read David all day because I was like, I want to read about the mighty guys, you know? And in the beginning, it sure doesn't look very much like Yahuwah looks super mighty, but yeah. Adam doesn't. You know, you're devastated by Adam right in the beginning. It's super discouraging. You're like, come on, bro. Like, how many years did you have it? How many years? Like, I just, it's super depressing. It's a devastating story. It's its a tragedy. Yeah, you know, the, the scripture starts out with the most incredible, awesome utopia. Like, the only ever potential utopia that ever has been was there for only a tiny season of time. And it's a crushing story. And the one who appears to be mighty is the great dragon. You know, it's the one who duped mankind. He's got the duper's delight. And he's smiling all the way to the bank as he just completely plunders us. And he takes the keys of death. And you're like, this sucks. Yeah. This story sucks so bad and you don't really see another super strong mighty person except for a random mention of enoch and they're like yahoo said he was righteous and he took him and you're like why like why does that guy get basically to live forever and perfect and more you're like what the heck is that about and you're like if you would like to know the answers know. read the book of enoch <laughs> you're like well, if you only read the book of first enoch that they ripped out of your scriptures a long time ago because yeah. you're not allowed to know the truth Anyways, there was information that was concealed from me. I hate that stuff, man. Yeah, Somebody compromised and, and stripped the scriptures of something in critical pieces of information. Mm -hmm. And you see Noah. Noah sounds pretty mighty. He's like building crazy massive ships and preaching hybrids. You're like, this dude sounds savage. I like that. Mm -hmm. And then you get to Nimrod, and he's this mighty hunter before Yahuwah. He's like getting in the face of Yahuwah and doing all the things he says not to do, and he's building up a kingdom of iniquity. And he's like, yeah. Yahuwah literally has to destroy the Tower of Babel. And you're like, what the heck is going on here? Like there's, I mean, it is a crazy war over and over again. And I just wanted to be able to read the story of Dave. I wanted to read how he got to be who he was. Like uh, the story of Samuel, the story of, of John, of Jonathan and Benaiah. Like there's these mighty men in there. And then you're utterly failing to Absalom. And just, there's these crushing stories throughout the scriptures. And you're just like, this is a brutal knockdown drag out battle. And you know what? Even the mightiest of the warriors fail. Yeah. And they're they're you're just by the time you read, if you read the book in its chronological order, it helps you be desperate for deliverance. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to the days of Yeshua, you're 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 basically hopeless. You know, like you're basically like it's all it's all it's all just a total fail over and it's face palm devastating screw ups time after time well, profits they, coming they in and they're like that way right so they design it that way yeah. by the time you get to the days of the messiah you're just like please yeah. oh. and so i i it was that it was seeing mightiness physically displayed and and men that were mighty in deed and, and in word yeah. that's what got me hook line and sinker and then i was able to actually start reading the word for myself and that transforming because then i was no longer dependent on the interpretation of man mm. yeah that's what amazed me about yeshua's walk too was that he, even though he wasn't like this ripped yoke dude you could see power you know like you could physically yeah. feel the power and it's just oh i gotta show you something here okay uh Chucks, they just left. I was going to take a potty break. <laughs> oh, you can run. I got this thing. I'll hold it on the fort. Okay, okay. I'll be right I'm gonna back. Show artwork. I, I'd be like I'm going to show artwork of seconds. Mighty Yeshua here. Check this out, y'all. All right, show okay, it. So one, this, is, this is from John chapter 2. This is, I always love this question. What is the only time Yeshua ever braided, made a weapon? Like, he personally sat down and made a vindictive, destructive weapon. He premeditated, utterable vengeance was coming in. It's John chapter 2, sneak peek right here. Look at this. This is someone made this for me because I love this story. This is when he's braiding a whip, right? And you're all like, yeah, because the bro knew how to make zit seats. You know what I'm saying? The Messiah is all like, he's a master zit seat maker. Bro be crushing them fringes all the time. He braids this weapon right here. And then he goes into the tent. Let's just read it because it's great. This is the stuff that gets me fired up every single time because it's all about zealousness. You all know about zealots? 
people that are freakishly passionate about their beliefs so much so that they're willing to do unimaginably intense things, super dangerous acts in order to fulfill them and see them brought to fruition. So there was three basic groups at the time that were operating during the days of Yeshua's time, which is the Pharisees. Everyone's all like, oh, yeah, we know about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and then there's the Zealots. The zealots get no press coverage because you know why? They're the assassins. And that's obviously not fitting the image of these sissified believers. They're like, we don't want people to know about the rebels. We don't want people to know about the people that were literally so zealous for Yahuwah that they were willing to fight and contend against the kingdom. We're talking about zealots real quick. Okay. So there was the third group, Pharisees, Sadducees, and then the zealots, right? This is literally when you're reading the names and genealogies, sometimes they'll talk about Iscariot. These are like Sicario. We call them Sicario in Spanish, which is the assassins. Hashashins is also what they're known oh, as. Yeah, yeah, but this is literally what Judas was. Like they are literally people in Yeshua's homies group, you know, the Shalomi homies of the apostles. They're like, he's got assassins in there too. They were the zealots. These are people that were so passionate about keeping the commands of Yahuwah that they would hunt down and eradicate people that forced people to break the commandments of Yahweh. A lot of this birth came out of the times during the Maccabean revolt. And there was this like desire that we got to overthrow our overlords and mm -hmm. fight back against that kingdom. Right? So in the book of John chapter two, you should go there, dude, you got a sword. Hi. Hello. Hey, Nathan. Well, that's How why are I asked you? About yours. We I just flew yours. in. <laughs> I'm sorry we missed most of the show, but I'm so glad no, that you were you talking to our son Isaac. It was, it was, I was amazing. I, I was. I was just. I just jumped on a little bit ago. We can hopefully go late. I don't know. Do you sure, have a hard sure. cut off? You have to turn it off. Yeah. Oh. No. No. We got a lot of time. We're good. Great. Yeah. Keep Great. going. We we're, were listening to you on our way in, on our way, our drive oh, from sweet. the airport. So it was awesome. All right. Yeah, well, this is John. Going. So, hey, I'm going to I'm going to call on you to talk all about ancient Hebrew and the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, honey, see, he's going to call oh. on you to talk about lost sheep in ancient Israel. There you go. In Hebrew. Lost sheep. There's, there's the, there's lost there's the lost I'll tribes. The lost tribes. I want to all about it. Oh, yeah, lost not yet. Not, you give me a minute here. I'm going to I'll wrap this point up real quick. And then I would love to pick your brain and hear all of the they're wonderful treasure lost. trove that's hiding. <laughs> no. <Honestly, no. laughs> So this is uh, this is in. I was, I was showing this earlier. You might have missed it, but this is an artwork that someone did because I'm always talking about when Yeshua personally made a weapon, and uh, when zeal for his house will consume him. Oh you wow! Know? This is uh, the the master's hands braiding a weapon before he inaudibly drives him out. Oh, so cool! We're go to John two fifteen through seventeen. You check this out. And having made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the set apart place with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money changers coins and overturned the tables. And he said to those selling doves, take these away. Do not make the house of my father a house of merchandise. And his taught ones remembered that it was written, the zealousness for your house has eaten me up. That's from Psalm 69, nine. Like, there is this all-consuming fire that was in him because he was made in the image of Yahuwah, perfect, without the fear of man. Like, he refused to give in to the compromise that so many people do in ministry, which is greediness for gain, yeah. which is greediness for gain. And it's not, just, it's not just money. Sometimes it's views. Sometimes it's authority. Like King Saul holding on to the power and refusing to let it go. Like, Every day for the rest of King Saul's life, he thought of ways to kill David. He had a spear in his hand and he refused to let go of it. Mm -hmm. Like every day for the rest of his life, he was consumed with the desire to murder David and to hold on to his power, not understanding that it was irrevocable. The word of Yahuwah had been spoken. It was never going to change. Like, therefore, the sons of Jacob don't perish. You know, like mm -hmm. Yahuwah had the same powerful zealousness for his word. He says he watches over his word, right, to bring it to pass. Like he is the guardian of the word. And here is the living embodiment of his word on the earth. And that zealousness is about people merchandising his people, merchandising mankind. And this is the hallmark example of the corporatization of, of society that we're, in, we're suffering from. You're talking about this overtake and overreach of people that are coming in and stealing, stealing people's lives, yep. consuming their lives so that they can have their land, so that they can merchandise it, mm -hmm. turn it into something else. This is devouring and destroying communities all over this country. We went through something very similar in Boulder, Colorado, when they brought in this storm system and held it on top of Boulder, Colorado for days and days and days and just deluged and deluged and flooded out, killing people, drowning, destroying roads, destroying infrastructure. Uh -huh. I mean, it was so much damage and it caused them to be like, you know what? 
the money's going to all go into the hands of insurance companies because nobody had flood protection that covered that exact thing. They're like, we're going to rule this thing, you know, an act of God. Whoop, guess that's not on your plan. You know what I mean? Like how they're doing the same thing there. And they came in and so many people, then they started passing laws. They're like, oh, well, let's just work with the legislatures. And we'll go ahead and pass legislature that says you all got to have this flood insurance now. If you're going to be in this county, you're going to have flood insurance. And then they cranked up the rates and cranked up the rates. And they gentrified. They, they literally pushed out people through this same methodology. They merchandised the people. And then they came in and turned it into the smart city and the safe haven city. And Google put their headquarters buildings in there. Amazon put their headquarters. And they made this, this smart grid city. And they just started driving out the humanity. They started driving out the righteousness and infiltrating the wickedness into its yeah. place. You know, and this is that same <coughs> ideology that made Yeshua literally be like, I'm going to go personally, utterly drive these people out of my father's house. Like, yeah. this is the stuff we're supposed to pick up pick up literal weapons and wage a war against and now like i find these weapons to be far more effective to do that these days than the other ones like the bolo machete i was showing your son earlier i'm all about Filipino nice tools. yeah we're talking about my the absolute Filipinos. favorite tools on the face of the earth filipinos <laughs> was bolo the knife that the, me. the bolo knife yep yes yes this is this is what i literally grew up using and still use to this day as the most effective tools and, and system Beautiful i've ever handle. learned nice yeah yes but i I am I am passionate that people would pick up that same sword of their mouth and pick up the zealousness that they were made to have in them to utterly drive out the kingdom of compromise, yep. the kingdom of cowardice and corruption from their midst, to have a zero tolerance policy for the merchandising of our brothers and sisters or for the ministry, for people that are trying to contend in the kingdom of darkness that we'd not be found like the world where we're looking for ways to profiteer off of each other no. but instead we're building up each other laying down our lives for each other giving giving of ourselves continually just as his word does just as his son did just as his righteous people have always done they lay down their lives for their friend that's true love they mm -hmm. surrender their desires like if our for in order for any of us to come to life our mothers literally had to give up their lives they had to give up their bodies. They had to give up their everything for any of us to have life. My yeah. wife is in the process of putting our two twin babies down. She's literally giving them her life away. Yeah. Like if she yeah. doesn't do that, yeah. they die, you know? Yeah. And this is how we're supposed to be willing to literally lay down our lives for each other so that we can be set free. Yep. All right. Uh, I'm hearing you on all aspects, but uh, we do have a couple questions that um, <laughs> the, audience. the audience would like to ask. So the first question that I saw pop up over here was, who is your guest? Great. <laughs> so we're going to go back, back to and talk about that. <laughs> so um, everybody, this is Nathan Reynolds. He, um, the, um, he has his own YouTube channel called Nathan Reynolds, uh, parentheses, The Linen Railroad. And nice. um, by, by all means, go check him out. He's, uh, I would like to say, another brother in Christ that um, – uh, what was willing to come and do an interview with us. So, um, yeah, uh, he's a father of three, four, 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 four right? We've got four. a quad pod now. Twins. Four children. Oh, oh. You bet. We Amazing. didn't know we were going to have twins until I caught my son in a copper basin. And, uh, <laughs> that was a super surprise of my life. He was a veiled son. We had a, a natural home birth that was incredibly terrifyingly wonderful. Awesome. It was beautiful. So and awesome. you all were made to have babies and have them at home. And we really um, were. my Auntie Tammy uh, put a link to your uh, YouTube channel in the chat too. So Sweet. You can um, go to snatchedfromtheflames.com also is, is my website where a bunch of stuff is. Okay, got it. And then uh, we had another yeah. question. Uh, Nathan, is it true that some serpent seed can shapeshift into reptilians? Do you personally know if mm. any? I read your book and loved it. Outrageous. Outrageous. What a good question. Y'all want to talk reptilians for a minute? Okay. Is, I have, so. I have, uh, <laughs> let's go, man. You know, it's nighttime. I, I can talk all kinds of crazy wild because my children are in bed, and it's going to be a totally different kind of show. They were trying to stand here and watch earlier. They're all, like, peeking in and trying to see. Yeah, like, it's so cute. It's bedtime. We're going to talk reptilians and serpent seed stuff. It's going to get okay. rowdy around here. So, hey, here's a uh, – I'll give you guys a reference book. Can I? Come here. Come along with me for a journey here. This is called The Black Awakening, Rise of the Satanic Super Soldier. Okay. This is written by a guy named Russ Dizdar, ShatterTheDarkness.net. I can't encourage you all enough to go there. He's got thousands and thousands and hours of training materials and stuff dealing with the radical intelligence kingdom of darkness and nice. all the facets of how they engage in that warfare, that strategic warfare that 
goes on. Mm -hmm. But when you want to talk about like the sun, the seed of the serpent, there is one crazy bizarre encounter that I had in my like totally normal life in, in my, uh, back in Denver, Colorado. This is the only time like in, in the normal, like up above ground kind of world that I have been in where I saw something that was just like this that we're talking about here real quick. So I'm going to tell that story because it was insane. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to that data storage stuff. So I got, I got invited in to be a secure, the head of a security consultant mm -hmm. for a technology company that was developing storage drives and a storage drives that could be like basically a, um, a petabyte on the size of your phone. So like thousands of terabyte size storage drives on a super tiny drive. Yeah. And so it, would, it brought us into all of these circles with AI and with quantum mechanics and with defense contractors and Los Alamos. And it was a really strange little world. But one of the big um, side pieces of that was using hemp, CBDs, and, and predominantly hemp fibers to, to make graphene and to make circuit boards with. Okay. And oh, wow. so I... I got invited. There's a university in Poland that was like one of that has been one of the pioneers for research over the last you know millennia more or less. They've been they've never stopped researching different ways that we can use hemp or cannabis for different materials. It's industrial uses, right? Right. right. And uh, so one of the guys who was on the team, he was very interconnected in the cannabis industry in Colorado. So we got invited to go to what was called like the Cannabis Awards. And it was quite a red carpet thing. Like, it was ridiculous. I've never been to anything quite like it in my life. Whoa. And uh, it was strange because it was at this place that's called The Church. I believe it's just called The Church. I know that and it's place. A... I lived in Denver Stop. for a couple years. Stop. This gets creep fest. It's you know that place. Up. It is super perverse. Okay, so. The Church. Yes. It's a psycho show. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So it is like an old Catholic church, right? This gets creepy, way creepy and dark super fast. So hang in there. And um, we, we get to this, this church. It's an old Catholic church, and they've got a red carpet. They have, like, you know, all the luxury cars, valets, the lights and everything. They're, like, trying to make it a serious production event. Like, mm -hmm. this would make Edward Bernays and the propaganda system super proud. It was like people are going to feel special here, you know. And so you get, in, you get into the, the main entrance, and instead of, like, the sanctuary, right, there are, they have filled the sanctuary with like a dance floor, you know, a DJ club, mixed studio, bar, yep. like it's literally a club, yep. you know, and, and in the corners of it, in the corners of it, they have demons like gargoyle, the most, I mean, drinking blood, ripping things apart, like the overt expression, de-occulted, demonic everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like they have fully embraced disgustingness it's in every cool. crowd, literally in the corners all around you, they brought in satanic idols and images of every kind bestiality like x-rated stuff all over the place mm -hmm. and it's up in these corners and you can't quite see it because of the way they do the lighting and so then they've got certain little undertone lighting so you can see little parts mm -hmm. of it but i bring around these stupid bright flashlights like i don't mess around <laughs> i always nice. like to light up the bright light you know like this is like <laughs> this is one of mine you know like i'm gonna flood that sensor you know this is like five thousand <laughs> You know, this is the Nightcore HC35. I love this little flashlight. You can have these tiny things, and I'm the security guy, right? So I'm, I'm armed with light yep. mm -hmm. and body armor, and gotta have light. Else. Yep. You brought, yeah. You bring the lights, and I bring lots of lights because I intend to be able to guard these people. You know that these are my my people I'm entrusted with, my my VT, my VIPs. Right. My job is to keep them keep them alive and kicking through this whole entire ridiculous event. And, uh, and I'm 100% sober, by the way, just so we're clear about all of that. Like, yeah, you don't yeah. go in to be people's bodyguard and get high and drunk all the time. Right. Terrible idea. And there's this incredible verse about being sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, right. seeking whom he may devour. But humble yourself, therefore, the, fire, the mighty hand of Elohim. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So anyways, yep. I am I'm going through this club with the guys. And they're, you know, doing all like the meet and greets and all this stuff. And they're trying to introduce me to these different people. And, and the guy, uh, Charles, who's kind of the head of this company and the CEO, is, he's getting connected to all these, these power players. Because it is the real function of a lot of these events, guys, is for social networking. That's all it really is. It's like MLM companies meeting other MLM, like, recruits. And they're like, ah! and it's just this, like, hmm. spider web of information being exchanged. So there's lots of these little meetings. And, and they want privacy. So they're like... We're going to go down to the sub-levels. And I'm like, oh, great. Oh, what could be in the sub-levels of a Catholic church? Oh, Freak man. show nightmares. You know it. Altars and death cults. And I'm like, great. This is not the place I ever like to go because this is like the culture I was raised in with the Jesuits and the Order of the Black Hand. I wrote a book, y'all, called Snatch from the Flames. If any of you are interested, I got an audio book and an e-book on my YouTube channel or in the descriptions. If you go to my YouTube channel, I've got all of that for free in the descriptions if you ever want to watch it or listen to it. But I was raised in this 
underground society, especially in this place called Lake Havasu, Arizona, with, with these people that are embraced this stuff in Catholic Church, like Our Lady of the Lake in, in Lake Havasu, Arizona. And underneath the, the sanctuary floors, you guys, is the real church. It is the gathering halls for people that do secret rituals to try to impart all kinds of opening of portals to be able to imbue the people with powers. It's where they really do their, their magical workings. And so yeah. we go down into the sub-level of the, the church and you're literally underneath the sanctuary. And I am telling you guys, it is everybody's worst nightmare version of like total darkness and depravity. There is a second club underneath there. And in that club, walking around in there are people engaged in X-rated stuff. It yeah. is disgusting and detestable stuff. I feel like I'm Ezekiel who has been clawed through the walls and is seeing inside the house of Elohim in Ezekiel 8 and 9. And I'm seeing the abominations oh. of all the elders and the leaders. You wow. know, it was... Wow. It was awful. But then as I'm standing there, my buddy Charles is talking to a head of a different company. And I look over and, and there is this area that is got a few people gathered in a corner. And one of the guys turns over towards us and his face is the stereotypical reptilian Whoa. embodiment. And I oh, am like man. staring at this guy and I'm looking very intently at him and he's staring at me and I can feel the presence of this being oh. like there there is there is something so cold when you when you embrace the kingdom of darkness and it is it is because there is none of the fire of yah <clears throat> like they, they are so absent they're so disconnected from from authentic humanity from from mankind there's there's they've been given over seared the conscience and they are possessed Ooh, like a total yeah. possession yeah, yeah. and 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 not only that like then it goes down into another level that that gets into this world that most people don't think about they think it's mythological they think it's lore but mm. it's plainly written in the scriptures which is hybridization which is a physical alteration a transformation a transmutation of the being into something other than human mankind yeah, man. and this is what this being was truly wow. someone who had been consuming the blood of these serpents consuming and and altering themselves to become like one of the nahash and this is a, a class of species this is a being that exists in reality and they predominantly operate underneath the physical surface of the earth yeah. and i know this seems so bizarre hollow earth crazy but it's really scripturally nope. reality like nope. there is no, there is another it. world yeah, it's accurate it's another we world these people in that's, <laughs> we don't. dang we gotta talk a lot mm -hmm. this is thrilling y'all I, I i was sitting there staring at this guy and i had to turn over to my buddy and be like do you see him you know because i don't know sometimes some people see between the veil you know what yeah. i mean and i don't know if if this is Yahuwah who has just opened my eyes mm -hmm. to see clearly what's going on. Right. And both of them look over. There's one guy and, and he, okay, so the first guy I asked, he looks over and he's like, yes, the reptilian. And I'm like, he just, what? Yeah. He just casually <laughs> talks about it? Of course, dude, these people, but these people were all into like talking to aliens and inviting oh, them into their dreams. Gosh, like dang. they were getting blueprints and schematics from these beings. Like these, these people were adepts. Do you know what I mean? Like they were, they understood the other realm and they understood second heaven powers like you got to understand in the in the upper echelons of the technology world like it is sorcery it is divination yeah. it is the it is the wizards and the witches that are running the show it is just oh, like time. the anunerbi and the people that were a part of the ubermanch programs in the nazi like these are people that were doing deep occult workings that were yep. channeling these spirits like helena blavatsky and people that were bringing in these other things and they're like open the doors and release them into the earth like this is what we're warned about in isaiah that they're going to start doing this again and you better be careful because they're going to open these doors and serpents are going to start biting people like they're right. going to start infecting the world it says we're literally going to drink the dragons the poison of dragons again like which is literally what we're getting out there. People are getting the poison of dragons. It's the monitor oh. lizard. It's not necessarily the cobra. <laughs> and also in, the I'm in the apocalypse of Elijah and several other extra biblicals, it says in the last days, women will suckle serpents. I don't know if you've read that before, but I, that no. blew my mind. I was like, in uh. the sibling oracles and apocalypse of Elijah and, in, and uh, Baruch, the, I think it's like the Greek apocalypse of Baruch. It says exactly those words and i was just like whoa what is that gonna entail you know it Keep says going. you know i Sorry. think it is in isaiah it says open the gates ye rulers giants rephaim are coming to fulfill my wrath yeah like y'all's gonna literally open the doors 
the rulers, it says the rulers are going to do it, right. right? And these are the people that get beguiled by the by the doctrines of Balaam, yes. right? The kings are always, there's like, it, there's a great, I know I'm not going to totally recommend the movie, but there is a breakdown in this, in the movie 300 that shows you the way the world works, where you have the king who seems to be the king, right? And the king wants to fight back against Xerxes, which is a biblical king named in the scriptures, you guys, because the yeah. Bible is a reliable historical text. Yes. He he has to go. He's the king of he's the king of the Spartans, and he wants to wage a war. So who does he have to go to, right? Well, you have the senators, right? You have like the guys who are like, hey, we're the shot callers of the people, the politicians. Yeah. They're like, well, we're going to tell you. And he's like, they're all like, no, 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 don't bow to the Persian king. Bow to the Persian king. That's our ruling. And he's all like, screw that. So, but he then goes to he. So who does he go to? He goes to the gods. Yeah. He goes to the priest class, right? The priest the oracles, class is the mediators, yeah, oracles, right? And so he literally climbs the mountain. He has to climb to the high point, And then he goes before the priests and he gives them their gold, right? Their blood money, just like Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, right? This is the diviner's fee. It's called the diviner's fee. You pay them. And then he goes over to the vestal virgins, what they were called, people that were possessed with the spirit of Python, the spirit of the serpent yep. right. that you read about in the book of Acts. And there was people that could foretell, right? People that had the ability to see the future. This is what serpents can do. The serpent has the ability to see the future. And this is like a real, real thing that you read about Yeshua when he's contending with the devil. The devil's showing him all the future kingdoms of the earth in a moment of time. He's showing him the future. They are the timekeepers. So whenever you want to track the dragon, track where the time zones have been. Like go to Greenwich at the time when they established Greenwich as the time central capital. Now it's in Boulder, Colorado at a place called the Nest. It's no literally way. the dragon's nest. That's, yeah, it's the atomic where... clock. It's a... I, it's I a know real Boulder place. Very well. Oh my gosh. I National Institutes of Science and Technology. They have the cesium atomic clock that sets all the time to the Earth, from your little smartwatch to the nuclear submarines that are full of the trident, like, like Poseidon's tridents that are at the depths of the Earth. Like they are literally what control everything. And so that's anytime you you want to know where the dragon is, he goes and makes his throne wherever the timekeeper is, because that's who he is. Yeah, that's his nature. So that's one of his thrones is literally right there in Boulder, Colorado. Wow. And that explains this is. A lot. <laughs> right. You got it. And that is where they broadcast the signal to the entire Earth. So that's his communications platform. People, it's like you can literally knock down those antennae. You can destroy those things and you can shut down their comm systems. Tuck that away in case you ever want to get zealous and braid a whip. You know, <laughs> it's like this is this is the way that you can contend with this stuff. But these these serpents literally would possess these women virgins and they portray it as like, a you know, a, a woman. But these are children. These are children that get possessed by this stuff and they are in this this serpent cult and they are the ones who tell the fortune and they're like no you know the but the priest could be the interpreter who could lie and be like right. don't go to war with them because the politicians paid him too right this is the love of money the root of all kinds of evil and so xerxes is going to get his showdown with the kings of spartan because he's defies the gods right this is this whole ideology and he's like i'm gonna go fight anyways and that that is a textbook example of the realities of how this system truly operates. The corporations uphold the kings. They give them power through money. And the kings hold on to their power through the priest class. And it's still the reality. So above the real governors of our society still are the priests and the priestesses. And no matter what, it's, it's never going to change. It will always be this way because it's the established order that is in, built into the creation. You need the messengers and the ambassadors of the mighty ones to be the representatives of them, they're physical agents on their earth, and they're the ones who dictate these things. And so those groups that I was a part of were embracing that communications network. They were embracing, this is where you go to get these communications. And so I was there as this total freak show, other outsider kind of person, because I was contending against that stuff and trying to get these free, having them renounce their, their oaths and Freemasonry and the sins of their fathers and trying to break off these curses because they were plagued at yeah. night. They were experiencing the terror of the night. Lilith is what you read in Psalm 9 one who used to come and snatch babies kill babies yeah. like the literal nightmares these evil spirits that would come at night like psalms 91 is a spiritual warfare thing and if you yes. read it in the hebrew you find out about the names of these entities and who you're actually battling with and these yeah. guys were getting tormented and so i was there trying to help them get free from this and at the same time i'm going down there and there's reptilian walking around talking to people giving out his call shots to the the kings of the merchants of the corporations you know and this is how the world actually operates. It's just veiled from people who are not in the club, from yeah. people who have not been willing to, to reach through the shroud and embrace total darkness. Yeah. But once you do, it's like, veils off, come on in. We'll show you how this world, this thing really works. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. There, there, there's, a, there's a couple comments that talks about how um, they say that, they, that the uh, 
reptilians do not have the ability to see the future. Um, a couple people have, have commented on that. You want to expand? I, I was talking it? about more the serpents themselves. Like I, the, I believe, like yeah. they would be the fallen seraphim. Yes. We were actually oh, yeah. talking yeah, about. Like in, well, in yeah, the angels do have. They, yeah, they're, some of them they're the ones I'm talking about. I'm, I'm saying the reptilians are more like their shot callers on this earth. They're the physical yeah. side of that. The, yeah. You know. You're yeah. saying you've got experience out there. Could you please, please rock my world? I would well, love to hear the, the history of what you guys have experienced. Well, you tell about what you experienced <laughs> Mal. Okay, you know, yeah. Mal, Maui's been in the news a lot lately, right? Yeah, he's, we fires. were just talking about okay, that earlier, so yeah. Isaac never went to Maui until about two years ago. And Isaac, Isaac can see quite a bit. Yeah, I have visions and dreams. So um, when we went there the first time, I slept the first night. And my first dream was about reptilians. He woke up. He's like, "Mama, how could I? How come I just had a dream about lizard people?" And I was like, oh, "Okay, let's talk about that because there's a ton yep. of elite that the elite are pretty much own Maui, like between yes. Oprah, Jeff Bezos, um, Bill Gates, Larry Ellison, all of the top tech giants, and everybody. They're focused on Maui right now because they own a ton of land there." And they want to make the entire island a smart island as like their first yeah. endeavor. So yeah. that was the reason for the fires. But um, you, sh you probably know about that. But, um, but yeah, no, we've encountered, and I, had, I lived on Maui. That was my first teaching job in like 1990. So even back then, they were like moving in. And just because Hawaii, like even if you're out and, out and about in Hawaii, you're going to encounter celebrities because they're just all over the place here. So one of the... Um, one of the first times that I realized the reptilian aspect with the, the eyes thing, and, and they didn't shapeshift like in, totally in front of me, but the eyes did, was at a former church that Isaac and I used to go to. It was a huge oh. mega church, and we didn't realize the evil that was going on behind it until, and, and this is way back, this is like 2010 before we came out of all of that. But I, was, I went on an Easter Sunday to, uh, they had a beach service, and it was like thousands of people there. And I always sat, like, I made a point to sit right in the front row so I wasn't distracted or anything. And I sit down, I look to my right, and the, the Ramses are sitting right next to me, like, from Boulder, Colorado. Like, wow. John and Patsy Ramsey, I was sitting right next to them. Oh my so gosh. I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, I wasn't aware of all this back then. So I was like, oh, just making conversation. And there was just flat, fl Patsy Ramsey's face was flat, huge blue eyes, shape-shifted in front of me with the reptilian thing. And I was just like... Whoa! And I'm, the, for my first thought is, wait a minute, why are they at my church? <laughs> for one thing, and then the pastor is recognizing them, having them stand up, and I look down, and John's got the big, the free, ring. big Freemasonry ring on, and I'm thinking, what in the world are they doing here and in the front row and being recognized? And that was my last time at that church. I was just like, Dang. something is up here with this church, and why are they recognizing these Satanists? You know? And then Patsy Ramsey, no, no affect at all. I'm asking her questions. She's just like a zombie, just staring at me with the shape shift back and forth at the eye thing. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is so creepy. I'm just praying. And I was like, dear God, please help me. Please, please get me out of here. Oh so I made gosh. it through the rest of the service and left. And I was just freaked out. I was just said, okay, I'm not going back there. But, you know, I've, I've encountered others. I mean, tons of other celebrities. Could, could I just ask, could I, could I? Tell something about John Benet Ramsey. Real, yeah, that's who you're referencing, right? The yes. Ramsey's from. Yeah. Okay, just so I, I work in Boulder, Colorado at this place called Aim House, which is right on the hill in Boulder. And I had to drive past the house where, for those of you that don't know, there's, she's talking about a case from the 1990s where a, a little girl, John Benet Ramsey, who was like basically a, a sex object yes. for these people who was made into this, you know, modeling girl, little modeling girl yes. who was dressed yeah. up and paraded around and passed around these circles in Boulder, Colorado and all over the country for these little, you know, dress up parades where they, they sexualize little girls and then they go ahead and have ratings on them and evaluations on them. Anyways, it's a, yeah. it was a, you know, on Christmas morning, they have this horrible discovery of this child that's been killed and butchered and, and, very graphic detail and it's designed as like a this is how they do these shock and trauma rituals to people on days yeah. where they're gathered together you know and people yes. are very vulnerable oh yeah and they, they, want, they, they believe bring, everything they bring they bring her out but i learned some evidence i learned about that case in more detail because i was working at this house where a lot of the people this is like the history of this community is deeply embedded there and during that during that investigation when the police officers came into the house the first thing they did, the first thing they did was bring her body up and lay it in front of the Christmas tree. 
Oh. They lay her in front of the, I kid you not. They lay her in front of the Christmas tree. With, this is the detective. Like, this is totally breaking all of the rules of, like, investigative yeah. science, right? Like, they come in and lay her in front of the Christmas tree, and they gather around her and do prayers over her, over her body, before they release all of this to the public. Like, it is so unbelievably strategic darkness that is brought out of there and that is that spiritual working that is brought forth to then impart this unleashing unto the people all around like it is how deep is that darkness do you know oh, what i mean yeah. it is inutterably deep so i didn't mean to interrupt you but i wanted to just put that in there for no, those of you that good. don't know no, you can look up this is public information case on john benet ramsey and the investigation that went behind it and, and these the, people were active yeah. players in the darkest of darks and another really twisted component of it is because there's such high-level Satanists that one of the ways that Satanists roll that I've been figuring out along the way is, and it even they even tell us right there in John Benet's name, because you know Benet, Benet Elohim, right? The sons of God, right? Oh. And so John Benet is actually a little boy dressed like a girl. And it, that's even like a deeper, horrible twist to yeah, the whole thing. Had, they, they, their children have to pass through the fire, right? Yeah, so. they pass through the fire of Molech. And oh. so that, that's what happens like during, um, during their, their, one of their horrible rituals. But that was, that oh was just gosh. one. I mean, there's been so many other celebrities that I've encountered just here in Hawaii. They're like, um, I don't know if you've heard of Kelly Slater. He's a, kind of a famous yes. surfer. Um, one of my friends supposedly dated this person and... and we used to kind of party when, when I was into the world stuff, like maybe 25 years ago or stuff. Um, I, I used to hang out at the North Shore in Hawaii a lot. That's where Kelly Slater's grounds are, Jack Johnson. Um, a lot of the other celebrities would hang out with all of them, the whole surfer, surfer culture. A um, lot of Satanist, Satanism going on there and just really dark. And th th they have the same eyes, though. I remember seeing, like... I would meet these people, look in their eyes, it's exactly the same. They're bright blue, and then they always would switch back and forth. It was like they'd squint to kind of try to hide it, but you could see it. Yeah. And it just felt really dark whenever I'd meet any of these other celebrities. It was just like, wow, what am I doing here? Why am I hanging out with these people? <laughs> so I'm just grateful that, that the Most High brought me out of that. Um, mm. there, it's, just, it's very rampant here in the state. Mm. And there's a reason why all of like the elite own property here too. Like even on the island we yeah. live on here, but the majority is on Maui, which is crazy. Mm. Cause that's, that's, I think that's like now considered like a ground zero for all of the events that have happened in the past month there. And it should be interesting to see what develops out of all of that too, because you yeah. know, that's a great Holocaust. Be... Oh yeah. It's a, that's what a, it's called a burnt sacrifice. The word is a Holocaust. Yeah. You know, that is that is literally what they do in order to imbue this phoenix <laughs> rising from the ashes, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the hometown that I grew up in, um, mm. middle of the island, we have 13 military bases, very large, here on Oahu. And the majority of the military base is underground. And this is kind of a known thing for people that live in Hawaii, you know, like, you don't really see too much above ground except, like, the, the barracks, the base housing. But all the, all like the, the top secret stuff, it's all like underground. Like, you know, Edward Snowden, that's, that whole incident that happened with him was here, like just five minutes away from where I, I grew up um, at Helamano Military Reservation. I was there, I knew some people that lived on that base, and so I was up there when they were digging the underground base. So I, like, I, it was like people that live here know. Oh. Um, the mountains here are all hollow. They have like uh, they, some of the largest deep underground military bases right below here in the islands and um it's just uh, the 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 level of human trafficking in the town that i grew up in um i was a school counselor there and also a social worker so i worked with a lot of children whose parents would choose it seemed like they would call them like the cash cow of the family and so like they would choose one of their many children that they'd have in polynesian families and they would it would usually be a boy and that boy would be, kind of be like like trained to to be like a woman of the night. So starting around age 12, 13, they would dress up in women's clothes, walk around at, on Friday, Saturday night, and the, the high-level military would come driving by and they'd buy them. This is all before internet and everything, like in the 80s and 90s. And um, so I think a lot of it's done online now. But then I would drive around Friday, Saturday night, my hometown, which is only like 30,000 people in the middle of the island, and I would try to talk to my, these were like kids that I worked with during the week at school. And I would try to talk to them and be like, what are you guys doing? That they're just like stoned out of their mind and really and high and drunk and 
whatever it was to just like numb themselves because they knew it was yeah. coming that the military the high level military officers and all the higher ups would come and purchase them and then I wouldn't see them for a while and then they wouldn't really remember what was going on when I talked to them at school like a couple weeks later so yeah. it's just really really dark what's going on here and a lot of people are not aware of it they look at Hawaii like this beautiful tourist place to vacation and have fun at the beach and everything but a lot of it is going on right here, and I think that's why um, they chose here to be like that ground zero event that happened about a month ago. So it's just, wow. it's really sad, but because it's such a beautiful place, just like, like Boulder. My, in fact, my mom yes. is from Boulder. Yeah. She was a pastor's wow. daughter raised in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> and so wow. I, we have property there. I mean, we go back there on a regular basis, and the first time we brought Isaac, when he was an adult several years ago, he could like feel like the darkness when we're driving through the city. He's like, I don't like this. Something is off with this town. I hate boulders. <laughs> it's weird. I used to even do, like in college, I used to even go there. I, I went to college in the mainland, and I would go to Boulder just for the, they had this thing in Halloween called a mall crawl, where everybody would dress up. Have oh, you yeah. heard of that one? They would walk through On the mall. Pearl Street, yep. Thousands Pearl Street of mall. people, all satanic rituals. Yep. I was part of that. I, I didn't even know what I was doing. I was just thought it was like a fun party town, and it's not. It's, there's there's no, a lot of darkness going on there. They had they had operating in Boulder, Colorado. If you wanted to get a late term abortion, the, the preeminent late term abortionist in the entire United States was located in Boulder, Colorado. You could get a post birth abortion. Yes. Committed there in Boulder, Colorado. Remember they were holding the like, signs for that when we were there. Well, two no, years ago. this was like preeminent. They're they're preeminent a cold worker. You know what I'm saying? Somebody that you could come in and sacrifice your baby openly there, legally there, under this little protected act. And so this, this, th that kind of behavior is what draws a great many people to. I did a post about Russ Dizdar and expo he has a class that's called uh, Satanism 101 on his website there, shadowofthedarkness.net. And I posted this on Facebook as, as like a public message. And a, a Satanist, like an open Satanist, and I'm talking like a diehard, dedicated, real deal, like Satanist, Logness guy, posted wow. on there, you know, like I am, I am one of the black sons, you know, sons of Satan and all this stuff. And I went to his page and I mean, he is an all in committed individual. And like, I just got to say this right now, because I think people like when they hear stories like what you just talked about, about like the, the Nightwalker boys and these little sex, these sex toys of the elite. They, they picture something very different in their mind because they've been conditioned to not look at radical intelligent evil in the face. Like they, they, they want to not know about it. They want yeah, to shove their heads back know, in the yeah. sands of ignorant and be like, it's a lot more comfortable down here to suck sand into our mouths and then not even think about the lion that's coming and tearing us apart, you know? Yep. Like it, it is that level of, this is why I despised, utterly despised churchianity for so oh, long. Me too. Oh, me too. They would that. not look at evil in the face and deal with it. Yep. And like I went to this guy's page and I was looking through, you know, his posts and it's a lot of R-rated and X-rated, like grotesque, like blaspheming of the spirits, the holding up this, the, the lance that pierced the side of a guy dressed up as Yeshua and he's going to run him through and saying, I can't wait for the son of the son of God to come back so I can kill him, you know, like great, super motivated, dedicated talk. And he's got jars and brains and, <laughs> and fetuses, babies, you know, wow. like in there and like, like preparing Barbara for Bush the rituals. Gross fetus that she Ooh, oh. yeah, just gross. Oh, that's awful. This is, but this is but this is how the world works, you know. And it's like most people won't even look at it, and they get scared of this guy. And I was telling Chelsea tonight, as I was looking at this, I'm like, this is a dedicated person, you know. Like these are the extremists, these are the zealots, mm -hmm. you know. These are the zealots, and they may be for the kingdom of darkness, but you know what? These people are so willing to be all in for what they believe. Like these are people of true convictions, and this is what the Father says when he's like. I, Yeshua literally says, I would rather you be hot or cold, like be all in for the kingdom of darkness. We're all in for the kingdom of light. But don't you dare think there's a kingdom of grace somewhere in the middle. Like there is nowhere in between. And so if you're going to be in, be all in. Oh, it's like yeah. when I see somebody that's like that, I'm like, at least they're overt about it. Uh, the greatest evil is people who masquerade in sheep's clothing <laughs> after they're devouring the flock and acting like, the hypocrites. You know, this is why Yeshua literally is like, people are like, he said, forgive your enemies. I'm like, he cursed the Pharisees over and over and over again. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear him one time say, forgive these guys. Yeah. Right, like, right. he literally calls yeah. them, you brood right. of vipers. 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 Yeah. Where are they the, hiding? Where do the they hide? Line. Where did Satan come? 
Where did the dragon come? Right when the, the, he's like the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh, fire falling down. Immediately the serpent comes into Ananias and Sapphira. Like, immediately comes into the church. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the first place he goes, and it's like Peter's like, death. Boom, death. Boom. Like, I'm sorry, how did he forgive those people? You know yeah, what I'm saying? The, the, the like, ironic thing we have this too. misrepresentation of forgive them. I'm like, recruit that guy. That's yeah. my mission for now is to seek that guy's soul because I want that guy's all in zealousness for the kingdom of righteousness. Like, I want that guy to be all on our side. You know what I'm saying? Because if he did, he would be ferocious, ferocious, relentless, persistent, willing to sacrifice his time, his energy, his efforts, his resources to advance the kingdom of righteousness like nobody else. You know, but I... I I groan when I hear stories like that because I went back to Lake Havasu, Arizona in the London Bridge and Tom Dunn and I were filming down there and literally we had one of those boys, those, those dressed up like a little guy come and, and literally come to Tom and I and make advances towards us as we were trying to come out of the little bathroom there late at night. Oh, Children, man. propositioning yeah. men to have sex with them. Like this is the real world. Most, most believers leave after 11 p.m. I started doing street ministry on Pearl Street mm. and I would go and ask homeless people, where are all the Christians? They're like, they leave at 11 o'clock. Wow. And I was like, why? They're like, because it gets scary. Well, you know what's like, ironic, Man. too? In my hometown, on, on this island that I was just describing, there is one street called California Avenue, and that has the most churches per square, per capita, of any other place on this island. I think that there's like 35 churches on a stretch of like four miles on this oh one gosh. street. And it's like all the churches close early. They don't do street ministry. They close their doors. The people that go in and out are like whitewashed. They they don't they don't do and it's only like a walking distance from where all these children are at selling themselves and it's so disgusting. It was like I tried to go to different churches there and they're all like that what you just described, the lukewarm. They were just they're they're, they're not all in. They're just there yeah. to say, Okay, here we are at church, okay, now we're going to heaven. You know, it, it, they weren't there to, for for the people that were in that very community and it was so small. It's like everybody knew about it. But they yeah. just went on with church like nothing was wrong. You know, we're in our little safe place here and we don't and want to deal with that. And money laundering operation, you know, this is where you got to funnel the money through. They're like, you got to use non and nonprofits, NGOs, and you got to launder that money, y'all, somewhere. Yep, oh, somebody's yeah. got to clean like, it, right? So. Someone's got to clean it and they got the good cleaners in there. They're like, we got real good accounts for you guys. If you want to go to the next level with your little business here, your church, whatever you want to call it. Like, you're going to have to go ahead and let our accountants in. 501c3s. Like, yeah. so, can you like, really trust okay. the 501c3? No. Yeah, we yeah. just can't. I mean, we were heavily involved in it. I mean, I was most of my life. Mm. I was raised as a pastor's daughter, you know. So yes. I, I was in that whole whitewash thing. And then Noble was a 501c3 pastor for a bit. And we just got out. And we're just so grateful that the Most High <laughs> revealed all the truth to us. So we don't have to, like, feel like we have to depend on that anymore, you know. We depend on Him. Hallelujah. That's right. Yeah. He, he knows your needs. You go to him in secret and you ask him in secret, you know, and he's like, he'll answer you publicly. You know, it's, it's such, it is so much more of an effective model because it keeps you on guard from being a merchandiser of people. Yes. You know, yes. like if you, yes. if you go out and you're always telling people, I'm, we need this for this project and no. we need this for this yeah. and we need this for this, uh. you, you run the risk of becoming dependent on your contributor and on your contributors, you know, and it's like, it's hard to not. It's hard to not be influenced by the person who puts the heaviest check in the plate. Yeah, you know, it's really hard to not like the Chelsea was just reading a verse to me in Deuteronomy. That's like it don't accept a bribe because it blinds justice. Like he, when he's setting up judges over the people, he's like, don't you accept bribes? Like don't accept gifts. Like even in Proverbs, you're warned about this. Like when you start accepting this stuff from people, like it blinds your eyes. You start making God. bad judgment calls and God's going to judge you. For yep. That. Yes, sir. Oh, but that's because they did this. Well, yeah, good luck trying to, to, to justify that when you're before the throne. Jeez. Yeah. Money, is just, money is just trying to buy control, you know, yeah. and people, some people want to control other people. And that's the sad thing about it, you know. So um, be wise, you know, understand that those people that are flaunting their money have ulterior motives involved. And it's never a, a, a safe bet to invite them in or to accept their money. Unless they're, unless they have no strings attached. Yes. Yeah. There are no contracts, no signing of That's anything, right. no mutual reciprocity. Yeah. That's like one of those very important little hallmarks to it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's why the Abba likes to, um, when he describes himself as a father, and he says, "What kind of father would give his son, you know, 
a rock when he asks for bread. I feel like that's mm-hmm. him saying, hey, if you ask me, I will take care of you. Like, you don't have yeah. to rely on anybody else. Like, <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if Isaac mentioned anything to you, Nathan. Um, we missed you at the conference. We were looking forward to yeah, meeting you at the Sacred Rib Publishing. But we went, we oh. just started diving right into it. Like, I barely even introduced him. Yeah. <laughs> we're excited to have you on our show. I didn't know yeah. we were technically live immediately. Yeah, so I apologize because we were, we were already live. So I was kind of just talking to our group and just like waiting for you to show up. So Waiting for us to fly in from the mainland. Yeah, so. I'm glad you guys came. This, is, this has been incredible and I'm so pumped up and I would love to hear more of what even got you out, like, what was your hook in the jaw moments? You know, if I could, what, and will you tell me, remind me of your names. I know you're Isaac. Yeah. Remind me of your name. Lisa. Lisa. And this is Noble. Noble. Wow. Yeah. We're the Georges. (laughs) Georges. You guys are salty. I am so pumped to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. You are too. Are you kidding? We're we're on the same wavelength. You know, our frequencies are tuned in. You're on fire, yo. The same What? What? so no, Isaac, but what? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. No, okay, you go. I just, just want to know what was the hook in your jaw moment that got you out of the kingdom of compromise and cowardice. It was. A, it was there was a. There was a, several layers. Yeah, um, to it. I was a social worker before, and actually a CPS worker. That was like one of my worst jobs. But um, when I was a social worker, I would place foster children in foster homes. So I decided to become a foster parent myself because. Um, I realized that a lot of the foster parents would be tired of the children and they say, just come and get this kid and take them to the, the, to social services. We can't deal with them anymore. We want them out now, you know? And then I would be like, what? And I want to take them home to my house. So I had to get certified as a foster parent. And so um, I lived in Vegas mm-hmm. for about 10 months. And that's when I met this guy when he was six years old, he was in the system. He was in, we were his 10th foster home. Um, wow. at age six, he was in, I wrote a book about him. I just published it and I was promoting it at Sacred Rib Publishing to just oh hear about God. his life. Cause that was one of the steps in my life that would just, that just really caused me to be able to draw very close to the most high because of dealing with him and all his issues. Um, he was in a, in a, um, in a children's psych ward when I first met him and he was suicidal. He was six years old and just just felt rejected by everybody because everyone would the foster parents would be tired of him they'd call to have him moved and he would he would bounce around so many times by the time he was six and so we know the most i had his hands on him though because he he wasn't dead like he he was supposed to be he wasn't even supposed to be born alive because of the amount of drugs and alcohol and everything in in his mother's system Mm. and so i just felt like i mean it was like god was telling me you need to help this child especially so I was kind of thinking about, you know, maybe I should adopt and he was adoptable. I mean, he was he was available for adoption. Um, he was deemed unadoptable, though, because of a lot of behaviors that have been going on. And um, just just seeing the, just seeing God's work in his life. It was that was just such a huge testimony for me. And then um, so this was even before I met Noble when I was with, I had Isaac <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I moved back to Hawaii and was raising Isaac here as a single parent and um met noble and a lot of things other things happened but at one point isaac um had an accident at the beach when he was 16 years old he dove into the water at the beach and he was a quadriplegic the doctor said he's never going to walk again his neck was he, he's yeah. missing a piece of spine <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um and then within just a few months uh, he started moving and, it, and the doctors are just shocked. Like, what is Two weeks on? I started moving. Within two months, I was walking with assistance. Oh. So. so he's what, and, and we talked to Zen. It's the same piece of spine that is injured in Zen. So wow. Isaac should not be doing anything, any of this. And so Zen was actually encouraging me because I had all these notes written down about his life and how I met him. And Zen was like, write a book. Just put yeah. all that in a book. We need to hear this. Write <laughs> so a book I, is I, right. Damn. Yeah. So I published his book. It's called A New Creation because not only was he renewed physically but he was renewed spiritually and we got to experience all that with him and a lot of it's just happened within the past three years Uh, i would say a little longer um ever since uh bible college okay yeah so um so that same church that i saw the ramses at (laughs) i I grew up in yeah and so like how you mentioned what was that moment where you know you you were no longer essentially a lukewarm person I had that encounter when I was going to Bible college and um, I was doing a bit of studying. I'd always wanted to do it. 
And while I was there, I got to see firsthand the social corruption, corruption, and not just the um, the leadership and what they really did on like a day to day basis. All behind the scenes, yeah. Because he was a part. He was I was in an internship. Of the yeah, so <laughs> I was in an internship to be a part of the leadership, and so I had saw, I started seeing all of this, and during that time, it was it was humorous because they would have worship service on Tuesday mornings for their meetings. And, and Abba would take me and put me in a separate area of, from all of these people. And I would be worshiping essentially by myself. And so I started catching these weird moments. And I was just like, why am I doing this? Like I would have moments of pure conviction, like pure, like repentance. And then I would look in the room and everybody's face was just stone cold. And I was just like, what is going on here? And so he opened my eyes to that. And then he started slowly showing me that not only was there is there's no lack of desire for him. It was there was no there was no desire for um forgiveness either. Mm. So what had happened was I was like one of the rules to like live into the dorms or go to the school was you're not allowed to you know smoke marijuana. Mm -hmm. I ended up doing it. But I had a moment of conviction. So I, I addressed it before my youth pastor. And I was like, hey, I grew up with this guy. And so I told him, I was like, hey, I've been doing this. I still want to still go to the school, but I just want to repent of this. And, you know, I did it in secret so that, you know, I could, you know, be repented of it. And one thing led to another. And the the um, board got a hold of me and they said, oh, we found out that you were doing this. Um, but we're going to give you a chance, but you have to sign this document to yeah. say that, you know, like where you're going to stay committed to this and you're going to meet with your um, youth leader once a week to make sure that. And I was like, I sat there and I looked at this lady and I was like, where's the forgiveness in that? Mm -hmm. And it made no sense to me. And then Yeshua was just like it in that moment, he was like, go out, get out you need to get out. And I was just like, what, like, what, what is going on? And so, um, it was a little confusing for them at the time because you know, this was all I ever wanted to do. And this was something that really influenced them because they're like, yes, our son is, you know, <laughs> learning the word, you know, but it was just not the place that he wanted me to be at. And, yeah. and I recognized that everything that I would have learned from them I would have corrupted what I have learned from the father. Yeah. That's complete pure, pure corruption of it. Yeah. And I, I, I am so thankful because he's shown me the purity of the gospel mm -hmm. while renewing my mind at the same time of mm -hmm. everything that I grew up learning, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was my light bulb moment, I guess you could say, where he, Abba, literally he spoke to me and gave me dreams and visions and like, mm -hmm. One of the biggest kickers, this is the biggest vision that I had. I tell this to everybody, so that I think it's important that you should know. I I was in the dorms, and I was having a moment with Abba, and he said, and he, and he took me down to Sheol, literally took me down in the spirit to Sheol, and I was in that place. And he said, imagine if you ended up here, and you thought your entire life you were following me. Imagine living in eternity in hell, in Sheol, thinking that you had done the right thing. Mm. And I felt it like I felt that 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 pressure, that that conviction, that that full on just like embrace moment of like, holy crap, <laughs> you know, like I'm stuck here forever. And and I had that moment and I was talking to my roommate at the time and I was like, can you imagine, like, imagine that? Like I was blowing my mind. And then he just looked at me like, I don't get it. Yeah. And yeah. that was the moment where I was like, I need to get out of here. Yeah. And then that, that's yes. where uh, the, uh, Yahweh was just like, this is what I have planned for you. Mm. Not this, but this, you will not be the one that thinks that he's doing it right by your own merit. I will make you righteous. Yes. And then he pulled me out of it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So that was my light bulb moment. <laughs> that was a good question, wow. Nathan. Thank you. Yeah. I wasn't want to sure. Hear Noble too. Come on. 
Okay. Well, Sarah, I would love to hear. I would love to hear your sort of testimony. What was, what what is it? What is it that that drew you out from a comfortable Christianity version of life? What got you to where you are today, Noble? Pivotal moment. Um, when when I was a baby Christian, I was so on fire. I mean. When I realized that he died for me, every time I'd read the word, I'd cry. At work, I worked at the, my dad's gas station. I'd be pumping gas for cars coming in, and my eyes were all swollen and, and red. And Tell me how old you were when and, you became a believer. I, I was 30 years old, too, so I wasn't a young spring chicken. Uh, <laughs> so against the odds, but uh, yeah, I came to know the Lord. And, and for the first two years, uh, a friend of mine brought me to his church, um, and the I would ask the pastor question after question after question because I was growing. I was I wanted to learn everything. After two years, he says, Noble, you're burning me out. But why don't you go to the local Bible college and maybe you can get some answers there? You know, <laughs> at least he was honest with me. So I, I looked it up, found it, enrolled. And then the first class, first two classes I thought took was a theology course and Greek. My counsel, my advisor says, I wouldn't recommend taking a language course right away. I said, no, I want Greek because I want to read God's word in the original language. Hallelujah. So I'm not going to be having the the wool pull over my eyes when I'm reading it in English because the English is, for the most part, is good. Limited. It's so, much, it's so much deeper in the original language. Yes. So you cannot beat it. And so my, my desire to want to know him just started from that point and started growing. You know, got all these credits under my belt, and he said, "You're going to graduate." Oh, does that mean I have to stop learning? So, no, you can keep take more classes. Sure thing. <laughs> okay, bet. good. You can pay yeah. us more at any time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you bet. Two hundred something dollars a credit hour. <laughs> it, it have wasn't... at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I just kept paying. I kept learning, and and went from one Bible college to another seminary to another seminary. Got a bunch of like Lisa would say, paper degrees, which really means nothing to me. But uh, he has I, more degrees than a thermometer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know why? I, I'm actually learning more now after seminary because they only teach you the bare bones. What they're instructed to teach you. I mean, seminaries today are not teaching you all the good stuff. Just the 66. Now, not to say that 60, the 66 books in the Bible are bad. But there are so much more writings out there, and you know, it, enhance, it helps you understand the sixty-six more yeah. when you read the outside books there's that we've. There's already... a lot of historical context that's lacking, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll they'll let you read the all kinds of other commentaries and all kinds of other men's speculative <laughs> opinions on the word, but they're like, <laughs> don't you dare! Like I remember people looking at me and telling me I was I was dangerously close to heresy if I read any of those books. And I'm like. <laughs> oh. You yep. all tell me I can read a Dave Ramsey book in this church? They're like, <laughs> sit down and read yeah. Dave Ramsey. I'm like, what the heck are you guys talking about? Like, this seems I kind of hypocritical. My... You know, this is the leaven of the Pharisees. Y'all sitting here being like, you can't read that book. I'm like, I'm finding quotes in here from the scriptures, y'all. Like, I'm telling you, I'm reading the book of Jude, and it says the same thing here. Like, this came from his mouth. Like, yeah. This is like yeah. serious stuff here. And you're telling me like there's a historical train of evidence to understand. Like I can go through textual. I started studying at the same time, something called apologetics, right? With Dr. William Lane Craig, who is a savage oh. wordsmith, you know, oh. like the bro could oh, yeah. lay out the sword and contend eagerly for the faith. Photographic and, memory. I mean, no joke, man. He had near yeah. enough an eidetic memory and he was a gifted communicator. Right. And he had this great gift of rhetoric. He knew how to wield the sword of his lips very effectively. Oh, yeah. And he and yeah. I started studying when I was at University of Colorado at Boulder because I oh, say yeah. I like Noble, I resonate so much with with a, an aspect of what you described, which is the insatiable need to know that like mm -hmm. just deep seated yes. hunger that you're like, it's never satisfied. I just want to know. And that yeah. that launched me down into textual criticism, which is people who are like the geekiest of geeks in the level of their willingness to sit down and read 
unbelievable amounts of the same thing over and over and over and over and over again and look for the most minute failures of consistency among texts. They look at all the physical historical texts and read them and compare any times there's differentiation between them. And then they annotate, they note it, and then they yep. text check whether is it a scribal, is this a scribal error? Is this a misspelling? Is this a mistranslation? Is this- What church family does it come from? Uh, the apparatus is the apparatus is so powerful, but you know you got to know the language. You have to know the original language to really get into the textual criticism and to understand how to use the apparatus because it gives you so many variants. I mean, yes. John three sixteen could have about four different variants that changes uh, how it's read, but it doesn't change the meaning. Correct. You know what I'm saying? So again, but I can't say that about all verses. Some yeah. some some of them do change the meaning. Some of the the Masoretic text, for example, yeah. is is it's okay. It's good for the most part. The 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 the, the uh, Pharisees use it. The, um, <laughs> you know, but red flag. You got Dead Sea Scrolls. You, you got the Septuagint. Yeah, you, know, you get all these other uh, resources to again uh, help you understand what was actually being said and how it was being spoken to the people. So again, it's just so many things. To, so I'm I'm still a student. You know, even though, yeah. yeah, even though I've got all this paper behind me and letters and alphabets, it doesn't ma matter. We're all students of God's word because why? If we love him, we're going to continue growing in him, learning about him. And that is the fire that's behind me. And that's what I'm, that's why we're doing this class. So we can get more people to be on fire and they can learn more stuff about it. So that's, uh, yeah, that's my story. No, well, <laughs> that, that was awesome. That is, I could talk to you all. I could talk to you, all of you all day long. This is amazing. Good. You are, you guys are a rare people. I'll just tell you, you guys are part of that. Okay. Can I show you something that's got your name in it? Hold on. This is good. Yeah. I've never <laughs> met another noble. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> this, this guy, this guy, John, I love, I'm, I'm like a treasure guy, right? This like this word in Hebrew called segula, segula, like precious treasure. Like Ooh. Hezekiah, when Nebuchadnezzar's ambassadors come, they're like, hey, we heard you're going to die. And he's like, you want to see my segula? Let me show you my stuff. <laughs> they're all like, what the heck? Like I Isaiah don't. literally just prayed and interceded for you. And is like, you're going to die. And he's all like, set his face to the wall. And he's like, ah, 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 ah. Yeah, how stupid baby. of Hezekiah, right? <laughs> like, and then he turns around. Y'all literally heals him. He's like, hey, here's medicine called fig chunks. And they're like, we're going to heal you. And he's like, you betcha. Yay. Hallelujah. He's going to extend my life. And then he's <laughs> like, the Nebuchadnezzar sends his ambassadors. He's like, go, 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 go give a good word to you know, the guy who's dying because maybe, you know, and like he lets him in and it says he showed him everything, every treasure he had, everything he yeah. had, including what kings, only kings have, which is called yep. Segula. And it is their most guarded, most precious treasure chest, right? The stuff that's like, where was the sword of Goliath kept? Like this is David Segula was the sword of Goliath. How savage is that? Yeah. His most precious treasures that he kept was the head of Goliath. And the sword of Goliath. And I love that. That is so, yeah. that's so a warrior, bro. That is like a dude who's so deadly in combat. He's like, I'm going to keep that guy's killing tool. Cause don't you ever forget that I killed this giant. Don't you yep. ever doubt it. Right. But he gave him to who, where was the Segula that he entrusted it to Yahuwah? I literally think he wrapped it in a linen ephod and that was his offering, you know, to Yahuwah is he's like, you know what? I give you my greatest treasure. And if you ever want me to bear it up, you give you let me know and I'll pick up that sword again. But until then, yeah, you've got my sword. You know, like he gave his segula there, but Hezekiah instead invites the ambassadors of Nebuchadnezzar in and shows him everything, his most right. precious treasure. And then the right. prophet Isaiah is like, Hey, what'd you show them? And he's all like, Everything, obviously, everything. <laughs> and he's like, They're gonna take everything you showed them. And he's like, Well, he's like, But Yahoo's gonna have mercy on you. And it's not going to happen in your life. He's like, well, hey, there's like, but it's going to happen in your sons. He's like, eh, the word of Yahuwah is good. He doesn't like fall on his face and repent and weep again. He's just like, eh, at least it's not my life. That's one of those conundrums <laughs> to me in the scriptures that I think I'm losing something in translation there, like desperately losing something right there. But this is a piece of my segula. This is called noble serpentine. This is noble, oh, no noble, wow. noble serpentine. And this, cool. I'm like, 
I got obsessed. I love crazy radioactive rocks. Okay. I'm just going to give you a total <laughs> honest, honest thing. Like I love, like I was showing your, I was showing Isaac earlier, like this is a meteorite that I want right. to turn into a dragon slaying sword. And nice. like, these are, these are some of my Sego laws. I drove thousands of miles to go get this one. Wow. Like, this, this one is, is noble serpentine. And this guy, John, Josh sent this to me. He's in Washington. There's a mine up there in Washington where the, there's just mountains of this. Right. And you can, wow. you can, you can cut this stone and, and polish it and it tumbles and it looks like a semi-precious stone. It's beautiful. This white mm -hmm. stuff on there is fireproof. It's called asbestos. You may have heard oh. of it. Uh, that yeah, is yeah, natural yeah, yeah. occurring asbestos. And I, so I don't lick this rock. I like to lick a lot of my other rocks. To just <laughs> <make them shiny. laughs> And he literally wrote in this note. I uh, have it right over here. He wrote in this note. He's like, don't lick this one. And I was like, good, <laughs> good advice. That's a guy who knows me. But this is noble serpentine. And serpent. this stone has a very unique property about it. And this is what they grind up and they use in concrete mixes for nuclear reactors. Like the encasing areas no around way. nuclear reactors, this thing blocks gamma and new, like it blocks alpha and gamma radiation. It blocks radiation oh, particles uh, in a very unique way. And so like houses, I grew up on the, uh, in these, I grew up going to these in estates out in New York and they had houses with this facade stone over them. And I'm like, oh. why, why do they got huh. certain people's houses that have this, inside and out like inside the houses you would find this Whoa. in some of the rooms and you're like why do they have all this nuclear radiation blocking material in some of these buildings out here mm. and then you start to study you're like so then a lot of these guys you find out are part of this underground scientific community you know it's the jason projects j-a-s-o-n right these are the ultra scientists advisors to the military right these are the brainiacs of brainiacs guys with lots of alphabet soup stuff after their yeah. names you know, right. they're recruited to do secret contract work for the government and they start right. building their houses with this stuff. So this led me onto a totally different treasure quest. That was one of those things that just dropped into my mind when I was young and I saw this and I was always like, that's something I got to pull on that thread for the rest of my life to like figure that one out because that was, a, yeah. that was odd. And then you start finding out they got atomic batteries and tiny synchrotrons and little particle accelerators in their basements. And these guys are making non like Neptunium, which is a superconductor. When you, when you have like uranium 235, Right. And you start to bombard this stuff with different particles and you start to make it go critical and all these other particles come out of it. All these other isotopes are made in one of right. them is plutonium and then the other one is neptunium and neptunium plutonium has interesting properties, which are, which are amazing for energy production and weapons production. And right. there's, right. but neptunium is a superconductor, meaning that it, it, you could float, you could float this rock over a piece of neptunium, right? It is the dream material for conducting energy, you can use it to make magnetic levitation tracks, yep. which is what I started experiencing down in those deep underground military bases. There was these rail systems and they were completely built out of this. The actual machines themselves were made from Neptunium. And it's this wow. ultra dense metal that I just love dense metals. And so it always led me into the bottom of the periodic table and studying this stuff. Yeah. And then when I started experiencing down in the military in these projects, I'm like, how is it that your craft don't have any circuitry? Like there's no yeah. circuitry yeah, yeah. in their vehicles. I'm like, because the entire thing itself is made of these superconductors. And I'm like, okay. this is savage smart, you know? And they're like, who built this stuff? And they're yeah. like, these Jason guys. And I'm like, well, where do they live? You know, because I want to go start asking them questions. This led me into this total other world of the scientific community and starting mm. to partner with these people because I started solving some of these complex issues because I just follow the rocks my whole life. I've understood that he says they're living stones. Like he said, like literally when Joshua is about to go into the promised land and, or sorry, after it's done, all the fighting is done and he's going to die. He brings all of Israel together and he pronounces this epic monologue about recounting the history of their life. And then yep. he's telling them, listen, just like Moses did, we're going to go over the rules, the covenant again. And then they all swear and agree. And he says, this stone has heard your words. And I'm like, these stones have memories. Like these stones have memories, like mm. for certain it's super biblical, which means that rock is a living witness. And I'm like, where's that rock? You know, yeah. like there, I physically want to hunt down all of these rocks because they're literally living witnesses. Like I was showing your son, these stones are still around where people literally physically carved the Torah. The entire Torah was written on rocks, like so that it would be a witness that anybody everywhere could always go and look for themselves. 
What does it actually say? That way you avoid the whole lying pen of the scribes garbage yeah, that gets infiltrating yeah. everywhere and like all these mistranslations and these guys who have ulterior agendas. Like here's one in the Masoretic text that just makes me want to burn their house down and utterly blot them out from the face of the earth and have all the plagues come down on their heads. Like it says, like in Revelations, he's like, all oh, the plagues are coming down on you. Yep. I just, yep. like, come on, burn that house down. So that's why I have this, like, I'll just say it. I like this translation a lot, but I hate how they people do this because it's it's an abomination. And here's one that's found in this one, 1 John 5. And it said, this is the one that came by water and blood, Yeshua Messiah, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit who bears witness because the spirit is truth, because there are three who bear witness, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. And then it has that nice little tiny letter B. They're like, oh, by the way, there's a footnote down there. Uh, yeah. Tiny font. It's like the terms and conditions that they know you're not going to read. They're yeah. like, yeah. in case you want to check us on our garbage. You're like, and it's like, oh, yeah, here you go. A, 5B, as per early Greek text, later MSS, which is the Masoretic text, contains uh -huh. oh, manuscripts. Manuscripts, yes, sir. Yeah. They contain additions. See explanatory notes, comma, Yohanan. And you're like, what the heck God. is all this stuff, right? If you don't yeah. know academies, this literally yeah. means nothing to you. You're like, yeah. you, they're sending you on a different treasure hunt that they know most people aren't going to do, except if you're a lawyer or someone like you, Noble, who's willing to investigate thoroughly and diligently what it is they're saying. You're like, this other yeah. translation say that there's three that bear witness, right? And they have the, yeah, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you're like, well, these are incredibly different, right? These are, this is a major doctrinal variance. Like this is one of those exactly. textual criticism stuff that should send up yep. all the flares and the like giant spotlights of investigators and archeologists should all descend upon that room and be like, not until we figure this out. Like, this is one of those things that affects us drastically. Like people yeah. are like, what do we pray? How do we pray? How do like, how do we do immersions? Like this is one of those points that needs to get addressed diligently. And until you, you like, that's one of those hook in the jaws that just bothers me. I call it like William Lane Craig used to call it a stone in the shoe. Like when he would get in these debates, he was like, I'm just going to yeah. put this pebble in your shoe. And sooner or later, yeah. you're going to get pissed off enough to be like, I got to dig that thing out. Yep. And that's like, if you dig on that thread, if you pull on that thread, it leads you into an unbelievable treasure hunt to find the Segula, the ancient manuscripts that have been veiled and concealed. Like, like yeah. that's what I'm on the quest for. The ultimate goal of my entire life is to find those Segulas because I know if I can find Noble Serpentine and that lead me into deep underground military bases and scientific projects and advanced technologies that can completely transform the world. And I'm like, I want to build an Ark of the miniature Ark of the Covenant out of certain woods that are radio protective and cover them in gold and buy a bunch of ore samples of your, like radioactive rocks to find out why is Shatim, this word that you see, they're saying this, the Acacia is the garbage translation they give us all for what the mm -hmm. Ark of the Covenant's made out of. Acacia, there's 800 kinds of acacia. It's a total junk drawer term that means absolutely nothing. Like, do you have to protect people from the radioactive thermal energy destructive force of the all consuming fire? The, the, you have to protect them. You have to build a shield box, you know? And I'm like, that wood is the one he chose for a reason. And I'm, so I'm literally yeah. experimenting with different woods to find out what's the actual wood that he used. Like, that will lead us on a different yeah. treasure hunt of locating where they were. Exactly. You know, all exactly. of these threads I just want to pull on. And so when you said noble, I was like, noble serpentine. <laughs> well, you need this rock. It'll change your life. It is. So yeah, I need one. Where'd you get it from again? I got it from a guy. I prayed. I've been praying. I know I, this is how I handle this stuff. I got it from a guy. I prayed my guy. I'll send you a, I will send you some. If you, after the show, you send me an address and I will send you oodles of it because you I, I want to make life. it, I want to make it clear though. It's not noble is a serpentine, but <laughs> noble, noble serpentine, serpentine. right? <laughs> yes. No, and that's why the word even got me. I'm like, why is this stuff called serpentine? You know, yeah. like that was a peculiar conundrum because I started studying yeah. that word and studying that in Hebrew and I'm looking for the serpent everywhere. And I'm like, Probably so why is it color. these people that are serpent eaters? Why do they build with this stuff? What do they know that we don't know? And then you start finding out that they're using plutonium 238, right? Which is like one of those extracts to have hot rocks perpetually indefinitely hot rocks that don't put off bad radiation. It's a total myth that they're like, don't kill people, but these rocks are awesome. And they could power your, your buildings and your houses forever. And so <laughs> guys would be like, yeah, I've got a bunch of plutonium in my basement and we can't have that leaking out. Literally, we can't have that because people used to drive by and detect this stuff to find out if anybody else was playing with stuff they shouldn't have been playing with. You know, the guy who dropped a little tiny rock in his pocket. You put this size rock of plutonium 238 in a very special kind of container and carry it out. 
you got hot rock. That rock will be, 18, I think it's 1800, 800 degrees Celsius for 80 years. For 80 Whoa. years, that thing is going to literally perpetually, It's you could put make a tiny steam electric generator system yeah. that you could power, make in limitless power as long as you got water. So like a steam broiler system for yep, heating. Exactly. Like all these old buildings, when you really study, like how are these things powering skyscrapers and all? Yes. Like, yeah. how do they do all this stuff? You're like, hot rocks, buildings, yeah. hot rocks. Yeah. And oh, so yeah. you're like, dang it. So I live right next to Rocky Flats and we like, which is a plutonium weapon site where they're making and manufacturing plutonium spheres that they call them the grapefruits that were used as the weapon system, the initiators as a plutonium core for nuclear weapons, like hydrogen bombs and fissile bombs. Where, and, where's that Rocky Flats? That's Let's right see. outside of Boulder, Colorado. Like literally well, you can almost Colorado. spit there. Yes. Yeah. Cause I know Rocky Flats. weapon site. Yes. The, the biggest manufacturing of plutonium wow. triggers in the entire world. And they were releasing this stuff everywhere they, they they had plutonium shavings that they were scooping up with 55 gallon drums and burying it outside with a backhoe like i got to know the surgeon who is oh bro you got to study rocky <laughs> flats it's crazy flats. <laughs> yes it is crazy from the 1950s right in the beginning of the cold war all the way till the end of the cold war they were manufacturing plutonium and they were they were me it's a metal but it's like it's a metal that in and of itself is like this 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 rock right and they're like okay you can just hang on to this orb but if you let it sit, it, an oxide will develop on it, and that oxide is is it, it's it, when it it attracts oxygen and it it will self ignite. Okay, I can't remember phosphoristic something like that. When, wow. when it will ignite, it will self combust in the presence of oxygen, which is super wow. sketchy. So they would have these crazy fires breaking out because you got plutonium every everywhere shavings. Like imagine <laughs> a CNC lab. You got a bunch of guys trying to shave metal into different shapes. So there's filings, there's dust, there's stuff everywhere, and eventually it would catch fire and it would burn relentlessly. And then there would be so much terrible toxicity in these rooms that they would literally concrete them off and just leave it and be like, "Don't go down that hallway." And they'd be like, <laughs> "Why?" And they'd be like. Yeah. everyone's Don't. dead that did it last time and you're like they're in there still they're like you betcha we just sealed them yeah. off like it was crazy and so there's was, there's was all these people that came down with major problems and diseases and uh Cancers, one of the attorneys yeah. was representing them had an, an expert witness who was a surgeon that my wife worked with and i picked him up in a limousine to drive him in style to a concert and i was i literally that morning was praying that the father would help guide me to the places where all this plutonium was because at the time i wanted to experiment with making atomic batteries like i just want to play with the battery side of this you know i've always <laughs> i've always wanted to play with these kinds of crazy hot rock i know this is super crazy fun. man i'm definitely <laughs> talking about finding plutonium <laughs> I pray for plutonium. I know it's peculiar, but I come from a different world where I literally believe you can pray and ask the father in secret anything and he can oh, yeah. get you anything. And I Absolutely. prayed that morning because I was studying Rocky Flats and I was studying this area because they turned it into a wildlife reserve. And then they turned in another area that was downwind of it into a place called Candela's and started selling $700,000 homes in the, in the, in the nuclear waste fallout site. Right. And if so, oh, if you buy no. their narrative, if you buy their narrative, they're like, this whole area is contaminated. And then if you actually pay attention and study, they're like, okay, but it's fine to put children's houses in, you know, you're like, this seems duplicitous. And uh, anyways, I was praying for the father to give me evidence to help me find this stuff. And I go and drive the surgeon that night. And as we're driving home, I start talking about plutonium because I'm like that. And he's like, you know, I've got a guy I'm representing who is suing the government to try to get, cause he's got horrible cancers and all this other stuff because he didn't understand what he was working with. They're like, it's yeah. just this metal. You're fine. Anyways, he, part of that case was what's called discovery, which is valuable tool where you find yep. out all kinds of critical information that's veiled from the public. And in there, they had all these diagrams of where people were digging holes and burying the stuff. Oh, and I was like, man. do you want to share that with me? He's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you betcha. And I was like, <laughs> this is how I know the father is like confirming that you're on target, son. This is like one of those things where you're like, you keep at it. And so I was recently wanting to experiment with making the Ark of Covenant and trying to make my own little boxes to protect these uh, radioactive <laughs> isotopes. And that I literally I was praying and that this guy is like, hey, can I get your address? I'll send you some, some stuff. That's all he said. And they call it treasure <laughs> box, right? And I open it up and he's, he's got, got a, a guy. Hemp, he's got a hemp shirt. He's got a hemp shirt in there for me. And I'm like, yes, finally. And in there is this. And I'm like, the father loves me so much. You keep going. He's like, you keep going. Anyway, wow. so that's my noble story. And I'm just like, I met a noble right now. And I'm like, bro, you and I, that's we're good. gonna find the ancient sacred text and we're gonna decipher them together. It's gonna be an adventure. Yes. Lifetime. Yes. Hey, you, since you dad and Zen. Since you're talking about rocks and wood, um, have you ever gone down the rabbit trail about what is gopher wood? Yeah. Come on. Hold on, I gotta show you it. 
Well, maybe, maybe. There's two speculations I have. One comes from Florida and the other comes from the Philippines, right? Okay. Mara yeah. Wood. I've got two well, options here. I've got two options yeah. here. And one of them, I have a handle of a knife that I made, which is made from Nara Wood, specifically because I was all over the gold co god culture in the Philippine, the Ophir series. Oh, good, yeah. good. Oh, all I was all, I was like, all down earlier. that trail for yeah, years. I think you mentioned that we we are actually a, the, like we connected to them. So yeah, yeah. we know okay. Tim and Anna from yeah, God Tim Culture. Anna, we so. we recommended the Beyond Zen show. And um uh for those of you that don't know, Gopher Wood, when it talks about making the art when Noah was building his art. You can see gopher, that word is usually in italics, which means it was an insert. So it's not a Hebrew word. It's not like in the original language. I'm sure it was in like the text that was that was probably gone for a long time. But the actual word that's supposed to be there is Ophir wood, not gopher wood. They just put a G on there. And so there's really good evidence that um, because we know Philippines is Ophir, and it's supposed to be, instead of gopher, it's supposed to be Ophir wood or Ophir wood. It's that Hebrew word, but they just added a G on there to kind of throw everybody off as to where it's from and and where Noah built the ark and, and so on. But I'm glad you dived into the God culture because we know Tim and Anna, they've even invited us to come stay with them in the Philippines mm. when we go visit and whatever. Oh. So. One of the one of, to go there. Our next trip, our next trip to the Philippines, we're gonna go see them. And That's awesome. Yeah. This is yeah. so I, I I love making I love heavy dense metal stuff. So I love making knives. Like I want to make knives out of all this crazy exotic materials. This mm. is one that I made in Canada when I went to speak at a conference up there, which which was like Quest for Truth. No, I, maybe that was the the name of the video. Dying to save a life was the name of the talk I gave there. But after the conference was over, this guy um, Brian and his wife, Audrey, who are savage warriors for the kingdom. They've been to more conferences than anybody. Like you think you've been to some conferences, y'all? I challenge you to talk to Audrey and Brian. They've been to hundreds and hundreds of conferences. Wow. Like they are ultra one. dedicated. You probably met them. <laughs> I you don't know, we've been to one. You've been to one, okay. Only friends, oh, so only in May. <laughs> they are diehards and they're Canadians, which, so they're super friendly. They're amazing. Well, Canadians are incredible. So when I was up there, he was like, he asked me, he's like, do you want to make a knife? And I was like, oh, I've been waiting my whole life for somebody to ask me this question. And he's like, got a shop. He's got a shop and he worked in the oil field. So he had some like crazy ball bearings and just super cool stuff in his shop. And he liked to forge stuff out. And so I forged this out with, cut this out. And this is a uh, knife shape that we did. We'd like crank this out in an afternoon with him. But then I like was totally all into the the, the study of the Nara tree and trying to uncover what is yeah. the tree that Noah built because I'm all about yeah. armor. And the ark is literally a giant armored box covered yeah. inside and out with pitch. And I was trying to unlock the, the, the history of what the linen armor was and the glue that they used. So I was studying pitch at the time. And that led me to the Nara tree. So this is Nara burl. This is Nara. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. That that's even a, shinier. That's for those of you guys yeah. listening, the Nara tree is the national tree of the Philippines. That's like their tree. And it's the toughest wood for making really? ships. It's like the, it's, it's watertight. Rock resistant. It's strong. Yep. Rock resistant. Yep. Insect yeah. resistant. And it grows yep. gigantic and it's beautiful. Absolutely we saw them beautiful. in the Philippines. Yeah. They're gorgeous. People have them in their yards. I mean, it's just, they're you really did. nice. Oh, see, you guys should be planting it there. You I can know smuggle seeds be... anytime. I know it's moderately <laughs> frowned upon these days, but y'all, we should be smuggling the seed of the word everywhere we yes. go. He's like, yeah. you sow it out. It's never going to be unfruitful. But I have a Psalm 91 challenge. I tell people Psalm 119 challenge. If anybody memorizes Psalm 119, I will give them this blade. If you, re if you record yourself saying the entirety of Psalm 119, I will give you this knife that I made and the holster Ooh. and those ulti clips, which are amazing to keep it on your belt. Oh. But this thing is custom fitted to a man with shmi or woman with medium hands. I'm going to tell you that right now because you can hold it in a reverse grip or you can hold it in the foregrip. But it is exactly designed for somebody who's got hands of my -ish yeah. size. So I say that because it's really designed like this. Because Nice. Well, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll do that in, in Hebrew. I'll read it in Hebrew for you. <laughs> it's a memory. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> How big are your hands? He's good. I'm 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 five eleven or oh, five five ten and a half. So I'm like right there with you, man. Okay. Come on, you say it. You do it. I would love to send this to you along with a whole bunch of sketchy rocks. It'll be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, um, uh, we're like almost one hour over time, which doesn't matter to us because we have right. no regulation. Neither um, do I. Those people that are, that are in the chat, they're they're, saying, they're saying keep talking. They're they're saying keep going. Uh, <laughs> but I know that this is actually going to lead to a part two. A part three, Let's you know see. what I mean? We yeah. got to get you back here because there's a lot of things that we have in yeah. common, a lot of things we can share with one another and with the the audience that, that's following your your group, our group, 
everybody that's on fire for the Lord and wants to learn more, yep. you are a wealth of and treasure of, of wealth and, and information. So that is awesome. That is so great. And I'm getting to know you now. I mean, you know, Likewise. we, we missed you at the conference, but we're not missing you now because we got you <laughs> all to ourselves. Yes. You know, which is so cool. I finally, and I finally have like a space where I can record in, you know, like our life was in total crazy, insane, falling apart around us back at the time around the conference. And we are like, no idea where we're going to live. We, we've been traveling. For those of you that don't know, my wife and I sold our home in Colorado like almost five years ago now. And we moved into an RV and went on the road on an adventure to try to literally wow. discover who we were. And I had published this book, uh, Snatched from the Flames, at that time. And I got invited That's to speak <laughs> at a conference in uh, Take on the World Conference in 2018. And, oh, maybe uh, we do you could, have the book? No, we could maybe we could do a trade, Nathan. I can send you the a book trade? I wrote about Isaac. I love trades, you know? super biblical. Yeah, okay. trades like, yeah, yeah. She, I would got to send you three books. books. She's got a coloring book for kids. So yeah, you're, you're awesome. gonna, your kids are gonna love it. I did that's a coloring awesome. book called The Firmament for Children, you... and and there's curriculum. <laughs> 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 ah, <laughs> I've got another piece. You want to see another piece of the firmament? Sure, let's go down another road of my segula. This is my segula. Okay, I'm gonna show it to you. I'm hoping you're not all Nebuchadnezzarians. <laughs> <laughs> what are we even doing? if you are, Yahoo raised up the Nebuchadnezzar. You know what I'm Probably saying? Some Babylonian. He said Nebuchadnezzar was his hand. He raised him up. He's all like, does the axe, does the axe boast about the one who wields it? <laughs> so like Nebuchadnezzar. Don't you forget, we'll send the watchers to curse you and turn you into a werewolf. And he did. He's all like, <laughs> the lycanthropy. So this, you guys, this comes from an area near the Philippines. And oh, I got one on my wall. Ooh. Oh, may have fallen down. Is that a black pearl? So this, it looks like a black pearl, right? This is called a tektite, endokinite. That's like the endokinite because it comes from the Indonesia area of the world. Now, these are molten raindrops, molten glass that dripped out of the sky that hardened when it came down. But it was literally made in an environment where there was no oxygen and it was molten. So it, it's dripping down from the shemaim, the firmament. The firmament. And yeah. it is it is predominantly yeah. composed of something called silicon dioxide. However, it is clearly they call it non-terrestrial, meaning there's no air in it, which means this wasn't glass oh. that melted down here. Like there's a type of thing that happens when there's major, super hot cataclysmic events where you get this uh, material glass where you can literally turn the, the deserts into glass. Well, this stuff happened in a place where there was no air. And so they know they're like, OK, so the theory goes right from the wizards of, of, of Warcraft, whatever you want to call it. They're like an mm -hmm. asteroid, you know, that thing that solves all our problems whenever we got a conundrum. They're like, these big rocks came down and hit our bigger rock. And then they launched sand particles and rocks and stuff into space and they were molten. And then they cooled down and they fell back down on us. And you can trust us because we made this up yesterday. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> literally, this is, what, this is their theory on tektites. And so I love them. I love them. And there's some called Libyan sea glass and I have pieces of them. Oh, yes. I've, I've seen that, that in oh, here. pictures. Oh, no. You have some of that? that I Libya will send you some. Awesome. You betcha. Awesome. It, and oh, yeah. and there's, they literally look like raindrops. I have one that looks like a raindrop. Yeah. I think I gave it to my friend to try to tie it into a necklace so people could see it better. But they are fascinating. This is one of my quests I've always been trying to – another one of those random threads of like, what are these – because I wanted to make body armor out of the firmament because I thought it'd be super biblical. Ooh, you know, I was like, I wanted to weave threads like sapphire threads. I'm all about sapphire because, you know, that's another piece of it. And maybe it's a multi layered firmament. This is my conjecture here. Just bear mm -hmm. with me for a second. But I think there's layers to it because no, it, it's, I, no, reason there is. it's reasonable to consider that the model of New Jerusalem, when it comes down, is a, is, is a similitude. Well, of what yeah. the firmament is. And so I started studying what are these 12 stones that launched yeah. me down into praying and asking the father to help me find these stones. I'm like, I need sapphires and I need all of these emeralds and I need topaz. And so I started praying and asking him of that stuff out in the North Carolinas. And he literally led me to ruby mines and sapphire mines and a place where there were roads paved with all these gemstones. It was called Koei Mountain Ruby Mine. And there's a wholesale, I'm just giving away my Sega laws here. There's a wholesale <laughs> side of it on their website where you can get this stuff for pennies pennies really? like buying emeralds for like two dollars a pound and you're like what where am i it was like literally a road that was paved with gemstones and i'm like oh, i have found their jerusalem i am on my way <laughs> and i was like yes and like they literally he's like buckets of sapphires and rubies like big ones like this size Whoa. <laughs> oh that's amazing you, you have quite the collection carnelian. like this is carnelian which is literally yeah. looks like drops of blood are trapped in oh, there and i'm God. like just the blood of the nephilim right in there man. <laughs> what the heck that's carnelian yeah. it's a bloody stone and that's why it's part of his judgment and part of the layers of the armor this is ruby 
This is a ruby. They grow naturally like this. Nobody faceted. This has not been hewn by man. This is an unhewn stone. They grow oh, like this. Are you this. serious? That, wow, is a, really? that is an unhewn stone of ruby. And when you hit it with an ultraviolet light, I'm going to turn off one of these lights. That's when it, oh. I'm going to turn off the light here. So I carry this rat, this little flashlight around. This is called an O-light arc field because it's good for fighting vampires. Now, yes. <laughs> check this out. So when you hit it, when you hit it, it will kind of make it pink, right? And this one doesn't do yeah. it too much, but this is one of these things. There's chromium in there that helps it turn pink. But then there's other ones that get, oh, man, that's not one. Hold on. Find one that's got it good. There you go. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. So that's that's Ruby. That's what you're literally looking for. So on the bottom there, that blue, when I turn on the light, you'll see it's blue. And yeah, I saw that. The component yeah. of it is bright red. That is a ruby. This is what I believe he literally says he made in Exodus 24 10. They said they saw the Elohim of Israel, and under his feet was a pave work of sapphire stones. That's sapphire where he stone. cut those stones and made the Ten Commandments. He wrote the Ten Words on sapphire tablets, which is why right. they're so precious, you know, and why mm -hmm. Moses, when he threw them down, you're like, come on, like yeah. perfect sapphires. And which is I, one of these things that I'm like, if we found the true Mount Sinai, we would find hiding there with our little lights. We could find yeah. <laughs> the sapphires. pieces, the fragments of, that were literally written by the finger of Elohim. But that, that mountain, that, that mine in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, he, he has all these hookups and contracts with all these mines from around the world. So he gets stuff for pennies. And so I started wow. buying it up in bulk. And, and this is where Nature Nature's treasure chest came from. And I started shipping out these rocks because I wanted people <laughs> to be able to experiment with this stuff. But oh, components of that firmament were, I believe, are sapphire and topaz and these layered systems. And this mm -hmm. is the conundrum one for me is then I'm like, what the heck? Or why are some of these metal? You know, why is it that we get iron and nickel falling down out of the sky and it's molten? You know, mm -hmm. like what, what is that layer? Cause that's a strange, this is one of those weird layer systems to the firmament pieces that I just got to pull on that thread. And mm -hmm. that's, this is what's led me into, into armor. And if you go into the, the scriptures, you're trying to find out like, what is the actual body armor that they were wearing when they were invading and fighting. And that led me into the linen, like literally it blocks all electricity, static electricity and EMF is yeah. mitigated by linen and discovering the linothorax, which is what Alexander and these people for thousands of years have been using as body armor because it stops the sword, it stops the spear, stops an arrow, just layering up linen between glue. Wow. So I started layering linen with gold and frankincense and myrrh because I saw it was very biblical. And then I started crushing <laughs> rubies and sapphires up and layering those in because a sapphire will shatter bullets. The United States military and Russia, they've been using sapphire windows for optics, for tanks, for helicopters. The F-35, like our super expensive fighter jet yeah. that's out there, you know, on yeah. station there in Hawaii as well. They, yeah. These things, they use sapphires because it shatters the bullet. And I was like, well, we should just have plates Whoa. of armor mixed in with our linen. And then we could be like the most ultimate gibberine. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I've got a go. playlist on, on my channel called Becoming a Linenite. And I talk more about this and making the kingly armor video where I was experimenting with it. But I stopped. Yeah, definitely. It's pretty spicy I've channel. Some of your videos with the linen, it's, it's excellent. It got me just so motivated to get rid of all my clothes made of plastic. You know, that's just so ridiculous. They have us all wearing plastic blends. It's just conductors gross. wearing conductors. Yeah. You know, yeah. wearing antennas. And you're like, what, what's that about? You know? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we only scratch the surface on what we really need to know, you know? So so the best way to reach you, Nathan, just for our audience, is is um I, I know I've reached you on Facebook messages. Um, is the email that that we connected with you today? That's that's a good email to get in touch yes. with you with. Snatch. So we can snatched, send you our address that way. Yeah, please do. And if anybody else is wanting to, you can email me at snatched from the flames at protonmail.com. Okay, oh, yeah. you guys hear that? Snatched from the frame. Maybe Tammy, you can put that up in the chat. Yeah. Snatched from the from the flames at protonmail.com. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, yeah. Nathan. You guys are going to read your book. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, you and can if any of you got hot rocks, you should, hey, we should talk. <laughs> we should talk. <laughs> Now, is your do, you, do you have lava? Do you have actual lava? Bro, my life dream. I was showing my children. I was teaching my children about magma the last week, and we were totally just all over volcan. We're studying volcanoes because I think these are the portals where a lot of these fallen ones go in and out, right? Yes. Just yeah. totally side note because you're like lakes of fire. I'm like lakes of fire. Like yeah. we should probably I got check some, out what's I got going some, in. 
Bro, so my life dream has always been to to walk over that seeping field of magma with a rock hammer and scoop it up and drop it into mm. a bucket. Like my life dream is to hold that rock because I'm like, this is, there's something going on there that it makes no sense whatsoever to any other version of, of geology that they talk about. I'm like, this isn't just a hot rock. This is something that's, this is connected to the blood matrix system of the earth. Like this is something other than, it's like living water. I'm obsessed with living water and springs because I'm trying to find where are the rivers of life that flow from yeah. the father's throne. Like they come up in the earth, all of the water's coming from his throne and it's all yeah. coming out in certain places across the earth. We have this literal living water that pops up. And so, like, I think that that magma is another one of these venues that's that's occulted from us that we don't really know what it is in that same capacity. So, do you have any rocks like that? Do you have any of that? Come on, I'm gonna rocks. send you a chunk. Yes, you know, just give me. We're gonna trade addresses. You'll get some prime um, um, lava rock from the Big Island itself. Oh my gosh, can I you? Mean, hey, if you can, or if anybody you know can, if you can get me a piece that's that's from the surface. But if any of you can give me a piece that's that's that came down into the water and hit the ocean oh. and solidified down there, that's another thing, right? Uh, There's those. Yeah. That is the total mixing between the worlds. Yep. Yeah, yep. that's some strange stuff, and it changes the molecular structure like crazy, and it's got totally oh, yeah. different properties. So that would be a fascinating. Yeah, I, that I don't have, but we could always look for it. Yeah, you know? we could definitely. Yeah, definitely get. Yeah. Some. Yeah. Then again, that begs the question. You should come to Hawaii with your family. Yeah. I would love to. So yeah. so my yeah. wife, my wife, my wife grew up in a uh, in a family that could afford to make trips out there on moderate regularity. She went out there quite a few times. And she also described it as the spiritually darkest place she'd ever been. The most beautiful place. So I just back to your story about it. She was yeah. she when I first met her, she she was struggling bad. She she was working night shifts in a hospital and living uh, the worldly life that you're supposed to live, you know, like a Christian gal, but like still not living well, you know, eating out and, and partying mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff a little bit, yeah. not as much, but she yeah. was physically dying. You know, she was working in this environment, this toxic sludge fest of EMF nightmares and horrible situation. And she was so depressed, so depressed. She battled so much depression when I met her. And, uh, and of course they're like, just drug her, just put her on a bunch of drugs. It'll fix her for yeah. sure. And she took this trip to Hawaii that first summer before we were dating. And she was texting me from there and she was like, experienced the most horrible spiritual warfare. And just, she saw this like homeless guy on the street and just was like overwhelmed with the spiritual darkness, like this death that was like clutching at her and just trying to rip her apart. Like she was being tormented out there, like nowhere else. And she's sending me like beautiful pictures out here and inside she's like this is a death this is a place of death you know yeah there's, so there's a i would love to go out there but i know there's an ancient there is an ancient there's archons you know principalities that are over that land that are not in our better interest you know they're they're nope. sons of the sons of elohim that should be doing what they sh they, they they were commanded to do but instead they're perverting justice you know yeah well oh, god yeah. god's gonna get back the people and the land you know it's it's a matter of time the reclam yeah. reclamation of his people and his and the lands Mm -hmm. is going to happen you know um it's it, it happens in small cell groups and they start growing and yes. florid uh, they, they the spread remnant. out and and you know it's a matter of time it's a matter of time but you're right it is we are in darkness mm -hmm. this yeah. present darkness yeah right? and also another sad thing a lot yeah, of people is. <laughs> yeah we read the book several times a lot of a lot of people don't realize with that whole incident that happened in maui um we were just talking to a guy on the plane about this uh, and, and a few other ladies, because they don't realize what's happened since the 90s here in Hawaii. And I saw it firsthand because, you know, as a social worker, um, mm. I saw how uh, the United Way out here in Hawaii is called Aloha United Way. And they would send one way tickets to people, to agencies in the mainland and especially cold areas to have them fly homeless out here because it's a safer environment for them to live. They're not going to freeze to death in the winter. They can live on the beach. So we had this huge influx of homeless come from early 90s to yep. now. Mm -hmm. And then all a lot of the homeless that lived here on Oahu, because they usually initially come here, um, they would have one-way tickets to Maui. All the homeless were being sent oh, to Maui. Boy. And then about three years ago, uh, they began uh, sweeping the beaches in Maui, meaning the police would come and tell the homeless, you got to pack up and leave. The beach has got to be clean. They were sending all the homeless to guess where on Maui, Lahaina. Dang. So there's thousands of homeless 
that lived in, that was living in Lahaina on the streets. We were just there like about a year and a half ago, drove through tons of homeless all in the streets in Lahaina. And I believe that that was all by design. You know, they knew what, they had, they planned these things, right? You know, decades right. in advance, if not even more. And so that was totally planned. That was totally planned. And that's why they don't really know the number of people who passed away because a lot of them were nameless, you know, Paper they were, rice. yeah. Yeah. And they, they, they didn't have records. They were living on the streets. They, they had no address. They had, I mean, they were, they were basically nameless people that, that, mm. that died. So it's really sad what the government did. I mean, on many different levels and they're still missing quite a few missing people that they're, they're not sure what happened to a lot of the children. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot of things up in the air right now. And in the meantime, they're, they're building their smart city. You know, it's just, it's just <laughs> disgusting to, to me, but that that's that's another component of the evil that's out here um in on the high levels the elite you know the 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 people that live here the there's it's getting to be kind of like two levels and i think this is happening in a lot of places in the mainland too where it, there's like the elite class and then there's like the low class there's the middle class is just getting sifted out and so you're either going to be elite or you're going to be you know worker slave class basically nice. and a lot tons of people the locals the polynesians there's a huge percentage just totally dependent on the government. They're not growing their own food anymore. They're not doing their cultural things anymore. They just stay home and they're just dependent on the government because it's very easy to do here. Like Native American Indians, um, you know, let's just drink and yes, get yeah. depressed together, you know. Yeah. And, and so and, Noble, and Noble get our check and, and get our check, you know, our check exactly. Our and check. Noble and I, we, we, we work with fell. homeless. Yeah, we have we we've been Noble actually when I met him too, one of his side ministries was with some of his other pastor friends to have like a homeless ministry in the area here on Oahu where there's a ton of homeless. So that we were having like um beach services where we'd play music and just invite people to come and eat and they'd bring food, hot yeah. food and and then we got to know a lot of the couples and so they started like a halfway house. Um they had a donated nine bedroom house that was near the beach where these couples could move into and get clean and then we had over and then we got so a couple of rentals ourselves so they'd have a place to move into out of the nine bedroom place and some of them had been so successful and just on fire for the most high god and have their own ministries now and it's super cool to see the success stories but you know that's a small percentage out of you know very small so, thousands there's thousands here but they came to know the lord which is the main thing yes by coming to know yeshua they actually realized we need to get our act together Stop living on the beach. Stop doing drugs. Let's 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 go to school. Let's get jobs. Let's become productive members of society. And wow! And witnesses for Yeshua yeah. as the yeah. as the most important part yeah. of it. And some are serving. Some are serving in the churches. So yeah, wow. it's, it's and huge. and and back on the beach too themselves. Some are serving back on the beach and as drug rehab counselors. As yep. you know whatever. I mean it. They're they, they're the best type of drug rehab counselors because they've been through it. They've been homeless on the beach for you know decades, and now they're now they're the ones counseling and helping people that are were in their situations. So. Yeah, perpetuate so, the word. You know, perpetuate yeah, perpetuate the word. Yeah, so it is. It is a dark, like you said, it is a dark place. But there are some spots of light that yeah. that we're trying to to maintain here. Yeah, um, and it's home for us. Well, know. one day, when one day we'll 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 drag you guys all out here. <laughs> you can stay with us. You know what I mean. Hallelujah. Yeah. I will go immediately. I will bring <laughs> all of my diving equipment and all kinds of I have been go hunting, my, go rock hunting, right? I have right? been waiting my oh, all kinds of hunting. I have been treasure hunting and terrain mapping Hawaii for many years. As soon as I saw that, like you guys have such a freak people don't even understand the freak show level of unique Garden of Eden like culture and climate that is there. Like you, it is such yeah. oh, it is such a unique place and you guys have I, I am obsessed with studying places called points of prominence, the highest points on, of, of pl the two the places place. I, I like to study, the, the the lowest places and the highest places. Those passages mm -hmm. in Job, when I was reading Job, when I was first like getting to understand when he's like totally talking to Job and just rebuking him, gird up your loins like a man. Like, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sketchy, man. You know, like Job's all like, I put my hand over my mouth and not speak again. Like scary stuff. <laughs> you know, he's like, have you walked in the fountains of the deep? And you're like, dang, what the <laughs> heck is that? You know, that's where I got hooked onto finding the fountains of the deep and the springs and like 
how does oh, yeah. this bathysphere work? Like, how does the pumping system regulate the water levels? Water's above, Rivers water's eating. beneath. Like, how does this function and work? Like, what the heck is going on? And how is Leviathan interconnected with this system down there? And like, oh, I just yeah. so there's like that whole level of it that just like, and led me into Death Valley and like all of like, this is a literal, the largest national park in the United, the most acreage they've given to any private park in the entire public technically but really not death valley is the largest by acre place on the earth that's been totally kadosh set apart and i'm like well that's interesting you know and i'm living in this area in arizona at the time we're going there on on these trips where all these people would gather together and meet and then they would conjure these dragons and have these rituals where they're speaking to these underworld beings and they're getting their marching orders in they're all coming from death's kingdom. You know, they're literally like they literally death reigns there. Like it's literally the place on the earth where they reign from. And then you go to the mm -hmm. high places and you have totally different kinds of entities that are ruling and reigning that worshiping of the stars and the heavenly hosts. Like when you go to um, the Lucifer, well, there's yeah, like a Mount, a Mount Hermon for all intents and purposes in in Arizona, where I was born on top of, which is Mount Humphrey, right. these volcanic peaks, all these volcanic peaks is where they were doing all these rituals and stuff. And you're like, why are you guys all about going to the tops of these places? And you read in Jeremiah and they're like, we're sure the heavenly host. They're like, they're doing the same yeah. thing they've been doing forever. And then you go to like, what is, what is, what is the tallest mountain there in Hawaii called again? If you could remind me. Oh, Mauna Loa. Yeah. Mauna, Mauna Loa. Loa. Right. It is the highest place. And you're talking about a body of water that goes from the bottom of the ocean to the tops yeah. of a mountain, like place yeah. where snow is happening. Like you got mm -hmm. all the climate zones on Hawaii. It is such a freak show place. Like yeah. it is, it's a freaky place, you know, like yeah. where you can go from the, the bottom of the ocean. To the, it is just crazy. I'm like, and day. like the Reynolds family had one of the deepest diving submersibles It's called the Illumina. And it was like the deepest huh. diving. It could go down to 26,000 feet. So they said it could go way deeper than that, but wow. they were going down and picking up all these meta materials from all the flooded kingdoms that were down there. And this is what they were using to build all this other underground technology with. And so I've always been like, yeah, well, I pray all the time that the Father's going to entrust to me the Illuminati again, and we'll be going down to the depths of these places because there's do there's doorways and portals. Like, like right. literally, Jonah went down into the earth. We think he just like Jonah died. Like, he yeah, died. yeah. Like, it's not like some kind of thing where he was drowning, and then Yah's like, "Let me send this fish to save you." It's like, dude died. <laughs> Dude died. Right, he guys. went yeah. into the gates of the earth. He went into Sheol, like Isaac, you were talking yeah. about. Like he saw this place. He went into that place. And Yahuwah then from there appointed a great fish. Ketos is the word from the Greek translation, which was a like a giant dog faced dragon, sea monster fish creature that people mm -hmm. believed was a real thing for thousands of years before we got obfuscated. And they're like, the biggest piece out there is the blue whale. You can trust us. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about Architeuthis and the great giant squid and megalodons <laughs> and all the other blavite they're like don't you talk about that stuff none of you like <laughs> like but these submersibles i know we could go down there and this is where these these access points are to the fountains of the deep and people literally take these submarines like i was praying for confirmation about like going down there again because i really want to go i really want to go physically see these places that we read about in the scriptures and i believe that the father will give us the opportunity to do that if we believe on him and trust on him and i was praying about this because i was wanting i was like we need a nuclear powered submarine that was my conjecture at the time i'm like okay <laughs> So I need to start praying for a nuclear powered submarine. You know, I'm like, we need to be able to get into these places because the Illuminati was not nuclear powered at the time. And so I was like, well, we either got to convert it to this plutonium based nuclear reactor system, but I don't have a lot of experience building those and running submarines. So I'm like praying. I'm like, father, I'm going to need a team of people who are specialized in nuclear submarines. And like, literally I meet this guy at the fellowship the next week. And he <laughs> is the, a diver who was on the nuclear powered submarine. That was the special forces. They call him the oh. hot boat. And I was like, reading a book at the time about that exact boat that was diving down under the water and hacking Soviet un Union's communication cables and laying down literally bugs to bug their system. And they were having to change the tapes all the time, like straight up, they're having to change the tapes. So they kept having to sneak into the Soviet Union with this nuclear powered submarine. And meanwhile, all the people on the boat have no idea where they are. They're like, we're in the Strait of Hormuz. You betcha. You know, then they're like, and then except for the guy who gets out of the boat, like, well, this guy's going to know that we're not exactly where we say we are. And so they're literally having to put little skis on the, on the submarine so they don't sink down into the silt and they can take off. And the divers are having to get out there. Now, he didn't necessarily tell me all this stuff because he's <laughs> moderate. He had a flat earth cafe, big giant clue. He literally had a flat earth cafe in Colorado Springs. And I'm like, bro. Um bro. Like he was super passionate believer. He's a guy who gave me one of my Segulas right in here. 
he gave me a potent source. Yeah. True story. This wow. is the, he. This is what he gave me. This is a true pen, right? This is a, a pen. It's not anything crazy nuclear powered yet, right? Right. It's but, the pen. but you know why? Because he was writing the Torah because it says in the scriptures, if you're going to be a king, what do you got to do? One of those commandments is that you write the Torah with your own hand. So this is what he was all about. He's all about writing and journaling out the entirety of the scriptures. And so he was really wow. into calligraphy and he was really into these pens. And, and right. I was like, I would love to do that. And he sent me an incredible, um, I don't have it right here. He sent me this very nice book to to start writing the Torah out, and then I started learning about Paleo Hebrew, and I was like, maybe I'll write it all in Paleo Hebrew. And uh, <laughs> but but this is this is literally these di these deep places of the earth, these great recesses of the earth, and Hawaii is a real bizarre version of that, where you can have all the way from the depths of the earth to the heights of the heavens, all in yep. one place. And so I I'm convinced it is a massive territorial. I mean, it is where the United States military can consolidates more power than any other place. It is where the Jesuits have consolidated more power yeah. in communing with the celestial host than anywhere else yep. in the world. Like yep. it is the consolidation points for the true power centers of the kingdom and predominantly the military and the religious scientific communication systems are all deeply embedded there. So I, I would love to go there and start praying and asking for divine appointments. Wow. Hey, well, you're always welcome, man. Now, now that we've met and we've talked and we shared, now that that bond has been made. Now we're family now. So again, we're we're always open to people that that want to research, you know, and, and and share. You shared so much knowledge with all of us today. We really appreciate it, Nathan. Yeah. Thank you so much. I you mean, I love your too. passion for rocks. I think that's cool. And also, too, have you seen? You're in Boulder, right? No, I'm in so, Missouri now. We oh, we, you're Missouri we, now. You know, I, you know how I called Moses out of there, you know, he's like, yo, bro, you murdered some, you murdered that yeah. guy. And there's a, there's a hit put out on you. They activated all the special kill teams for Moses, you know, like the most powerful military on the earth sent everyone after him to kill him personally. This is yeah. like, we don't read it like that, but he definitely went down. They put him on the FBI's most wanted list, like numero. <laughs> They're like, we're yeah. going to activate all the Phoenix kill team agents to get all the sleeper assassins, go after this guy, all the hybrids. Everybody was hunting Moses. And they're like, where's he going to go? And yeah, who was like, Midian. He's like, Midian? You're like, yeah, Midian. You know, he's like, I'm going to send you to get the rod of Elohim. You're like, dang. Right. He doesn't tell him right away, but bro, yeah. he's got some stuff in his future. It's so yeah, it's cool. It's the best story ever. It's, it gets so good. He's like, I'm going to teach you to be a shepherd because it would back to the whole chief shepherds, right? Isaac, we were talking about shepherds that go after, go mm -hmm. after the flock. He's going to teach you to be a shepherd if he's going to make you a leader of his people. But he's like, he, when does he send them back? You know, when's he sent, he sends Moses back. He said, when all those who sought his life were dead. And I kind of think that's for some of these places where I've been, there's a lot of people that are actively seeking my life and my family's life, like very seriously willing to try to shoot us and kill us and stab us. And that happened in Colorado. It also happened in Nashville, North Carolina. Like the oh, father wow. has protected us, but people actively seek to murder my family regularly. And we wow. have seen the father personally deliver us in supernatural ways, jamming weapons, shooting drones out, of, like making drones fly out of the sky and completely leave our family alone, like jamming their technology and their tracking devices. People that were completely drugged out and demonized, rippling, ready with murderous intent to come after us, being unable to see us. We used to pray that the father would make us invisible to the eyes of the adversary. We pray that like when we would go out, like, Father, we ask you to forgive the sins that have been committed in this place and by any individuals who are being used by the adversary to target or combat my family. You'd forgive the yeah. sins of their ancestors. And we ask that you would apply the blood of Yeshua to their bloodlines all the way down to the DNA level, breaking their power of iniquity, that you would forgive Amen. them and have mercy on them, deliver them and heal them, save their souls. We are like, we ask that he forgives the sins that empower these evil spirits that are being sent on assignment against me and my family. And that he would just bind any powers of the adversary that are working against us you know like there is a serious power game that is going on all the time that war and none of these people like none of them the power of death was taken cap when yeshua gave his life as a ransom for many he didn't die he gave his life up that literally is the word yep. nathan he gave his life up as a um, ransom for many. Like that is only ever what he did was give. Yahuwah only gives. He can, he never takes, he never steals, right? Like he never steals, have to. but no. he gave his life up. Like when he literally breathed out, right? He's like, he gave up his Ruach. Like no one could take his life. 
And he's like, mm-hmm. if the principalities and the powers and the rulers ever knew it, they would have never impaled the son of glory. Like they never yeah. would have done it because when he went down into the depths of the earth, it says oh, he, yeah. took cap- he took captivity captive and he mm-hmm. took the keys, the, 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 Think about your car keys, turning the system on, the, the key, the way to drive the system. He took the power and the authority of death into mm-hmm. his hands, and he wrestled it out of the hands of the dragon. The devil used to run death, and now Yeshua took those keys, and then he went up and raised the first fruits up and brought forth this incredible witnesses of like the patriarchs, like the, the heroes of our faith, like the mighty Gibberim, the ones who are faithful, like the great yeah. cloud of witnesses that it talks about, like Jephthah and Gideon and Samson and Rahab mm-hmm. and these like warriors oh, yeah. of warriors who like, they had a, they had a, they had a, a knowing that he was going to mm-hmm. fulfill that word. I mean, he's like, and not many of them died without ever seeing it. And you're like, what steadfastness these people had, like what that willingness. To- Nicodemus, Gus, I love the gospel of Nicodemus that gives it so yeah, much. It earlier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, yeah. yeah that, I love that. It, it gives, it like makes it sound so clear that it, that's exactly what he did. You yeah. know, he went down there to set the captives free. And we, I was always wondering who are these captives? You know, when you read the Bible, you don't get all of this detail, but mm-hmm. gospel of Nicodemus made it so clear and it's so amazing. That he did that, you know, and that he all that all that you just described that he did for us, um, and he saw us. He saw us. He knows the future. He saw what, that we were going to be talking today. Yep, you know, right. it's just amazing. Question: What do you think about the rod of wonder? That's actually sapphire blue. You bet. You bet. Do you want it? Do you want to give people a little backstory on what you're talking about? Because I I would love to talk about it, but I think you know a lot about it too, and I would love to hear from you. That, that, that's the book that we're reading with Zen and Digital Readers Club. The book that Zen wrote, the the Vestures of Light and Rod of Wonder. So I think a lot of our listeners they they all come over from Digital Readers Club and they okay. come here. So okay, um, but not all of mine do. Not all of mine do. Right, and I would love to share okay. this with oh. them. So if you oh. would if you would be willing, come on, tell them about the sapphire yeah. rod. Okay, so the sapphire rod, um, it's you can trace it down using the Bible and extra biblicals from all the way from Adam, who um, the Most High gave this rod to when he left the when he was kicked out of the garden, basically, um, and it was a branch from the tree of life. It was sapphire, and inscribed on it was the ineffable name of God or Yod Heh Vav Heh, along with all the names of the patriarchs, the names of the apostles. I mean, it, all the future was like on this particular rod. So Adam passed it down to um, Enoch. Enoch passed it to Methuselah. Methuselah passed it to Noah. Uh, Noah carried it on the ark. And it's it, since then, it's been taken by the the evil bloodline. Ham went in there and stole it when he when he saw the nakedness of his father and uh, did some yeah. horrible things with his mother. Yes. Took the rod of, of wonder and the vestures and gave it to um, his son, Cush, who gave it to Nimrod. And what's the vestures? Real quick. Make sure you tell me what the vestures are. are. Yes, the vestures, uh, we're, we're taught that uh, God clothed, or the Most High clothed Adam and Eve with skins. And in the churches, they teach it that, that the Most High sacrificed two lambs, but it's not that. <laughs> he wouldn't have done that. It's this. It was the uh, skin of the serpent when the serpent was the cursed. Nakash. Yeah, the Nakash, the, the serpent was cursed. And so the vestures are made of this beautiful multicolored um, the the way the serpent would have looked, the feathered garments that it was like a hologram is what I'm picturing. But it gave the wearers um, power. It gave them power over animals. Cloak of um, concealment, like yes, visibility yes. cloak in a sense, right? Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like, and so the the these these two items have been passed down to the um, I would say also to those who had the title of Melchizedek as well, because that's the title that Adam was passed down to Enoch, to Methuselah, to Noah. The, the priest king, the leaders, the, yeah. the righteous ones, um, but they were also, also stolen by the evil, the serpent seed bloodline for their own uses. That's what we see when Cush passed it to his son Nimrod. Nimrod um, was also was a servant initially of the Most High God, but then he became a mighty man, and that's around the age 20 when his father gave him these garments, and um, he was the mighty hunter before the Lord, but then he turned evil, uh, using the garments for evil when he was when he was killed by Esau, Esau took the garments, um, so it, it remained in the evil serpent seed bloodline. But then uh, Yaakov received them from from his mother, took them from Esau, gave them to Yaakov when he went to Laban's. And so then Yaakov passed them down, and that's when we hear about them in the Bible again, when um, he made the coat of many colors for his son Joseph. Um, that was made from the vestures of light. 
the rod of wonder. And then Joseph, when he was um, when he was second only to Pharaoh in Egypt, uh, and then he passed away. Uh, he left the rod in Pharaoh's garden, and that's when um, when Jethro was an advisor to Pharaoh along with Job. Uh, Jethro was upset because everyone was agreeing that they should use the blood of the innocents to to cure Pharaoh Balaam. and to doctrine the Balaam. Yeah, exactly. And so um, so Jethro was upset. He went he went stomping out of that meeting and he grabbed the the the, the rod <laughs> the rod on the way out is what I see. He five fingered the, the rod of wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Took it back to Midian with him, put it in his garden, and then he had all these daughters and um, his oldest daughter Zipporah was beautiful, and all these men of Midian wanted to marry her. So he said, "Okay, you know the, the <laughs> person, who can, person who could take this the the sword out of my garden, the rod, yeah, the, the rod." could have the hand of my daughter. And so that didn't happen till Moses came along um, and was imprisoned in Jethro's prison for 10 years after he was king of Cush for like 40 years. 40 years. And then Had to uh, get humbled, huh? Zipporah is feeding <laughs> Moses the whole time, Moshe the whole time for 10 years in Jethro's prison. And Jethro is wondering, oh, what happened to the um, the Hebrew man that I imprisoned? 10 years ago. Guess what? He's still alive. So they brought him out and <laughs> And, and the rod literally jumped into uh, Moshe's hand when he was walking through the garden. He was reading it, and it says, I can read that. It's like, Yahuwah Elohim Seva Oath is written on it. And it's all like, <laughs> Yep, exactly. So, yeah. so and, yeah, and King then, Arthur's got nothing on this story. Dude, you, know? you know it, bro. You They they make us read all their, their hypocritical versions of, yeah, they, yeah. they bastardized all of the true oh, stories. Oh, big time. You know it. So big just time. real quick, I'm going to tell people that don't know oh, about yeah. a lot of what you just said. They, they, some people's jaws are on the floor right now going, what in the world? <laughs> exactly. Bro, okay, this is why we were talking earlier when Isaac and I were talking about like, there's some texts that used to be part of our scriptures no, no. that are very yes. important. They carry all kinds of information that are pertinent to the story that elaborate on points of, that like the word Nephilim that drops into the scriptures in Genesis 6 and Moses is like, side note, by the way, you know, guys, when the time the giants were taken over and written, you know, the angels were having sex with women and hooking up and creating all these giants. And then the whole world became only evil continually. And you're like, Wait, what? And, he, and yeah. he's like, don't worry about it. You obviously all know about it because in these other texts, like first Enoch, Jasher and Jubilees, there's an incredible depth of, in of information that is contained there. Yeah. And Rob Skiba put out this book. This is called Genesis and the Extra Biblical Biblical yep. Endorsed yep. Text. This Excellent one was, book. Bro, this one was the first one that I started hunting down all that stuff. So the story like she was talking about, about Joseph and about Jethro and about Moses being sent over when he left and to go towards Midian, he ended up going and becoming the king over Cush, like she was saying. All that stuff's in the book of Jasher. I'm working on an audio version of that right now, yeah. a drama. Nice. Nice. Good. Nice. Good. Cause yeah. it's so good. It's like, it's like the version of this. It's like the book of the wars, you know, when you're reading the Bible and you got these other books they're talking about, like Joshua 10, when sun stands still over yep. oh, the Valley of Ekron. And it's like the moon stands yep. still over here. And then he's all like, is this not written in the book of Jasher? And you're all like, what the yeah, heck? Exactly. Where's that over, book? Over, and then over David, 200 books. Yes. Yeah. And second Samuel chapter one, David's all singing the book of the, there you go. There's the book by Zen Garcia, y'all, that they were referencing. If you guys would like to read this book, you can go to sacredwordpublishing.com and you can order this book. We're also studying, I'm teaching this book on Sundays. We have a Bible study group where I'm teaching this book along with the book of First Enoch. We're teaching crazy books, yeah. That relate to both. Yeah. So, <laughs> you guys are slaying it. You're dangerous people. Dangerous to the kingdom of darkness, <laughs> you know. Like the enemy has the enemy has an ulterior agenda to keep things veiled from your eyes, you know, and like mm -hmm. some of that is some of that is these texts that they're like, OK, we're going to make sure that, you know, Yahuwah preserves his word in unique and powerful ways. But there is also a completely other kingdom that is using agents of men to destroy and utterly blot it out, you know, and they when men compromise, they give over their power to those those kingdoms to come in and do what should never have happened. You know, like this is why I'm I just the greatest quest of my life is to find the word. Like I know Yahuwah has preserved all of it, all of it. Like when Noah went on the, the ark, it says how he had hundreds of texts, like mm -hmm. all of the writings of, of the fathers before him, all like everything has been preserved and none of it's gone. It's not gone because Yahuwah's word, it says he sows it out into the word and it never returns void, meaning it's yeah. not destroyed. It's like literally light. You can't destroy it. Darkness can never conquer light. As long as there is even a single light burning, like you guys out there being witnesses on the beach, out there actively contending against the kingdom of darkness and trying to snatch people from the flames of deception. Like 
when you're doing that, you are the walking cities of refuge that like, that is the job that we were supposed to be commissioned to do. We are supposed to literally take the kingdom of darkness, advance against the kingdom of darkness, contend mm -hmm. against it to where we're literally going to their gates, their seats of power. And we're yeah. literally even there like you by, by, Oh, she just stepped out. But by, by, by her literally choosing to adopt you, Isaac, she, she made a decision that forever changed the trajectory of your life, that no longer were you a son who was branded as unadoptable, like that yes. horrible false identity they put upon you. And oh, instead yeah. you were adopted, right? And you were given a new life. You were given yeah. a new purpose and a new calling. And that's, I'd love to read that book and hear that story. Cause that is, that is the story of all of us. Like we are orphans. Yep. Without father we're all orphans. And mother. Yeah. We're all orphans without father and mother, unadoptable, like like cut off, like literally yep. abominations walking around, un un unredeemable. You know, like I my, like the first guy who ever had me on a show was Tom Dunn uh, with Through the Black, and then Zen Garcia was the next person who ever interviewed me. You know, and like he wow. he was one of the first people to ever ask me questions that nobody ever asked. You know, and it's like so much of this evil agenda is proliferated because nobody asks the right questions. questions. This information is locked up in so many yeah. people's lives and their yeah. histories and their testimonies, but nobody ever asked, you know, yeah, nobody yeah. ever asked about it, but like, there's somebody who reads diligently and studies these things. And it goes, you know, this has still got to be around today. You know, if it's, it's nothing new yeah. under the sun, it's going to be the same systems of evil that are operating behind the scenes. And like, I was literally raised up to believe like you're a son of the dragon. Like you're literally a carrier of a seed. Like, so on wow. one side, I'm going to a church where they're like, anybody can be saved. Just say these magical <laughs> incantation words. You're in. And I'm all like, yeah, but what does that do with what's inside me? Like yeah. I physically had this thing in me, like a literal thing inside me, another entity, like another, this other blood, like this black blood, like what is this and how do I get it out of me? You know, how do I detoxify from, from not yeah. just demons, like from the archons, like, how do, how do you get this stuff out? Like, Russ has a book that he wrote. Russ Stizdar wrote another book that's called Expelling the Darkness. And that is just, that so encapsulates what is actually required to get cleansing from this. This stuff has to be expelled, yep. like utterly driven away from you completely. Like, so how do we get this stuff out of us? And this is where you got to go to the word. You have to find out how is this driven out? Like, how did that, how did the apostles walk around and, and command that spirit of Python out of that girl? Like they set a child of, of great ritual abuse, systemic, wow. satanic yep. ritual where a child of the seed of the serpent, right? Who is raised up to be the money-making thing for this other kingdom. And the right. whole city was engineered around that girl being possessed with the serpent. Like they literally would make people swallow these dragons. Like it's not some kind of fairy tale thing. These people yep. do these rituals and swallow these entities, these yep. physical wow. beings into their bodies and they possess mm -hmm. them. It's not some kind of like, like spiritual floating yeah. aerial things. Like these are physical beings and they physically yeah. occupy human mankind. They occupy the, the beings of men and women mm -hmm. and predominantly children because children mm -hmm. have so much more potential power. Like they have so much more innocence. And so when you consume them, they can feed off of them so much more efficiently. And until they start to wear out their hosts and go find another one. I just did an interview with a guy named Eric and uh, it was called the, the house of the dragon and its devices. And we talked a lot about that, talked about the biological version of it, the spiritual, but biological version. And then the synthetic yep. version, these artificial constructions of man, this bio synthetic matter bio like literally programmable matter that they're trying to use to control us yeah. and hack us and and take over because the whole world's got to go back to the days of noah before the son of man returns like that means exactly. everything is going to be genetically altered everything will be transformed into the image of these fallen angels again like everything yeah. from the dust of the earth to the rocks that we are standing on every creature that's got the breath of life in it is going to turn into another thing entity and you're like how do you do that well not overtly you know? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, Isaac went through that too, because being in foster care and raised by the system and living at all these various people's homes there, he, he had quite a few um, entities to expel. <laughs> and, and it was like, he grew up. I mean, the way I saw it, the way, I mean, I did so many exorcisms with him. I anointed him every, almost on a daily basis, his room, his doorposts, everything, just because it just seemed like there was always something dark and there was always something else going on 
rapidly in his mind. I could see it in his eyes. And um, it wasn't until he decided that he wanted the demons out that they finally were out for good. Wow. I'm not sure what age that was, maybe 20, 21, when you were doing a lot of exorcisms yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And then they finally just let, because, you know, the, so, the scripture, they'll come back seven fasting. times stronger. You know, <laughs> if, if you don't if you don't clean that house yeah. and he invites them back, even as a child, they'll come back seven times stronger. So yep. it, it was it was rough. It was really rough to deal with him. You know, it wasn't it wasn't him. You know, it was yeah. the entities that were manifesting all a lot all the time. And so once he finally decided, you know, he's a child of the most high God. He wants them out of him. He's an adult. They came out and we saw a lot of, of rapid changes after that. So that, that's a huge deal. And they, they really do prey on children, especially a lot of those in the system, because they really yeah. don't have a voice. That's right. They're yeah. the anonymous ones, right? Even just how you said down in Boulder, there was a guy I met, like you hit it right on the head, how this, how, what, how they get the human material for this other world kingdom. Like you physically have to feed these dragons. Like yeah. it's literally like we were talking, we started the show talking about Genesis three and the dragon's food, like when he was cursed would be dust. And yeah. what, like, what's he going to eat men who are made of dust, like right. it's intricately connected. His food source would be mankind. Like he yeah. has that. And not just him, not just the fallen, like the, not just him, all of these seraphim, all of these dragons, like they must consume life. And that is the blood. That is the, that's the fesh this life force that's supposed to be in us and they need it to live. And then people get completely addicted. I'm talking about the humans too. They get these things in them. They get these serpents in them and they cannot live without it. It becomes yep. this true parasitic, re like it's a, and it's a physical thing. Like you can actually see this inside the body with well, these yeah. humans. Like they start to go, like it said, iniquity. the first time we find iniquity in the scriptures, like it said, iniquity was found in Halal Ben Shahar. Like, like when he's uh, yeah. looking, like he's like, I will, his five I wills, his declarative statements, I will be like the most high. Like I will ascend, like these great declarative, this pride rising up, right? Like I want what Adam has. Like I'm not going to bow down and worship this creature of clay and dust. Yeah. You know, yeah. he refused to let Adam, he could not stand that Adam would be the priest over mm -hmm. this thing, you know, like, exactly. and I, can, I can't comprehend the 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 level of majesty of of a perfectly created beings like how to be made of perfect perfect yeah. gemstones to be made of of the father's most intricately crafted colorful iridescent light you know like i i can't even we can't even fathom this that we we can't even imagine it there's no level of of cinematography that could ever even partially encapsulate the the full oh, spectrum of light of what these things are and so mm -hmm. for us to sit here and be like, yeah, why did he try to do that? Well, Adam was not the same. He was made in the image of Yahuwah. He was distinct. He was made from the terra firma, like this little Eretz. Like he came from the very nature of Yah's like work workmanship, like the potter's hands crafted him versus this smoke and fire, this flesh and bone that these other beings were made with. He had blood and bone and flesh yep. and he's totally different and so part of that curse that mutual enmity meant he literally goes to consume and find ways to consume the life of men and then he gets people who get brought into that this is why cain the mark of cain is so intimately connected with the consumption of human blood this is oh, yeah. literally where the mark of cain gets manifested like on that, the first time I ever manifested that in this purple mark took over my face is the consumption of blood that starts to manifest and bring these beings into you. That iniquity, this alteration of the code of man, like the image mm -hmm. of Yah starts to get fuzzed out and transmutated, transformed away. Metaskids Mazatoy, that, that shape-shifting nature of the dragon and his apostles, that starts to take place in humans. This is why Nebuchadnezzar, when a watcher cursed him, he turned into a werewolf. You know, he they wow. can they can alter you to become a different thing. This is why skinwalkers and like we went into that in my interview yeah. with Eric. Like, this is why shapeshifters are around and the way they operate is through death. 
you got to yeah. go down into the kingdom of death. You got to curse your soul. You got to breathe in the and eat the life essence of these other beings in order mm -hmm. to become these metaskidsmatatoi, these shapeshifters. You know, and this is why yeah. the blood of the Messiah was this super weapon of all super weapons because it they can't consume that. It's like it is the inoculant in your bloodstream that physically cannot consume it in the same way because it's death to them. You know, it's yeah. unutterable death. It's the cure, you know, because it's it's innocence, it's truth, it's love. It's it's the it is the antithesis of everything that is the kingdom of darkness. And so mm -hmm. it is it's it's an eradication. So like when these vampires, these Gregories, when they're consuming the life and they're trying to hack the power source from believers, it's because they're trying to defile the body. They work their way in because they're trying to tap into that power source, but dilute it with poisonous doctrines, doctrines of demons. Like he literally says, do you think any of you can drink from the cup of demons? Like, can you think you guys can go around and mix these kingdoms and not understand that then you give your power back to the dragon and then he can come in there and consume you and consume your children and consume your marriages and consume your families? Or why is it the marriages and the churches are devastated at the same rates that you see? Why is it that yeah. adultery and pornography addictions and drug addictions and all of the systemic indicators that you study in psychology to be like, these are hallmarks of bad stuff. Why are they the same across the board? They're you and know, they're rampant in the churches, yeah. Yes, because there, there's an intermingling. We've got the doctrines of demons worded into it. The same, these words, yeah. these wordsmiths that are these lying scribes who've infested the seminaries, like you're talking about, Isaac. Like they infiltrated the churches for a reason. Like the Carnegie Foundation, one of the like you go back to the like the early foundations in the mid. Like my conjecture is when the Watchers were released in the 19th century, because 70 in First Enoch 10. If you guys have already got there in your study, I don't know, but it yeah. says there's oh. 70 generations, right? That that they're appointed to be in this judgment in this prison cells, and then they're yeah. out. And it's like they've been plotting their revenge all this time, and then they come out with all of these. You got 200 of these watchers, and they all have a different wing of. Oh, okay, like in the military, you would have like you guys are in charge of the navy, you are in charge of the air force and the coast right. guard. Like they have delegated realms of authority and places of it. They're going to go work in that kingdom to advance their kingdom's object objective, which is to mm -hmm. raise up the sons of the beast, to raise up the dread, to, to build a world into their image. Right. And they're given authority to do this. They're given it over by this, by men who are counterfeiting what was their calling in their life. And they're, they're compromising. And so they're joining hands with the devil and not even realizing it because he's a beguiler. You know, but this is this was like if we if we turn back to his word and study it diligently and we seek like you're doing, Noble, with seeking out the language for ourselves, we get set free from that curse to be blinded by the scales that were on Saul's eyes as he's going to yeah. Damascus. You know, he's got the dragon scales are over his eyes. He's killing the very people of Elohim. Like he yeah. says, seek and you shall find. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Knock yeah. Uh, diligently. So and you shall be answered, you know, like it, the persistent woman who's begging and knocking at that judge's door, all she's going to get justice sooner or later. You can be like, just give her whatever words, she wants. It's like the children nagging you for snacks all the time. You're like, just, just take a snack. Gosh, dang it. <laughs> Wear us out. We do have a quick question Fire from off. Mark in the chat. He wanted to know if you know any additional information about star forts and what was their, what was their purpose? If you know anything about that. You know, I know it's kind of random and no, out not. there. It's not. We can always, okay. I told you some of my brain works like a banyan tree. Like that's just okay. how I'm hardwired, like Hebrew, you know, okay. it's like <laughs> it just goes everywhere. Um, I, is he talking about star ports as in like star gates? Generally is a different way that it's worded. You should just ask. I me. think. Mark, are you talking I, well, about stargates? Are you talking about like using children in the chairs to go ahead and open up portals to these other realms? Or are you talking mm -hmm. about like doors to the, to the heavenly hosts? You know, I think, I think it was we were, kind of, we were kind of touching on Tartaria a little bit when and the, the energy you're talking about the free energy and the rocks. And oh, then, yeah. um, you know how the star forts with the oh, star see them. forts. I'm sorry, I thought you were star saying star ports. Yeah. Oh, star yeah, forts. Yeah. Hey, check this out. Yeah. I went to the oldest one in the Americas that's talked about. Great question because when I was studying armor in North Carolina, I came across this stone that's called Coquina, Coquina. Right. I was looking up at the star forts at the time. I was really into the mud flood and Tartaria and all that stuff. I was like, oh, yeah, double handed, too. double fisted deep into the depths <laughs> I love all of, that. of ancient history and obfuscated worlds that we live into. And I'm like, I got to know. Well, there's a lot out here in Hawaii, forts. too. There's like this... Hawaii is star forts. We, we have star forts on each island. It's super cool. I mean, they're they're hard to see now, but uh, yeah. OK, go ahead. So, you're, you're... so 
for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, there is a form of, of architectural designs that are utilized for fortifications and had been for millennia. And it, it is one of these things that once you see it, you're going to be like, you gotta be kidding me. Like the base of the statue of Liberty, right? This yes, goddess, this goddess of, of, of Columbia. Luciferianism. Yes. That yeah. is over there. Like my great grandfather reset the torch in his, in her hands, you know, like filthy, oh, wow. big, bad Luciferians, president of the American Whoa. Society of Civil Engineering. Don Potter Reynolds was his name. And he was the head architect over a lot of that project back in the eighties. And oh my um, goodness. that, that, that sits on a starport. And if you literally look down on it, you're like, what? And they literally have these different shapes. Like, well, if you look at the stars with magnification, not with digital optics and zoom, like this is what the stars start to look like, actually look like up in the Shemayim, like the heavens, like they mm -hmm. literally make these shapes and you can mimic these shapes from frequency patterns. Like if you, if you put a little bowl of sand over a speaker and you modulate it to different frequencies, you will get some of these exact shapes that people used yeah. to design their forts. And I believe these star forts were literally, they were built in, this is called geomancy, okay? There's a form of magical working that people do where they align things in the earth based off of spiritual principalities, where principalities govern from, and they align it to the, the heavenly hosts to be able to have their points of context and communication points here on the earth. Part of the structure and the power source from that has to do with a fortification method. So it's not just... Like in in Philadelphia, there's boundary stones and these occult stones that have been placed as, as literally major magicians go in and place the stones of where our cities and our and our boundaries are. And this is why Yahuwah talks very carefully about not moving boundary stones, okay? Because mm. some of these were set by Yahuwah and his servants being obedient to them. And then you got guys who are willing to do this massive occult working. When you move one of those, it is a huge power source of iniquity, right? Sin mm -hmm. is transgression of the Torah. Then you have transgression itself, which is continue continuity of that sin. Then there's iniquity, which is a full rebellion. So when people move a boundary stone, this is one of these ways they open a door to the dark demonic. They open a door to these other kingdoms because they've done a great transgression there, right? Stealing of the land. And this is something that, that happens. So you start tracking the star forts all along the coast of the United States and all over the world. And they, 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 the oldest one is in a city. They Well, so they say, right? is in a city called, uh, oh gosh, I just lost it, in, in St. Augustine, Florida. Okay, and uh, they yeah. literally, St. Augustine, Florida, is they, so they say is the oldest city in the Americas, and it is a fort there that has never been conquered. Okay, this is a fort that was made from this, this rock called Coquina, which is the crushed bodies of seashells. And those little tiny clams that you see in the ocean, if you put your feet in the sand and shake it and these little tiny clams come up, well, they sediment together and they will solidify it almost like a gelatinous mass and you can cut it out and shape it like marshmallow style. You can shape oh, this wow. and, and when you shoot it, it swallows what you shoot it with. So like it <laughs> softens like a marshmallow and swallows cannonballs. So every time they built this huge <laughs> fort out of it, a star fort out of it, and every time ships would come and attack it, by the way, the fort was here when they discovered this place. <laughs> and when, they, when yeah. they came here, they would have these battles there. And I went there with my daughter, Naomi, at the time. We, we traveled in our RV down to this place because I wanted a chunk of it. Oh, cool. For, for research, because I'm all about these rocks, right? <laughs> and, uh, and like, they, 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 there's holes all over the fort where it's like Swiss cheese style been shot all over. And there's these little cannonballs are still stuck in there. And they yep. had this, they had in there that, so that coquina is like, a, it's, when a cannon, I, when a when a high velocity object strikes stone, it shatters. When it strikes brick, it shatters. This is why castles and forts fell out of existence, but not this kind. Because if you build with coquina, you literally will swallow bullets. It's amazing stuff. The more you shoot it, the stronger it gets. It's just like an <laughs> ultimate dreamland for building armor. But in that in that fort, they had this thing there that I've never read about. I've never heard about in all my life. I've studied weapons and, and battles for a long time. But they had an oven in there that was designed to heat up cannonballs. So they would feed, they would get this place rocking hot and they would pass these cannonballs into there, get them glowing molten hot. And then they would load that into the cannon and shoot it at their ships to ignite their magazines and their armories and burn the ships down. It was the craziest fort I have ever seen in my life. And there was weaponry, advanced weaponry in there that was like nowhere else I had ever seen. So that's my little story about star forts, but they are an incredibly unique place and they are scattered all over the world. And they, I believe that a lot of this is is remnants of that old world architecture from before the flood that's still here. Yeah. And I think some of it literally got turned to stone. It wasn't necessarily stone, but it got turned to stone through petrification, which happens when massive amounts of mud and water condense mm. onto an object. You can turn something into a fossil. Like I got these little fossils on my wall. Let's see. Here's one. I'll pull this off my wall. 
like this, you can turn this. This is a fossil that I found in a creek in uh, in Sherman, Texas. You can get a fossil in a couple of years. It's just total myth and, and legends that they say yeah, you can yeah, millions of years old. Meanwhile, they find guys with cowboy boots and feet still in them, totally turned to petrified stone fossils out here in the West. You know, you can take a, a piece of wood and put it in a spring, like out here in in the in the Ozarks. You can put a, a piece of wood in, carve it into a shape like a sword or whatever. You can put it in a spring and bury it under the sediment and it'll turn to stone in a matter of a few years. Like it's Dude. super cool. So this is where you get a lot of these stone people say they're like, what's a ceremonial ax? I don't know how they carved it. They were wood. A lot of them were wood. They turned to stone. So anyways, that's wow. my little thought about star forts. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Was there any other questions you guys saw? I don't think, um, in the chat. I think I, I, th I would love to talk story with you more, Nathan, because you just are like a wealth of information. Yeah. And so interesting our, our entire audience is just like super captivated <laughs> they're still with us we should have ended two hours ago I, but they're I, still man. with us <laughs> it's amazing so they're we just... definitely would we'd love to have you back on our show um when, whenever you have free time and i got time all the time now praise y'all uh, my wife is helping to take care of my babies at night and uh, i'm like please. i'm loosed into the night so oh, I, I, I love, I love so much. Your family is a tremendous witness to the power of redemption and praise Those God. You never family. stopped asking yeah. questions. I'm so thankful that you weren't willing to look over your son and just pass over him and that yeah. you, you were willing to wade into the fray with him and help to set that captive free. And I know that's not a short story. You know, that's not something that gets encapsulated in two or 300 words. That is something yeah. that's lived over a lifetime, but praise y'all. You get to see, this is that the, the most important verse that any of you can have. Like I was telling your son, he needs to have children super early. Lots of them immediately because here's, <laughs> here's, here's, here's why they are your, they are your weapon, Isaac. Like it literally says like children are an inheritance from Yahuwah. The fruit of the womb is your reward. Like arrows mm. in the hand of a mighty man, Giborim. So are mm. the children of one's youth. Blessed Baruch is the man who fills his quiver with them. He will not be ashamed or turn back in the day of his testing. And he will sit with his enemies in the gates. Like your children become the very living stones of testimony that cry out and are bearing forth your fruit. Like you literally get the opportunity to drive back the kingdom of darkness with those fiery arrows of, of righteous obedience that you instill mm -hmm. in your children, like raise up your children yep. in the ways of Yahuwah and in their end, they shall not depart from it. Like preserved yep. power source come in when we raise up our children in that way. So uh, you are blessed exceedingly to have a son who chose righteousness and rebuked darkness and Amen. said, I will not compromise. And you know what? Praise Yah, you didn't sign that filthy little declarative statement, Isaac, because they're setting you up for a kingdom of corruption. And once they mm. start getting, they love to get people locked in those contracts and get you to, to follow their lead the rest of your life. And I'm so thankful that you guys have willingly stepped in and out of those kingdoms and, and sought for the souls of men wherever you've gone. Amen. And same with you. It's amazing. Your your testimony is just amazing. And I can crazy see, testimony. No, I can see why there's so many people recommending have Nathan Reynolds on the show. Have Nathan Reynolds. So we're so grateful that you're able to come and join us tonight. Yeah. And we'll definitely set up for maybe next month or 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 so, it would yeah. be so cool to have a part two, part three, like no both. Yeah, saying, so. we gotta this this is to be continued. And it leaves the audiences. Like, I need some more, Nathan. You know, yeah, okay. I need some Good. more noble, man. I, I, I think you guys are amazing, and I would love to hear more. Maybe, maybe next time you can fire off someone 19 noble. I think you're... Uh, oh, there we go. And then also, more. I have some Lost Tribes information to share with you next time. Yes. So. Yes. Next Let's time. Do it. But yeah, glad you've been following God Culture. They got some great information. They they're, they dug into the rivers of Eden, too. Yes. I love their interpretation of that, but... I think maybe we could close in prayer. Would you like well, why don't we have Nathan close in prayer? Would you like, would you mind closing us in prayer? Hallelujah. Nathan? Let's do it. Okay. Oh, all right. Father Yahuwah, we just are so we're so grateful for the wonderful gift that you have given to us of of truth and of of freedom. We thank you so much for your persistent willingness to bear with us, Father, as we were so lost and so wayward and so despairing thank you for giving hope to the nations father thank you for not destroying us and blotting us out but having compassion on us father we thank you that your foundations of your throne are mishpat and zadika we thank you that justice and righteousness are the foundations of your throne and we ask and petition you right now father to extend your loving commitment towards us once again towards our adversaries father that you would deliver them from the snare of the dragon and that you would set them free father from the lying deceit 
that has so beguiled the nations. We pray that you would remove those veils of deceit that have so worked their ways over the hearts and the minds of our friends and our family and the sons of righteousness that are trapped in these schemes of deceit. We pray that you would please contend with those who contend with us and our families and bring justice in Yeshua's name. We ask that you would please deliver us from the wiles of the wicked ones, Father, who have worked so hard to destroy us and to blot us out, Father. But you said no one can snatch us from the palm of your hand. So we pray, mm -hmm. Father, that you would please have mercy on us and empower us through your favor, your hen, the grace to overcome the adversary, to contend with our adversaries in the gates, Father, that we would not turn back, that our hearts would not be filled with fear. So we pray that you would rebuke the fear of men, rebuke the fear of failure, rebuke the fear of falling apart, Father. We know that it is you. We are supposed to revere Yahuwah Elohim, fear Yahuwah, and him only shall we serve. So we pray that you would give us an inheritance, a double portion of the reverence of you, Father, that you would give us the spirit, the rock of strength, the rock of counsel, the rock of understanding, the rock of wisdom and of knowledge, Father, and that you would clothe us with the robes of righteousness so that we can contend in this broken world, Father, that we could be cities on a hill burning brightly as a menorah is set in a room, Father, that we would bear witness to the nations that we are your sons on this earth, your daughters on this earth, and that we can not move we shall not be moved we thank you that you can plant us father and where you tell us to stand we shall stand with our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of shalom may our belts be fastened with the with the word of truth father may we put upon righteousness as a breastplate as you put it upon as a mighty warrior father may you clothe our head our helmets with the helmet of Yeshua, of salvation, of deliverance, may you guard our minds and give us the mind of Yeshua so that we, O Yahuwah, would not be confounded with the wiles of the wicked one, Father, but that we would discern, that you would give us the discerning of spirits, Father, words of knowledge, Father, gifts of healing, Father, that we would be able to walk in the authority that you gave unto your disciples, that you gave unto Elisha and Elijah and Moshe, that you would give us the strength of Samson and give us the steadfastness of your beloved disciple, Yochanan, on. Father, please clothe us with the power from on high to contend against this wicked world that we might seek to set the captives free, to raise the dead, to cast out demons, Father, to expel the darkness and to overcome the adversary wherever he comes against us. May you, O Yahuwah, deliver us and vindicate us. May your name be praised and magnified above all forever. Mm -hmm. It is in the name and the authority of your precious son, Yeshua, our Messiah, we petition you for all of these matters. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Amen. Amen. Thank awesome. You so much, Nathan. What a great way to cap off our show. Thank you, son Isaac, for conducting it yeah. and keeping uh, Nathan on on entertained, on, uh, <laughs> keeping him on the show till we got back. Yeah. You know, we, we wanted to meet you too. We, so we were we were supposed to be here yesterday. That didn't happen, but we got here today, and you saw right. us um, walk in, and so. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to Lisa. We're going to exchange addresses and all that. And we're oh, going to yes. set you up already for the next show. And I, I know our, our, our audience is going to want to, they're, they're going to look forward to it. That's yeah. all. Oh, it definitely. is very, very informative, entertaining. Yeah, I love your, your, the way you describe things. Very so, enthusiastic. We love it. Yeah. Nathan. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work too on your side. And, and we, we, we can talk and share. Oh, uh, yeah. your, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed with your Hebrew. I can tell you that. You know? I've got a long ways to go, sir. I have a no, lot. I, I love to learn and I would love for you to share your learning lessons with me. Honestly, oh, I, I am. I am a perpetual only ever student and I am Same always here. hungry to find those who have by, yeah. you know, it says stand up. One of those commands in the Torah that so is often neglected is to stand up and revere the gray headed. And I, I, I just, I believe that is such a lost way of of life and i would love to be able to learn and study and grow with you guys yah has blessed you and clothed you with wisdom but it's through diligence and discipline to get there and so thank you for any oh, type of a compliment but the truth is i have a long ways to go and and i've got a study chart here but you know i've got a lot of learning these dictionary this dictionary gets some mileage from me you know but yeah. i i know there's many other things that and tools that would be beneficial for me so i look forward to learning with you as well amen amen brother Blessings to you and your family. Yes. Stay safe. Live right, dangerously. Live, live yeah. dangerously every single day of your life because the days are evil, but you were born for such a time as this. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But you know, we have a God that, that instructs his powerful angels. They're called guardian angels That's right. upon right. each and every one of us, upon your wife, your children, and mm -hmm. same here. And you know what? As long as we are loyal and faithful to him, 
the one we serve, we have nothing to be afraid of. You know, nothing. It's protections of us. Yeah. It, 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 now, do not be afraid of the Salim. The Salim is a shadow. Mm -hmm. The shadow are, 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 there's like 10, 12 different definitions for Salim, which is plural, but it's it's the number six uh, definition that talks about the the uh, shadow or the demon that empowers people like King Og or King Sihon when Joshua came in and started knocking down their, their kingdoms. So, you know what? We have nothing to worry about Amen. because he's got that us covered. That way is greater. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you to everyone else for joining us yes, tonight. Yes, for all of you uh, yeah. that that Thanks following us, me. following Nathan, uh, we were gonna get we're gonna get back together and make this even more informative and more entertaining because there's so much to learn. And you know what? More to share. We got that. we can hardly wait. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Everybody out there, we yep. have a big yeah. shaloha. Shaloha, everybody. Shaloha. Aloha. <laughs> shaloha. <laughs> yes, shalom and aloha together. So <laughs> I love it. Hey. Yep. Um Okay. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. Yeah. Wait, I'm not ready. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm going to go look for my, my lava rock to send you. Yes. I literally yeah. just told my children about this. I love that you said that because I literally just showed my daughters that videos of people doing that and digging that out. At, and I oh, was like, man. this is my life dream, Naomi. It's my the, the most desired rock I've like ever had in my life. And then it's going to show up at our door. And I'm going to be like, I'm going to pray for it every night with them when we do our nightly prayers. And it's going to show up and they're going to be like, <gasps> I'll be like, you can <laughs> ask anything from Yah. He'll give it to you. He loves giving rocks out. He's super. And you know, it's funny. I got these lava rocks a long, long time ago. And they've been sitting in my yard and in my garage. It's like, I got to do something with it. This is, I got, you know, they say Hawaii tradition, uh, superstition. Oh, yeah. Do not take any rocks because yeah. it'll be a curse. But you know what? I don't believe in superstitions. And curses. I, I, mm -hmm. Yep, curses. I, I took gigantic slabs of lava rock, big slab, and some of them broke. Some of got pieces. I'll send you something that I could fit inside a uh, USPS box. Flat you know? rate shipping boxes is where I Flat send all shipping. kinds of stuff. Yeah, yep. and we'll put the books in there too. You awesome. know, that, that That you can catch up with Isaac. Lisa's got a book on her and the coloring book for your kids. Awesome. You, same here. I, I am hungry. I am hungry for I am hungry for learning and and leadership mm -hmm. all the time. And you know, it's really there has been a great cataclysmic up, upheaval out here. I'll just put it that way. That's the nicest way I can save it. There's a whole yeah. bunch of filthy wolf stuff that's been going on and it's getting burned down. And you know what? Mm -hmm. A lot of that is it's shaking up the kingdom. But you know what's so beautiful is as the father sweeps the legs of some who are found totally corrupt. The father always raises up others. And so I am so thankful to be able to meet you because there's great, great people that have been knocked down, killed off, literally, you know, that Rob. Like, a lot of the leadership has been killed off systemically, oh, yeah. physically Russ, and spiritually. Russ and Rob, yeah. It, it's, it's, but but even, even Dr. Michael Heiser, like there's some, oh, there's some oh, really shucks. powerful people, like there's some really important people that brought in very critical pieces of information and I know that the father does this to test us, you know, and it's like a lot of people, I think get reliant. They've been suckling at the teat of everyone else's information and everyone else's yeah. learning. Mm -hmm. And instead of going there for and doing it like you're, we're supposed to be doing that fruit. And so I, that you've been studying this long to understand the words is such an amazing treasure trove. That's, that's there. Like you've got so much segula in you that needs to be shared, you know, that needs to yeah. be shared. And I would love oh. to be able to have you guys, on and interview you guys because even just what you sure. said, Salim, like, like there is so much that's locked up that's waiting for someone to come along with a key of understanding and be like, oh, that's what he's talking about here. It's not just these empty like English is so devoid of oh snow. yeah it is, oh it's oh designed stupidification. It's designed yeah. obsolescence. You know they gave us the yeah. stupid language, so they're like, yeah, you guys have that words, and you're like, yeah, I can read yeah. a book from 150 years ago, and they talked it, you know. A, a over doctoral level but they're trying to convince me when i wrote my book that i had to write it at a third grade level and i'm like what the heck is wrong with you guys like i know I'm like no no we do not sink to the level of stupidity for this no, no. failure to comprehend Good for you. yeah like we have yeah. to be gifted at communicating at all levels but when we write things down it's important we preserve the language you know mm -hmm. so i would love to be able to have you on and be able to interview you about the, the the word like we need to know the word because we're going to perish without that knowledge yeah exactly you know i got i got isaac to put up a, an old uh, lesson actually it was a six-part lesson that i taught on the kokovim of yeshua the, the stars of jesus and mm -hmm. um he put it together and i told him 
small small bite size you know two hours here two hours here small little he put piece. it all together we got about almost five hours of <laughs> of my teaching combined into one a couple and days ago he put it a up. couple days ago so you can actually find that the, the kokovim the, the stars of yeshua and it talks about yom teruah um yes, which yeah. is the the the, the, um, the feast of trumpets and um at rosh hashanah the head of the new, the new year and when yeshua was born 2000 well it, shucks it. let's put it this way he was born on september 11th 2000 uh, 2 bc I don't know if you know that, yes. but um, and yeah. and this work is is, is from a, a um, Dr. Ernest Martin, and I use his resource in it. But he's not a believer. Yeah, uh, he yeah. believes in he believes in he believes in NASA. I mean, planets <laughs> and all that. And I'm thinking, wait, wait, buddy, you good teaching, <laughs> but I got to cut you off here. I know. But I, I think he, I believe he's a Catholic. But you know, <laughs> really, really sound teaching. And so I. I Put it together in six different classes. Isaac got it together in one because you know why? Yom uh, Tishri one, the first day of the new year, the Jewish new year, is going to be on September 16th mm. this year. Wow. Uh, you know, it, yeah, so good to follow up on, on these lessons so you can understand why Tishri one is so important in, in regards to not just Yeshua, but his surroundings. The, the Roman Empire, Caesar Augustus. I mean, so much history. And and what was happening in the skies, the, mm. the stars, the, the constellations. It was the, one of the brightest evenings that anybody could ever imagine. And again, I, I need to go over it again because I forgot some of it. And I'm trying to explain it, but there's so much to explain. So, um if you have time, check it out. And, and the, the beginning is just definitions, but after that, it gets a little bit more exciting. I think we lost Reynolds. Oh, Nathan. I'm here. Um, I'm here. Oh, you're there? Okay. Yeah, okay. Out. Sorry. Um, oh, I see. Okay, okay. I, would yeah, love, so. I would love to. Where? So where are you guys, like, actually, where's your platform? Where are you hosted? Uh, uh, or, on YouTube. Hebrew Hawaiian. We started, oh, with, we started with Zen to explain what we did. Go ahead, go ahead. We started with Zen because um we I was part of the we were both part of the digital readers club for quite a while and then Lisa um, was and then Joy Joy and Justin were like oh would you like to be on our show and so Zen had Noble and me on our, on his show and he said Noble can you teach us Hebrew <laughs> and then and then Noble's like sure and, and Zen's <laughs> like okay use our platform you know for a while and then because we we're very non tech Noble and I are not <laughs> not Isaac is like our tech guy so yeah. um. So Isaac got the whole system all set up with cameras, microphone, all that fancy little microphone here. And um, and then we started, to, we went on our own. So we, like Zen, we were Zen for about a year, like from his Zen Garcia channel. Yep. And then he's like, you guys should start your own channel, you know, because, you know, then you can have your own shows and you can, people can learn to know who you are and everything. And so. So now we're on Hebrew Hawaii. <laughs> right uh, it, we're just, just on youtube one. and type in hebrew Hawaii. i'm on it i'm and already then, watching then, it <laughs> okay and then, and then, oh, okay and then sacred i'm word looking publishing. at your videos now i'm like yes okay, it's, a new right it's like a whole new treasure chest that just opened up to me i'm like oh, yeah really? I, I can't st i'm so i am so hungry for like i i am on a quest to find the gibberim like that is it oh. his segula is is the gibberim like it, it's he says it's his people you know like after all of this, like, I know I love rocks and stuff. Like, I love the treasures. I love finding Megalodon. I, like, prayed my whole life to find a Megalodon tooth. And, like, when I finally found it, I was with my family. <laughs> he kept showing. He would not let me get away from my family. And I know this sounds crazy, but I, I, it was really hard for me to not see my family as the greatest anchor around my neck, dragging me into a life that I didn't want to go down for so long. I just, like, it's the death of your, your yourself. You know, you literally have to die to yourself to raise your children. Like, you have yeah. to. Yeah. You have to give up your Sacrifice. life. You, oh, it's, definitely. It, is, it sucks. It's super hard. And like, it's not, I know, like, and, and children were, were used so in, in, instrumentally to torture me for so many years and young children and babies in particular, like it is the most explicitly painful thing in my life to, to be around crying babies. And so, oh, like, man. it's torture. Yeah. Tor I feel my body feels like it's being physically torn apart, like and internally, <laughs> like it's, it's an agonized, like programmed nightmare every time a baby screams. And so like, I was kind of always wanting to just get away from them. And then to get to a place where instead the father is just like showing me that the more I was with my family, the more treasures he brought to me. 
Like the yeah. more I brought them into my treasure hunting, instead of just going off and Chelsea, I always called it the lone wolf thing. The more yeah. I had my family around, like the father literally started opening up the greatest treasures ever. Like I started the first time I ever went snorkeling down in Florida. I, like I found a piece of a triceratops. Like I was like, you no way. kidding me? Wow. Like I wanted to find fossils in the second I found a first, a piece of turtle armor. And the second piece I found was triceratops. And I'm like, there's no way. Like, crazy miracles of stuff and like when i was with my children i finally found a megalodon tooth like a giant you like did. i'm like this yeah. is just like ah oh! like the more i was with my children though the more he would open it up and i was like you're teaching me something here you know like you know he's setting you up for the that you know he's setting you up and like yeah. then to start studying like when the father showed me that word that letter tet the paleo hebrew tet is a circle with an x in it you know like that yeah. letter, that was the mark that was put on me. That was like the literal physical mark sigil of, of the mark of the beast all my life. Like I had path coins, like coins that could get me an underground currency into all this underground kingdom. Like it was the mark of the beast that I was raised up to be wow. this, this mark. And, and it bothered me horribly because when I would try, when I got out of all this and was trying to like unpack and uncover and decipher all of what happened. I didn't know what that mark was. Like I, I saw it. I had to go to the occult side and look at their text to see this is what this is. And I'm like, but, but everything I've seen in that kingdom has been a counterfeit. Like every time I actually look into what they say, I find there's a counterfeit there. And I've just been like, what, what is this mark? Like, what is this? And where does it come from? And it was when mm -hmm. I walked into my friend's living room in North Carolina and I saw this chart, this is put out by Eric Bissell. I don't know if you know, Eric Bissell. Eric Bissell. That's no, familiar. Familiar. You have got remember? to go to Sefer the Stars. Eric Bissell, Ericology.net. Um oh. what, what you got that? Ericology.net. Eric we didn't hear that. Yeah, we're, we're adding it. Eric Ericology. 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 Yes. Ericology. Okay. Yes. Eric. He has a study of Eric. <laughs> just you can look up Eric Bissell. E-R-I-C-B-I-S-S-E-L-L. -S -S -E -L -L. Eric Bissell, Paleo Hebrew. He has a 70 part playlist on there. Oh, that's he goes how through, I know who that is. He yes. goes through the Aleph bet from, from Aleph all the way through to bet. And I think each letter is given a three part uh, or two to three part breakdown. So it's like, I mean, it's a, it's a monumental thing, but that was, it was this chart right here, which is all the languages. You can decipher all language from this chart. It's like, wow. it is the real Rosetta stone. Like it is the true it's, mm. he was on the quest for the Edenic language. Like, how do we know what they said? Like, what is the, this is, and he has all this for free on his website. You can download all I, of this. I, I just saw that on Pinterest. Um, yeah. It's got like Egyptian, Ar Ar Aramaic. This has, that, and it's all got, the languages. It's got Greek, it's got Greek. It's yeah, got English, Greek, Hebrew. It's got paleo, it's got modern, it's got pictographic and paleographic. And then it's got like, um, Oh, you would, you would just devour this. You would love it because that's yeah. I, like, I, I saw so much ancient languages growing up and I did, I, I was illiterate, right? Like I didn't, I didn't know what it said. So I was always stuck with hearing what this priest was telling me it said. And I, it just, it's always bothered me. And so when I, I've always wanted to see what these things are. And in Arizona, there's petroglyphs of the plume serpent and, and these people that were fighting the plume serpent everywhere. So I could see that this war with the dragon had been happening in the Americas for so long. And I knew that in these carvings was the ways they fought them, how they fought the giants, how they fought the Rephaim. Like they wrote it in stone and y'all always preserves his, his testimonies in stone. Yeah, You know, it right. survived the flood. It survived the fires. It survived the men. It's like, He's got his witnesses, but I need to know how to decipher it. And that's what that symbol, I saw it on the top of his chart and it's the letter Tet. And I'm like, what? Why do you oh, have man. that mark here? And like, how do you have this mark here? And then Eric, his name's Eric Hedman and uh, they're in North Carolina and now they're in Tennessee, but they'd been studying uh, Eric Bissell and Paleo Hebrew for years and wanted to, he wanted to be able to read Hebrew. And so he got his stones to knock. And so like the way I learned Hebrew was first well, from Paleo, too modern, yeah. too English, okay. like is how I've kind yeah. of like a pictographic and then paleo and then modern. That's, That's okay. the way That's okay. because I can't understand this. It looks like Chaldean flame letter stuff. I was like, it just yeah. looks like ants on a page. What the <laughs> heck is going on here with all yeah. these other conjectures and injections of vowel points? And I'm like, this looks like sorcery. Like this looks like when I read Latin, you know, like this. Yeah, is, yeah. This is a and different the tet, kind of the, it. The tet, the tet in paleo is the serpent, right? Yeah, literally. Yeah. And it's, but it's like my, what's so weird. I'll read this to you. This is what he says is the, 
the Ted. Okay. It's a, this is like my life story. This is why I, when I saw this, I was like, holy smokes, he's got everyone's testimony is written in the, in their name. It's, it, it's written in their, it's written in his words, all of it. And like, Oh, this is what it says. This is so like concept, right? Not talking definition, talking concept. The Tet, it says gauntlet, coarse, snake, encircle, fully, heraldic symbol, name claimed ID, oh, branded, owned, bought, citizenship, potter's wheel spinning, 100%, 360 degrees, shaped to purpose, obedient servant, Obadiah, worship, Promise of usefulness, impartation, gear up, full basket of harvested fruit, inspected for import. Oh. Hmm. Wow. Export. Seal of approval, good fruit, set apart, kadosh, shield with the lance, elite core, purified, jewel, ancient, oh, the urum and turum, light and sound, the tet, the circuit, the bullseye twisted and braided, meta organum transcendent belonging to a higher order sphere other than the physical meta meta metamorphosis wrapped and sealed your assurance marked by tet vav name sheen mem yahua the big white fence right smack dab in the middle of the mishkan <laughs> pattern like i read this and was like no way like He's got our life stories written out for us in the language. And they branded me with this abominable version of it. And yet the father had brand, he had marked me way before they ever did. You know what I yeah. mean? It wasn't the mark yeah. of Cain that was on my head. It's the mark of Abel. And it's a totally different bloodline. It's a totally different uh, path. Yes. And though I was raised to be a son of Cain, I was made to be a son of righteousness and nothing could take me from the father's hand except for my choice to rebel or my choice to submit, you know, and this mm -hmm. is, this 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 chart this this single this is why there's so much power in these symbols and why they hijack them and why they use them yeah, this, yeah. They, but they 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 can't cuz the the devil they can't create they're not no, they can only counterfeit they can only counterfeit they can counterfeit. only counterfeit they can only alter they can only borrow like this is yeah. why they need humans agents on the earth because they can't create the thing they can't yeah. create the thing they can alter it once they got it you know but like they can't make the stone you know what I mean? They can't yeah. make the materials. It's like you create a battleship, you know? And it's like, but yeah. don't you use anything that Yahoo created? And you're like, well, that's a dilemma. So how do you do it? You know, but you got it. This is why they use a, this is why they still have humans. And until they can totally take over with the skin suits and the, yeah. this trans, this trans morphic ideology, this literal transformation of man into another image until they yeah. can do that, they still need us. But once they don't, man, it's a slaughter. Blood deep, oh, yeah. knee deep, blood bass everywhere, you know? And it's like, Yahuwah preserves us through that. I've seen the story works out really good in the favor of the children of Yah. They're sealed and protected from the destroying angels, you know? The seal is the biggest thing. Oh, That's yeah. what protects us. Oh, yeah. You know, remember in Ezekiel, the, he had the, the angels of, of um, uh, come down to, to actually um, inflict judgment, but one of them had a writing utensil. Yes, and he, and, nine. and he said... Write down the names of those that are grieved by what's happening in the city, you know? And so when he started writing down the names of those that were grieved by all the sin, all the corruption, those are the ones that were sealed and saved when Nebuchadnezzar came down and started doing his thing, you know? Hallelujah. Yeah, that, that so, man clothed in linen, right? The destroy. I've been reading that chapter, those two man, chapters yeah. I've been reading over and over again because right. I'm finding so much abominations in the house of Yahuwah. You know what I mean? Like I'm custom catered to find people's filthy, dirty secrets. I'd like, I, he has made me to see behind everybody's closets. Like it, it's just, I, it was a survival skill. If I didn't do that, I didn't know if this person was going to try to hurt me or if this person was going to try to help me. And I had to figure it out instantly. Like my mm -hmm. entire life, all I've ever needed to know was get behind people's masks, like find out who they really are at their core. Like yeah. what makes oh, yeah. them who they are? And are they a perpetrator or are they a protector? Are they a shepherd or are they a wolf in sheep's clothing? Like all I've ever done my entire life is filter through humans and find out whether or not a, there's a serpent in there. You should write a book on that. So other believers can actually learn from you on how to see and read the filters of, 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 of people yeah. that have a mask on. Yeah. You yes. know what I mean, 
Well, because this is I, what Hebrews 4.12 is. The Hebrew, like he says it, I don't need to write the book. It is already here. It's it's already been written. Like I can write a book that explains a little bit more of it for my history, but I just, the reason I did the audio recording of the entirety of the scriptures, because I'm like, it's all here. Like if you study it, everything you've ever wanted to know about anything is all right here. And he tells you, behold, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Like yeah. they are in outwardly, they're like, lambs they're just beautiful oh, yeah. little people they're like i keep the torah i yeah. keep the shabbat like i don't eat pig yeah. but if they're in the other church they're like the opposite version right they just they're chameleons you know like they're this is the yeah. mark of the dragon like you talked about the skin of the nahash like this this is cloak of invisibility you know like it says they put on they wear garments like a they put on the garments of violence like they put on greed like like there's all these garments in the scriptures they're putting on these cloaks over and over again and you're like how are they doing this you know where do they get all this stuff it's physical stuff that becomes a spiritual covering right when because you put on these spirits you put them into yourself but like there is the cure the inoculant is that double-edged sword hebrews 4 12 the word of elohim is living and active sharper than oh, any oh, oh, sword oh. right piercing through even to the bone and the marrow the separating of the soul and the spirit and is the spirit, discerner yeah. of the thoughts and the intents and the of the hearts of man it will help you read people's minds like mm -hmm. you can know their intentions because he said out like you were seeing in their eyes you were talking about that earlier how like you were seeing their eyes shift and what did yeah. he say what are the eyes but they, they reveal the windows. Their gateways the windows, windows, windows. Are the Yes. You can see into their soul. And this is why, yeah. like, they hide their eyes with all of these lens, these yeah. optics. Yeah. This is why yeah. opticians exist. They're veiling their eyes because they know that mm -hmm. we can see them. Like That's a you, giveaway. Yep. Yeah. You yep. saw them. You saw the they behind the person. You know, like, you oh, can yeah. see. Because what is in you, what is in you is greater than what is in them. And so because of that, their camouflage comes down. You're like, mm -hmm. it's literally like there is, there's this way of hunting down radar. Okay. There's these guys. Oh, what are they called? There's this uh, incredible, there's teams of people in the United States Air Force and their job was to hunt down radar stations and destroy anti-aircraft stuff. Right. And they are, oh, I can't remember the name. They have this great name, like Fox bats or we uh, we weasels. Oh, the wicked weasel, something like that. Dang it, I've lost it. Somebody's going to correct me later on who's way more military astute <laughs> at this moment. But they would hunt down the radar station, dive down, so they would fly. You're talking like 30 feet, 100 feet AGL above ground level. And they'd use this terrain mapping stuff to try to keep their fighter jets going, you know, Mach 1, Mach 1.8, 2.1. Like, these guys are smoking fast, flying down low directly above the terra firma, like, inevitably it, like somebody could fart and have a bad day and just totally crash the plane instantly like these guys <laughs> are like so, top gun too <laughs> like crazy incredible pilots who had to fly down below where the radar is normally scanning for airplanes yeah. because nobody's yeah. so yeah. stupid to fly that low they would hunt these things down and then drop these shoot these things out of this off of the ground and blow them up you know with sidewinders or surface to air missile air to surface missiles yeah. and, like right. just incredible combat right and like this they would destroy the enemy's little system that is helping them to guard themselves from all the people coming in like where's the enemy where's the enemy where's the enemy and this is literally what i believe the word of elohim is like this living word when we eat it when we read it when we drink it when we consume it on a regular basis like it destroys the enemy's radar stations it destroys the enemy's anti-aircraft stuff it destroys yeah. his camouflage like those scales coming off of the eyes that it says the en enemy has blinded the eyes of men so they cannot come to the truth. Like he deafens their, their ears. Like there was an album cover of a, of a CD that I saw in a, in a bookstore or in a, yeah, a bookstore. And like, it had this demon climbed onto the back. Like Frank Peretti used to give some of the best descriptions right. of this world. Oh, big time. He fictionalized yeah. it because people that editorial people wouldn't let him publish it as a true story as it was, you know, like the, it, these, the spirit was sitting on the back of this man. And it had its hands over his eyes, right? It had reached over his eyes and was doing this. And then the demon's eyes were 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 in the place of the back of the hands. Yeah. And I was like, this is exactly how it works. Like, this is what they yeah. do. And they place their hands over their ears so they cannot hear the truth. Like, literally, it's yeah. like, yeah, but this is the consequences of the curse of disobedience. It's like Yeshua is standing around telling them all this stuff. And he's like, having eyes, they see not. Having ears, they hear not. Having no hearts to understand. And you're like, How? Like, how does this happen? You're like, this is what happens when you transgress those shadows.
Soros come in. You know, the Salim, it's like the devils, Salim yeah. are coming in there. And it's like, yeah. so what's the cure? It's like, it is the word. This is how you can make people's masks come down. Like you can destroy their camouflage, their cyst, their cloaking technologies get disrupted in the presence of that omnipotent, omniscient, all consuming fire. Like it can't exist there. It can't exist yeah. when that Ruach is in you. Like yeah. all of that is laid bare. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, why are the apostles walking around and they're like spirit of Python come out of her and it's all like, and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, well, that's been like a system of evil that's been happening here for general. This is generational warfare that just took place in a second. And they're like, what the heck, you guys? You took our little money cash cows. Oh, like riot. Let's riot. Like all the people in Ephesus. The book of Ephesians is so ridiculous because Paul spent two years laboring there before he writes that book. And like it, hundreds of millions of dollars of occult objects. Like I think about that guy, Loganus, like that satanic super soldier guy yeah. who's like, I'm like, I'm coming for your soul. That's who I am now. I'm like, I'm going to put you at the top of my list, sir. Like I want Yahuwah to work mightily on you and draw <laughs> you out of the depths of despair because he's going to take all those objects and turn and cast them into the fires. And you know what? Like, that's literally what it says in Ephesians. They were like, they took all, or it says about the time in Ephesians, they took all of their magical incantation, their sorcery, their, like these books that these people have and their, their, their objects, ritual objects and all this, it is hundreds of millions of dollars of stuff that they're throwing into a fire. And they're like, away with us, cast them away like filthy rags, like it's prophesied, like <laughs> cast you away like filthy rags, like, this is what we're supposed to do with our idols. Cast them into the fires like Hezekiah. Throw them into the brook of Kidron. Why were they always grinding them up and throwing them into that brook? Because it gets cleansed with living water. If it doesn't pass through the fire, it goes into the water. You know what I mean? It's like everything yeah. in Jericho, nothing was allowed to exist if it couldn't go through the fires of refinement and get transformed into something of better use. And this is what we get. If we do this with the word, he opens our eyes to see people as they are. He opens our ears yeah. to hear them, what they're really saying, you know? And it's like, this is how you know them. You know, this is how we know that we know them. That, like we love yeah. him and we keep his commandments. He's like, his commandments are not burdensome. He's like, this is your righteousness. When you keep these commandments, like this is the definition of righteousness. And I was in these Christian schools and professors are telling me, they're like, yeah, righteousness is like doing, doing the right thing. You know, yeah. like doing what's pleasing to God. And I'm like, what the heck does that mean? And can you show me book chapter verse for any of this stuff? And they're like, you know, we have a doctrinal statement on our website that has some of those tiny explanatory notes. You can check there. And I'm like, can you not tell me? Like I had a Bible teacher in seventh grade who said, you're not allowed to speak up in here unless you can defend it with book chapter verse. And we were like, oh my goodness. What? They fired what him in a year. They're like, this guy made so much, so many people asked so many questions and children were studying the word so diligently. And it wow. transformed that instantly. And parents were losing their mind. They're like, my child's asking me all kinds of questions about why I believe what I believe. And they're <laughs> really stirring the pot over here. And they're like, get rid of that guy. And I'm like, man, yeah. corruption and oh, compromise sad. everywhere. Oh, that, no, was that, that, was another, that was another clue, Nathan, that, that, you know, I was telling you about my hometown, that all the trafficking and junk going on in there. And all the churches that are located there. So um, I was raised Lutheran. My dad was a Lutheran pastor and principal of a Lutheran Good. school there. And then my my mom, she was kind of like the rebellious one because she was also a pastor's daughter, Lutheran pastor. In oh, fact, man. her dad was pastor at Zion Lutheran in Boulder, Colorado. Oh, so that's where she grew up. Oh, and um, so she's kind of rebellious. She went. She was looking for a different type of church that wasn't so dead. Like Luther Church is like super close to Catholic and like oh, one yeah. of the most boring, dry churches you could ever go into. So she started going to the Pentecostal church down the road. <laughs> and then she started bringing me on Sunday nights. And I was wondering, like, this is a tiny little town, small little church, like no, basically no name church. But we have these huge big wigs coming to speak at our church, like Kenneth Copeland came to this church what? to speak i met kenneth copeland in person in fact he nice. laid hands on me and i instantly felt freak freakishly weird same like same eye situation with the reptilian junk this is when i was like in early just after i graduated from high school and then another one um, i don't know if you heard of norville hayes that was like another big tv evangelist yeah. came to visit Damn. the church creepy and uh, as well and it's like why would these people come and even bother with preaching to a congregation of like 50 when they have like these huge TV things. And that was always making me think like, why do they want to come to our town so much mm. and hang out at this small little town when there's all these kids roaming the street being trafficked and whatever. 
but it just all tied together when I got older and I realized, oh my goodness, this is what's been going on there. And that's why they were there. You uh, know, those creeps wanted the kids too. Yeah. They were preying yeah. on the kids as well. Because the dragon, they need the blood, you know, they have to go recharge and it's like, they need the adrenochrome. They can't yeah. not, you know, it's like they need the, like, we were just listening to Deuteronomy on we, today when we were driving my family and it's like, he's got this three, four, he's got these commands about don't eat the blood. Don't yeah. eat the blood. Don't eat Always. the blood. It is the yeah. life. And you're like, he says it three times in here. Like, and you know, in Hebrew, there's no exclamation points. You know, there's no, right. there's like the only way they did that was through repetition. You know, they're repetition. like, they're going to repeat it. And whenever I see three, a threefold, like this trifecta, right? A superlative, like you're like the only other, like made the only other attribute characteristic of Yahuwah that's ever described to this threefold is Kodesh, 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 like set apart, set apart. Holy, holy, holy is Yahuwah Elohim Almighty, yeah. who was and is and is to come. Like this is, this is a defining characteristic. When they repeat something three times in the same, same section of scripture, it's like, we couldn't shine a bigger, more important screaming warning. Like, don't do this. Like, mm -hmm. and I, like, I felt convicted. I was going to this class uh, to learn artisanal butchering. Uh, there's this guy who does meat stead, is it farmstead meat smith? Something like that. His name is Brandon. Okay. And uh, he does, he teaches artisanal butchering, which is very much like Levitical butchering. And like, a, like oh. the real deal, like the way that they used to do it with like a knife and sharpening stones and butchering the animal in the fastest, most humane way possible. And we were butchering oh. a bunch of, we were going to butcher a bunch of sheep. And at the time I was a farm manager down in Texas. And I thought I was going to be, you know, butchering all kinds of sheep all the time. And we were going to have this like regenerative agriculture thing with these pasture sheep. And we had these uh, special St. Croix sheep from a guy, Greg Judy's farm out, or Greg Judy out here in Missouri. And they're this special sheep. And we're like, we're going to have this crazy, but like farming and artisanal butchering thing. And I was like, the way you butcher that he was teaching us and sharing with us was all about the, the preservation and the utility of using every part of the animal as you break it down and use it, that nothing is right. wasted. And this to me is right. so in line with the Hebrew reality of like the way that they use the animals. Like there yep. wasn't this culture of wastedness. And so I was like, so pumped to go to this class in the morning, the morning before I went into the first day of it, I felt the father put it on me to read that chapter in Deuteronomy. And I was like, don't eat the blood. Don't eat the blood. Like he says this three times. I'm like, you're telling me something here. Like you're giving me a heads up. And I'm like, I'm going to want to eat the blood in this class. I'm like, oh boy. And sure enough, we go to this class and like, I have it on a, my playlist called becoming an artisanal butcher. I like GoPro this the first day when he goes, he goes into like the, the whole like shepherding and, and like how to kill an animal quietly and calmly. Like you put them in a pen. Sheep psychology is different than, than uh, people think psychology is, you know, like you want to study psychology, go study sheep. You know, cause yeah, that was a psychology major for a reason. Like he's yeah. like study sheep and he's telling all about the psychology of the sheep for a while and why we put them together and we keep them as a flock together. And we put them in a small confined space because we don't want to startle them. We don't want to put any of this stuff in their blood. We don't want to impart any of this stuff in their blood, like cortisol and stress and these other things and substances right. that are made. Exactly. Right. And I'm all like, ding, 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 you know, like versus yeah. the modern butchering system, which is the exact, the antithesis of Opposite. it to traumatize, to yeah. shatter and scare and, and like, impart all of that into the blood and you're like okay so then you walk into the pen and you literally grab the sheep catch them flip them on their side put their throat up and you slice their throat directly through because clean animals all clean animals when you cut their throats they they have all their veins and arteries are perfect to to render them unconscious and dead almost instantly as close to instantly as you can get with any other animal you wow. can't do it with a horse you can't do it with a pig the way that their veins and their arteries run they're not all there so that you can do this but with all the clean animals it's absolutely hardwired and built into that way but in the wow. class he's like we're going to stir we're going to capture the blood in this basin because we're going to use it for other stuff. And I'm like, okay, they're going to use it to make blood muffins, right? They're like this is like one of the blood sausage. These like, these are major food yeah. crops and staples that people have had for thousands of years. And so he's like, the way that you do this to preserve the blood is when it comes out, you catch it in a basin and you stir your hand in it because there's instantly all these coagulants this is why your blood clots right. off. Right. And as you're stirring it, the coagulants stick together and they look like raisin, raisinets just all stick together like a cluster of grapes. And you take that out and you bury that, right? And then they got this blood that's basically shelf stable. And then they save that until they make their recipe with it. Or we, you could save that and put that into the earth in like your orchard. You could put that in your plants that are needing it as the oh, wow. that's the way you're supposed to dispose of it is to put yeah. it and cover it with the dirt, right? Cover it with the soil because yeah. the earth gave its life, they gave itself up for that life to come into existence. So then you give it back to the earth. The earth is a giant receptacle for all the blood that's ever been spilled. And then in the end, in Revelation 20, in Revelation 16, 
All the earth's going to vomit all the blood that's ever been spilled. And it's going to literally become oceans of blood. All the blood that's ever been spilled is coming back out as a judgment, right? It's going to literally kill everything. And mm. that, all that blood's coming out is it's going to get weaponized. The earth is going to fight for the people of Yah. The earth is going to bring out all the blood as a witness from the blood of Abel to the last person who's slaughtered on the earth. It's all coming out. And that's why we're supposed yeah, to bury cool. it. You know, and if I you do that, if you that do way, that, this, if you do that, your garden, your orchard, these things bloom like you can't even possibly imagine. Like that is where the blood is supposed to go. And instead, these guys at the end of the class, they like bake blood muffins with it and they ate it. And there were all these people were Christians and Catholics and and the guy oh, in the class, man. the guy who heads up the class, like he's an incredibly brilliant guy, but and he's a very strong apologist for Catholicism. Like he is an all in advocate evangelist for Catholicism. And he, so he is having a lot of very weighty theological discussions with a lot of the people in the class. And like the dude is a sharpened edge for it. And a lot of people don't know how to actually contend with the scriptures because they don't know what the word says. They just know what their yes. pastor said one time. And like at the end of this class though, he's literally like, we can eat pork because the Pope said so. This is why I love being a Catholic. Like he says it straight up. Mm -hmm. He's like, we said, because they said so, you know, like mm -hmm. we get to eat pork, we get to eat blood, we get to all these things because he said so. And I'm like, like, I love people that are transparent and honest. Like, I really do, because at least that guy is authentic about his convictions and his belief. Yep. And he's like, you know what? That is consistency of his doctrine. He's consistent with what he believes based off of where it comes from versus the bastardization of it by saying, oh, it comes from the Bible. No, it doesn't. Like, Yahweh's mm -hmm. word is never broken. You know, and yeah. if he said it's a sin once, it's always a sin forever. Like, it will never yeah. not be a transgression of the Torah. You know, and it's like, but, but if we hold that word, if we guard it fiercely, we don't fall prey to that. Like all of the blood that, that is sold in the blood banks, when people go donate blood and they, they take 80% of that is turned into pharmaceutical products. People eat it. People oh, eat like human blood. That's where all that blood and that plasma goes is to pharmaceutical companies. 20% of it gets used back in, in hospitals and given back to human beings. But 80% of it is fed back into people as drugs. It's like the commercialization. People are like the adrenochrome from the babies and the children. I'm like, from the people at the blood bank, y'all, like the Red Cross is literally blood money. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. it's just blood money. I walked into a store at Walgreens and this lady was trying to have people sign up for it. And I'm telling Naomi all of this. She's seven and the lady's like, you want a little bracelet? I'm like, honey, those are people that are selling people's lives. And I'm telling her all this loudly in the store so everyone can hear in the bar. <laughs> the poor volunteer behind the booth is like, we'll give you a, we'll give you a cookie. And I'm like, you see this, Naomi? They're merchandising the children of Elohim. Like, oh, like, exactly. I just, it's like, so dead gum, these people, man. They're so beguiled because they're all eating and drinking blood. But this is the part of the curse. He's like, you're going to eat the, the flesh of your arms. You're going to be eating your own children. You know, it's like, you read Deuteronomy 28, man, we're stuck in that filthy place of the curses of it. And it's real and it's immutable and it's irrevocable. Like, you're going to suffer this stuff if you, if you transgress. Like, be careful then how you live because the days are evil, you know? No, oh, totally. Shit, so that's a great. I never, I never thought. Yeah, we should have been recording this. this I, is am. I am. I am. Yeah. I got your back. I got your back. I'm recording <laughs> this whole thing. I know there's always a show after the show, and like 85 percent of the time, people are like, "Dang it, we should have recorded this part." I'm like, <laughs> "That's what you're doing." <laughs> right on. Right on. Are you recording? No. Oh, he is. I am. Perfect. I'll I'll stitch the whole thing in together in a super monologue, six eight hour epic show. People <laughs> dig into it. But I love this. You guys are salty, y'all. For real. Oh, Salt and light. Good. Your breakdown on the rod of, of Elo, that was that was a great synopsis of the entirety <laughs> of a story that most people are like, what is she talking about? I'm like, the scriptures are real. Like they're real and they're amazing. Like you just gave us oh, super yeah. yeah, she's she's got a gift for uh, making things that she's learned very um animated not not necessarily animated but more digestible mm. so i guess so. very good i was the teacher that. i was a teacher well, for a while hey so look kindergarten it's, it's, it's iron sharpening iron that's you know right. even that's amongst right. even amongst us as leaders you know what i mean so no what's the word for iron in hebrew sorry i didn't mean to call you bro sir mr noble no no no, no brother's fine <laughs> and iron. bro is good that's like you ready just, you ready because that verse that verse i'm gonna tell you something i love making knives and stuff and sharp i sharpen like relentlessly like i make crazy yeah. sharp things super scary sharp like splitting hair splitting hair splitting hair sharp so like when yeah. you sharpen iron you know like you sharpen it you don't use iron almost ever like yeah so what is what is he saying there the, the word is brazil yeah, that's the word for sharpening iron. Iron sharpens iron is the Brazil. And you're like, wow. Is that, is that the, 
Is that a, a Hebrew word, word or is that, that a Greek word? That rashes, no, that's the real Hebrew word is literally Brazil. Not right. joking. Wow. <laughs> like, wow. That's where the country gets its name for a reason because they be Hebrews there. Uh -huh. you no, know? wow. like that word is the like, so this, this is the Eric Bissell recommends this dictionary, which is the a comprehensive etymological dictionary of the Hebrew language for er, for cool. readers of English. Ernest Klein. Ernest yes. Klein. This this book is awesome because it's like the Strong's Concordance that nobody gave you. They're like, turn to the Strong's. That's the meaning of the word. What is that one? Yeah. Oh, fear. This yeah. Is... <laughs> and then they you. put up some really they they did a great um comprehensive study oh, with Second Esdras. Second Esdras. It's one of my favorites. And then of course Jubilees. They have a lot of the a lot of the Levitical oh. laws. This is like little Genesis, right? Can you show me your book again, please? Okay. Yes. Answer for Who's it by? Ernest Klein. Okay, Ernest Klein. Yeah. Thank this you. Is, Thanks. This Nathan. is well worth your. I. It took me a long time to track this down. There was. It was not we'll find it. for a good we, long we, time, but it is we, now we, generally. Um, Jerusalem. Like I think it's Jerusalem. Like, what is that? Oh, look, look at those pictures beautiful. of oh. Philippines. I mean, it's so just it's I packed full of. See that. Is graphic. this through God culture? Did God culture put that out? Yeah, God culture yeah. put this. In. I've they, got, they, I didn't even know they had printed materials. Oh, they put out, oh, and look at this. This is cool. This is the Rivers of Eden oh. on the uh, map. You got to get this book. It's yeah. really yes, I do. It's on That's Amazon. Gorgeous. They sell all their stuff. Just type in on God Culture on Amazon. They have That's all their awesome. stuff there. Yeah. And then their Book of Enoch is full illustrated in color. On Amazon, oh. their book of Enoch is amazing. That's Whoa. that's the one I used to teach from because it's it's got such good graphics in there. Yeah. This, uh, oh, yeah, we spare no expense when it comes to resources. We spend money on it because that's how you learn, you know, from gotcha. research. So this this is if you go to Brazil, right? Hopefully okay. So there's there is the entry for it here. I'll turn it around and read it. That's the word so I'll turn it around and read it so you guys can't hold on a second. Oh. It says this is page 84 of this this dictionary and it says Brazil, right? Iron. A loan word from Hittite, Barzilu, whence also from Akkadian, Parzilu, Moabite and Phoenician, Ugaritic, Aramic, Baramic, Iron, Arabic. Frazil is in Aramic loan word for ferrum, which is also iron. It is a Semitic loan word. According to my opinion, the loss of the Semitic ending L, resp ilu, is probably due to its having been mistaken for the L diminine suffix ilus, ilus, and consequently dropped as in brass or farrier in my sedel. So that's the legalese dictionary academies that most people just blacked out out and they're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's this etymological. So this is a dec dictionary nice. where he gets the idea of definition from the original languages first mentions first uses so he goes yeah. into all these other languages to try to uncover what these words really mean like what are they actually saying so right there he's telling you where he traced this word through through use so then there's other dictionaries yeah. that get it by use like basically how it appears in the text and how that's where it can build up its definition but this yeah. is what it actually says to coat with iron he ironed he coated it with iron he shod was iron, was coated with iron, was shod. Iron suffix, as in the analogy of a scientific name for iron and ferrous, an iron bender with angentinal suff suffixes, iron bending, formed from with the suffix. So what's he saying here? What's an iron bender? What's an iron worker? What's somebody who literally coats yes. things with irons? You would say a blacksmith, right? right? Yeah. We call him a blacksmith. What does a blacksmith do? He forges. Like, over and over heats he, it up hammers it do you see how up? that's a better description is as iron forges iron so one man sharpens the countenance of a friend forges the countenance of his friend's face yep. like that's what he's talking about there it's not just like i don't run my i don't take this bolo i have a, a sharpening system called the perfect sharpening system sold by mtknives.com patrick Rohrman sells this sharpening system where you put this thing in a jig that hold onto it like this. And then I have sanding belts of one inch by 30 inch sanding belts. And I run this thing on belts and grind it. And do you know what I use to grind it with? Sapphires. I literally use aluminum oxide, which is corundum. It's sapphires to grind this off with. That's literally because wow. it's the hardest stone there is apart from these other ones called antimony, which is in the scriptures. One of these other words that we're like, we don't really know what that means. Antimony. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just say it's that. 
it's adamantium is the other word for it that people that are in the Marvel universe will be like, like yeah, okay. and stuff. It's like this unstoppable metal that's in the scriptures. He literally says they harden their hearts like adamantium. And you're like, what? what? This is like what Wolverine's claws are made out of. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's this other stuff in the scriptures. You're like, this is strange. But that is the word Brazil. Like that is iron forging iron. That's what it's, we're made to do that. Like we are made to work with living stones like you and you and you, you walking sapphires are supposed right. to forge and shape. That's how we can sharpen each other. But you know, the, like the father does, he throws us in the fire. He refines us, pulls out the dross and he brings us back in. And then he beats the snot out of us and forged for a new purpose. Like that letter Tet was talking about, like forged with a new purpose. Every one of us, like, we were so like, you're, there's going to come a day where we're all in the garden again, you know? But until then, he's like, you got swords, use them, you know, yeah. use those Makairas. <laughs> that word Makaira, by the way, that's why I love the Filipino arts because they preserved the Makaira, which is the word yeah. in Ephesians 6, 12 about that sword mm -hmm. of the spirit. And that basically has this shape. Hold on, I've got it strapped to my other pants. I was wearing it earlier. Let me show you this one. We're <laughs> <laughs> getting hungry. Okay. You're getting hungry for something other than the word. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, oh, we'll it's do. okay. This is this is this is a makaira, right? This is the literal makaira, like ancient Greeks would have, or like the ancient yeah. Israelites yep. had, that or a bolo, right? And this is straight up that same word. Like, it's real tools. And I just, if you go and use this tool, if you go learn how to use a makaira, go learn how to use a bolo machete, a bolo knife. Like, you'll understand the word way better. It's a short thing. Like, this is tiny. In the world, yeah. they literally call this a large knife. In the world yeah. of combatives, they're like, that's a knife. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I killed a lot of people with this knife then. You know, to me, when I was little, this was a giant sword. And I thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I fought people with one shape like this and like this. And I realized that these two serve totally different purposes because this one is all about the point predominantly. And you can chop in that same pattern, right? This is a two-edged version. These scare the heck out of me because you can cut your own face off super easily with those. Yeah. But yeah. a double-edged double tool like that will cut four times bigger wound cavities than one that's just a single edge. Like, it's crazy how much more a double edge cuts in. And you guys, as, as any of you study the word diligently and you study the ancient languages, it's like you're adding, you're refining those edges. You're honing those edges because a scary sharp sword will cut through four times as much material. Like it'll cut through jackets and leather and armor. It, it'll pierce through so much more versus a somewhat sharp sword versus a blunted sword versus a <laughs> dull thing. Like, Right. This is why if we study this word and then we study the languages, it's like you get vibr you get the adamantium sword, you know. Oh nice. yeah, Noble hates dull knives. He has oh. his knife sharpener. He's always using it in the kitchen. He not hates. to your level though. Not to yeah, your not level. <laughs> well, but you can get there. Yeah. Filipinos are known for their for their sharp knives. Heck so. yes, man. Y'all taught me and saved my life. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I owe a huge amount of gratitude to the Filipinos and those who preserve those super sharp edges. It, it literally was the difference between life and death for me many, many wow. times. And I am wow. so wow. thankful for the wisdom that they imparted to me to show me how to help defend myself because we do need to understand how to stand against this stuff. And why, why does he give us these weapons for this warfare? And there was physical ones for me for a lot of years of my life. And now they became physical tools that have helped me build and accomplish and butcher and put food on people's table. Like, on Mon like this week, I'm going to go right. butcher four sheep, you know, and I will have super scary sharp knives in order to dismantle and dismember this creature and turn it in from some kind of fuzzy thing that's out there in the field to some kind of delicious thing that's in my stew, you know? Yeah. Right, right. Hey, have you heard of, you're in Missouri. Have you heard of um, Hebrew Fest? They had like a m couple months ago. There was a, a campground or something called Hebrew Fest. Yes. Jake Grant. Oh, you did. I do know Jake Not Grant. Jake I know Jake Grant. He's, he is, him and I are like, He's the most, he's been with me the longest of ministry of any other person. He came in the first video oh, cool. on my channel, the first like video on my too. channel. He filmed that documentary with, uh, him and, uh, John Pounders when they came to our house and people are literally burning Bibles and rituals and stuff to try to shut that down. And we were going to oh, that plutonium man. weapon site and stuff. And we were exposing it. The modern version of John Benet Ramsey, a girl named Jessica Ridgeway. And she was the next mind control shattering and torture child lost little wow. girl thing that they did and ran that psyop on everybody down there and she was in our neighborhood it was utterly disgusting we were investigating that cult and trying to bring it down but you know we're gonna take isaac to eat some thai go food eat, go eat i appreciate you all yeah. tremendously hey, thank man. you so much for so fasting much. all day so bro, he's ready to eat you go break your fast and rejoice brother may yahoo be with you guys
Right on. Nathan, we, we got, love you, man. We got your love email. You. We got your email. We sent you one. So we got our contact oh, yeah. information. Okay. Noble's got your number. Expect some mail. Right I can't wait. <laughs> love you guys. <laughs> Hello. Lila Tove. Hey, Still take time. care.